Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my clock says one o'clock, so hopefully um, that's in keeping with all the rest of your timepieces there. Um, my name is Claire Mambiello. With me today is Kathy Webb. Um, so Kathy, Kathy's waving. <laughs> you want to say hi or anything, Kathy? Hey everybody, I'm glad you could join us today. We hope to help answer some questions. This is the first of a few, but um, if you have any questions, don't feel you know scared to ask. We're, that's what we're here for. So. Yep, definitely. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so today we are talking about um, the millage amount. So Library of Michigan millage, um, this is our first series in our session. Um, the millage series is going every Monday in the month of March. Uh, and we have an array of different people speaking. Today, Kathy and I are kicking off the, the sessions with um, kind of an initial introductory. And we're gonna talk about how establishment can affect your millage. And Kathy's gonna talk about how you can go about figuring out how that millage uh, number translates into actual dollars and how you can kind of figure out how much money you might get from a potential millage. Uh, she's also gonna talk about the mystery behind, you know, what three tenths of a mill means. Um, so, um, here's our contact information. If you have any questions regarding what we're talking about today, please don't hesitate to reach out and talk to us. Um, both of us are, are happy. We work together uh, often. So reach out to any one of us. And if, if we don't, um, if we're not the person who has the answer you need, we will make sure you get to the person who has the answer you need. Um, this is my typical, um, since we're talking about things that are tangential to law, or that relate to the statutes, um, this is my uh, dis, uh, disclaimer, so that um, you understand that although we're providing you with some legal information, we are not providing you with legal advice. Okay, so establishment. Uh, let's talk, we, I talk, I use this word a lot um, when I talk to libraries, and establishment is how your library was founded. Right, so it's it's how it's the law under which your library was founded. Sometimes it's the method in which your library was founded. So, how does establishment affect your millage? Well, establishment kind of affects almost everything having to do with your library. Um, what establishment does is it provides your library with a legal status, right? So, if you think of your library as a business or as an organization, what your establishment does is the same thing. The corporation laws. Um, uh, due to a corporation. So if you're a nonprofit corporation, um, like your friends group, and you incorporate, that makes you a legal entity. It enables you to do things like hold a bank account, hire staff, um, own property. And so that's what your establishment law does for your library, is it kind of creates your entity. It creates your library as a legal entity. It's kind of like a business. Um, it also bestows the legal authority to your library board or to your governing body. So it, it, it allows your governing body or it establishes your board, depending on whether you're governed by your um, municipal uh, governing body or whether you're governed by a separate governing library board. So what the establishment law does is it gives the powers and authority to that board to enable that board to govern you. Um, so it gives that board what it needs, everything from how many members to how those members are seated, whether they're elected or appointed, um, to precisely, you know, how much control that um, entity has over things like library finances and certain decisions over your organization. The other thing is, is it provides your library with the funding, um, with, the, with the means of the funding. So it tells um, how your library is supposed to be funded. So, so it may say that your library is able to get a millage. It may say that your library um, can be funded by your municipality. Um, you know, there, and sometimes it provides limits on those particular things. So if there's gonna be a limit in how your library can be funded, generally that limit's gonna be listed in your establishment law. Now, this can get a little sticky when you may be talking about a library that is part or a department of the municipality because there may be some other laws involved but we're going to talk about that in a little bit um, one of the main things you have to look for in your establishment law is are these limits in funding you know do you have a millage limit do you have um, only particular ways in which you can levy a millage um, are there different kinds of millages maybe that you can levy um, and then 
your establishment will also, as I said a minute ago, it can determine other laws that may come into play. So for example, again, if your library is a department of your municipality, then there may be other things like charters or ordinances or even other state laws um, that govern things like the powers of cities and counties um, and townships that may impact your funding or how you get funded, including um, what kind of millage you can go for uh, and how that can, you know, who has the ability and the power to levy that millage. So with your establishment, one very important thing to know is that not every library is the same. So there are six different establishment laws in the state of Michigan that can create approximately 10 different library types. So depending on your library type and then the establishment law that created that library type, um, your rules may be a little different than your neighbor's rules. And in some situations, you could be a city library under PA 164 and still your um, funding can be different than your next door neighbor city library under PA 164. So there are some library types, um, most specifically PA 164 libraries. Now PA 164 is the City uh, Village Township Libraries Act, um, and that can cover two different kinds of city libraries, the township libraries and the village libraries. So. Um, and the District Library Establishment Act, these two acts um, provide um, uh, the ability for these libraries to get dedicated millages and essentially be in control of those millages. Um, and those millages do not add to the, um, what we call like the millage cap or the millage limit of the overall municipality. So the municipality, counties, townships, villages, cities have limits imposed by the constitution and imposed by other statutes that tells them that they cannot have an overall millage limit more than a certain amount, um, more than a certain amount of mills. What, what's nice about a dedicated library millage under like PA 164 or the District Library Establishment Act is that those millages don't count towards that overall millage cap for that particular entity, that municipality. So if your municipality has like a 15 mil millage um, limit that that you know municipality can have because it's a city or a township or a um, and, and, you know, the library has, you know, it's a district library and has four mills, that four mills doesn't count towards other millages that that municipality may have um, for operating or other things um, to hit that, hit that limit. It's kind of separate and apart, and, and that's a, a very advantageous thing. So that's a good thing that these library types can get these dedicated millages. One of the reasons why they can have those dedicated millages is because the authorization for a millage is actually written into their establishing statutes. So that would be your PA 164 and your district libraries. So county library boards under the county library act um, can also levy millages but those millages are a little bit less clear now it used to be years ago if you want like a little history tip that county libraries could actually levy a millage without a vote um, now they have to put a millage up for a vote uh, like most other libraries do um, and that is generally appears to be um, part of the overall millage cap um, but it's it's actually a little bit unclear so um you know i i think that the way that the law is written that it may be part of that cap but you can double check with your attorney for sure it, it may not be but that cap is actually um excuse me that millage would be um under the control of the county library board uh, which is again a board established by the county there's also no millage limit in written into the county library act in terms of how many mills a particular library could have that mill excuse me that that um that that um individual limit you know um is actually would be determined by the county library board uh based on the, the um budget of the county library as far as how the statute is written. 
Um, libraries that are departments of their municipalities, so things like charter township libraries, home rule libraries, and any leftover PA 269 township libraries. So in other words, if your governing board is your um, municipal governance, um, or you are pretty much a department of your municipality, these entities have different millage requirements. These entities do not have separate dedicated millage authorities written into their establishment laws. Most of their establishment laws are very, very brief. Um, so those millage situations would be determined by those municipalities. And most of those municipalities would either be um, covered, they would pay for their libraries with appropriations, or um, their millage would be kind of just another millage that the individual municipality would put on the ballot. It would not be a dedicated millage. Um, it may be a library millage, but by dedicated, I mean it would not be separate from the overall cap that that mil uh, municipality would have. Um, now, also, I want to mention that PA 269 township libraries are kind of in a special little compartment. Um, PA 269 libraries in their original establishment act, that is under in PA 269, uh, actually did have the ability to levy a dedicated millage. But because that law was repealed in 1976, they no longer can levy um, a dedicated millage. So for all intents and purposes, a PA 269, um, they lost their ability to levy a dedicated millage and, and they are more like a home rule city library. They're more like a, just a part of their municipality. Um, then PA 164, county and district library boards, those are all entities that have separate governing boards can actually um, control whether or not their millage gets on the ballot. Now, if you're a PA 164 library, you may think you don't have that ability uh, because you still have to check in with your governing body. You have to submit your millage language to your um, municipal entity. But the, the um, one thing that is helpful to know is that the board of a PA 164 library can force that millage uh, onto the ballot even though they have to submit their language and they go through their municipality, the, the PA, PA 164, the statute says that if you're going for a millage or a renewal of a millage, um, your municipality has to put that millage on the ballot. Um, and, and you know, how, how much of a millage, um, some of that may be negotiable with your municipality, but for the most intensive purposes, um, PA 164 libraries are pretty independent. Um, it just as far as the process goes, they have to go through their municipality um, with their ballot language so that the municipality can put it on the ballot. Um, but if a municipality really can't refuse to put it on the ballot, let's put it that way. Um, a district library has sole control over their millage. Um, so a district library can, you know, just put a uh, levy their own millage. Um, and a county library board also um, would put it through their county, but they also have enormous amounts of, of control and authority to get that millage on the ballot. Um, school and public libraries are not able to levy millages at all. They used to be able to levy millages, but currently they are not permitted to levy millages. Um, their money would have to come from any millage that the school district levies as part of the school district budget. Um, a city section, uh, PA 164 city library under section one of the city uh, village township libraries acts has two different options of a millage. They can, uh, they actually have two mills that they can levy and they can levy one of those mills without a vote. Um, the municipality can levy the mill without a vote. And the second mill would be levied as a traditional millage, a dedicated millage with a vote. Now, alternatively, um, the city can also levy that as a two mill millage with a vote. So they have a couple of options. They can either have two separate millages, one non-voted, one voted, or they can have one millage that's voted. Now that ability to levy a non-voted millage is actually pretty special and it's almost non-existent uh, in, the, in the statutes as a whole. It's something that rarely, rarely occurs. And so it's actually quite a, quite a, a kind of a benefit that a 269 section one library has. And they're the only library that has that. Um, so limits, um, a PA 
269 library again uh, city township village library um, usually uh, elected boards um, they all have a limit of two mills so again if you're a city section one that would be if you have an appointed board uh, of five seven or nine members and um, you have a you know charter or ordinance section for your city that talks about your library that helped establish your library then you're likely pa 164 section one library um, and you have that option of the two different millages but the the most uh, mills you can levy uh, between those two millages would be two mills so you can either have one voted millage with two mills or you can have two separate millages one non-voted one voted each with a mill District libraries have a four mil limit um, and all those other PA 164 libraries have a two mil limit with, with um, in total, again, if they, but only with voted millages. County libraries, as I mentioned, have a no limit listed in the statute. Um, it's the best that I can see is that it, it pretty much um, provides that they can, the city can levy a millage um, that covers the budget of the library, you know, that in consultation, you know, but essentially pays for the library. So that would be a discussion between the county library board and the county. Um, and that's, you know, they have the ability to, to levy that millage. And since that millage would be um, part of that, possibly part of that overall millage cap, then obviously it would probably be a discussion. Um, there's also um, county charters often have an overall cap on, on millages that can be levied. Um, so how do you find your establishment? Well, you can contact us. You can review your historical files, um, things like municipal governance, your meeting minutes uh, for your municipal governance, your library board minutes. Um, and I would say as far back, you should have library board minutes going all the way back to the beginning of your library. So go back as far as you can and, and look through those. Um, like I said, we have files here. Um, any file, any documents you have in your historical files that are from the Library of Michigan, like letters of acknowledgement can be very helpful. Um, and any contracts you have, whether you have service contracts or whether you have um, like a district library agreement, which is a contract, those also can be very helpful because very often when a district library is formed, the very beginning of the district library agreement will mention uh, if one of the partners was a, already a library, it will mention what kind of library they were. Um, it will also uh, happen that if you have a service contract, very often some of those service contracts also at the beginning of the contract will mention what the um, establishment is or the establishment law is of the library that is contracting to give service. Um, you can run searches in historical newspapers. So uh, you can look at historical newspapers. You can review review how you currently operate, right? So if you're a library and you have an elected board of six members, you're probably a PA 164. If you're a six member elected board and you have a millage, you're almost definitely a PA 164. So sometimes, you know, that's something that can add extra evidence to something that you may already suspect as far as your uh, establishment goes. Um, if you can look at your L4029 for your municipality that levies your millage, sometimes the municipality will put in the millage um, the authority for the millage. And if they list PA 164, then odds are your library is a PA 164. Check your local, if you're a city library or a county library, look at your local ordinances and your, your charter and see what that has to tell you about the library and how you might have been formed. Um, and again, you can contact us and we'll also be happy to help you. Um, and lastly, read your documents, right? So, so um, don't assume you know what you are. If you have any doubt at all, double check. Check your agreements, um, check your statutes, check your charters and ordinances, read carefully those documents that, you know, govern your establishment type, uh, because, you know, that will inform you as to how much of a millage you can get, what type of millage you can get, um, and that can, you know, will really help you because you don't want to kind of overstep that. Um, and that's it. That's, that's my side. Um, and I think Kathy now is going to go ahead and talk to you about um, 
how you can actually figure out how much money this will get you. Kathy? Yep. Okay, everybody. So I guess like every year, you probably wonder, what do they look at? How do they decipher that I meet the three-tenths of a mil if I don't meet the three-tenths of a mil? So what we look at is our accounting system generates a computation sheet. When you enter your answers into the accounting opinions um, questionnaire every year, that information is then downloaded into our payment system. Our payment system consists of taxable values. It consists of always tracking your populations. It's looking at any changes that you might make to your service area. So if you start a contract or you end a contract, let us know because we wanna make sure that we're reporting everything that you are actually, who you're serving, how many you're serving. And if something changes and we don't know that, our information for payments is probably going to be off and, and that won't be a good thing for you. So first thing is always remember if you're changing your service area, adding population, or if you've dropped some populations, please let the Library of Michigan know because we're going to make that change. It also lets us look at penal fines, which is a totally different thing, but we'll go there on another day. Um, taxable values are associated with every municipality that you serve. The taxable values that we look at each year depend on how your reporting year is set up. So for the libraries that are on a calendar year, your report period would be for the year 2020 this year. If you're on any other fiscal year, we're gonna be looking at taxable values from, excuse me, if you're on a calendar year, we're gonna look at 2019 taxable values because your year was 20 you are still working in your 20 years, so we can't use those taxable values. We go back to 19. If you are anything but a calendar year, the taxable values that we're associating for payment that you must reach the three tenths of a mil are going to be the 2020 taxable values. I look at a computation form. Each time I review a library, it pulls up a computation form. It lists your local income, it lists your appropriated income, it lists your millage, it lists any kind of money you received. If you would like a copy of that form, my uh, email address is at the bottom. Please email me because what I will do is I will send you a copy of that form and you'll be able to look to see where these are coming. But Claire, if you hit the next slide, um, I've created a library for the sake of reporting so I can explain this to you. So this is our Memorial District Library that's in any town USA. So in this case, this library is a city library and they're only serving one municipality, which happens to be the city that they're associated with. If you look at the column that's got current uh, legal population and it's got contracted population, if you have any, this city only has the, the population of 25,883 that they're serving. Next column over is taxable value. It is really important to us that that taxable value has, you have local support that meets three tenths of a mil, which equates to about a third of a mil. You have to have local income, which can be a variety of things that can be Penal fines are local income, millages are local income, appropriated tax from your, if you're a municipality and the city or your village or your township is providing income. If you have any local other income, such as fines and fees, donations, copying costs, um, any funds, that you receive that are not associated with the state or a federal fund. So like your grants that you're getting through Library of Michigan are all considered federal grants. That's not local income. If you take the taxable value of any of your municipality, whatever that amount is, in this case, it's the 599,000, oh, excuse me, 559,990,698. That's the taxable value that's associated with this um, local area 
which is a city. We look at three tenths of a mil is that number, that taxable value times 0 0.0003. You can do that on any taxable value you've got. That 167,997 represents you must have meet or, or exceed local income of 167,997 to qualify for state aid. It's written in the act and what that's what that three tenths of a mill is. Um, you can have multiple local incomes. It's not that you just have to have that amount. It's, it, that's the portion that we ask that you have to meet to meet the, three, the requirement to receive state aid. As you can see in this instance, the income is way beyond the amount that the local income is, and that's fine. If it's not, we can't pay state aid. I mean, that's that's the legal part of the finance part. We have two things that we can we decide to meet state aid: local support, and if you have the correct certification levels for your director and support staff. Those are the only two things we can't tell you. You have to be open. We can't tell you how, you how many hours you have to be there, but we do look at the financial part of it and the certification part of it. So if it doesn't meet it, what happens if, if I look at your report and there's a problem? I'm gonna call you right away. I'm gonna call you and we're gonna talk about it. Um, we're gonna talk about maybe something wasn't reported in the right uh, block box. We'll talk about that. Um, there aren't a lot of, you know, I mean, sometimes you look at your report and go, oh, I forgot, maybe forgot to put that in. It's never too late to change it. We can always go through and go back through and make a change, but we've got to have the support there, which that's why millage is why is so important. It's like you have a say in the amount of money you're charging for services. Um, lots of times if there is no millage, um, your local support can be very low because there's just not a lot of options. I mean, there just isn't. It's like um, cities and townships and, and villages are all in search of money. Um, and they don't necessarily have to associate it to your library. There can be cuts to your budget, which you don't, you don't want to see. You want to have a steady income of money. And a millage helps you do that. Um, so three tenths of a mill. Um, I would say there's not a lot of millages that are only for three tenths of a mill because you also have to look at operating costs to make your business run the smoothest it can with the amount of money that you need for wages and benefits and supplies and books and, and everything that makes up your budget. But this is what we're looking at. We're looking at this computation sheet that gives me in a glance how many people you are required to have, how much money that you're reporting, does it meet that three tenths of a mil? And if it does, at that point, we put through your payment. Um, hit the next slide, Claire. Okay, so here it's all spelled out. Take the taxable value every February. Treasury Department works with, with our um, IT and we load new taxable values every year. Um, we, we do have them, I mean, we can go back a year and take a look at them. So if you, let's say you just were kind of guessing, we don't have them in the advance. So once a year we update these, but anytime you can call and say, I need to see a calculation sheet. I want to know if I'm going to meet state aid. I get a lot of calls. It's like, can you tell me today if I'm going to meet state aid? Well, if you call and ask for one of these sheets, it's kind of a worksheet you can work through to find out if maybe next year you're looking at it, you know, am I getting short? Is that is that three tenths of a mil not meeting enough? You know, am I making it? Am I even close? So if your library would like one, please call. Um, I, I don't wanna have to deny anyone. And I always work with everyone as, as much as we can to figure out, you know, if that money's gonna make it or where it's not gonna make it. Also the state, um, when it made the act, it said that you have to meet three-tenths of a mil to get state aid. 
it doesn't say you have to have three mil, three tenths of a mil on each line individually. If your library serves maybe five different municipalities, if at the bottom of that sheet, that computation form, the required three tenths of a mil is still meet, or you have greater than the amount to meet, your library will get state aid. In the case where you serve multiple municipalities and it's short for perhaps one or two, we will look at line for line to find out if, you know, where we might have to cut someone because you can get partial state aid, um, but you want to make sure if at all possible, your three tenths of a bill meets it in total. So your complete library legal and contracted areas do meet the requirement for state aid. Let's see, next, I think the next one. Okay, so this is just about talking about what, you know, what we were talking about before. If you, you know, if there's something, a problem, we would be, a, we would call you. We would call you, we would email you. Um, we never deny someone without talking about what could be different. What is, what do we need to look at? Perhaps there's some changes that need to be made. So if any of you have any um, questions, you can always call. Claire is, works with me, like she said, all the time. Um, we, when something happens, we discuss together what, you know, what's happening with the library, what might be better for them. So um, if you're thinking about uh, having a millage, by all means, there's a lot of things to think about. We'll help you through them, your attorney, it, you know, when you go through a, that process, there's a lot of things that people can help. So we just want to make sure that you can reach out and we'll try to help you wherever possible. Okay, keep in mind, all these things do make up local, local, um, local income. Um, if you have any questions about something that you might have as local income, like grants besides the ones that the LSTA grants, there are other grants out there. So I'm not saying that all grants don't meet that. I'm just saying that the Library of Michigan offers LST great, LSTA grants, which don't happen to be local income, but millages, local appropriated funds, all your penal fines, um, copying fees, donations, funds actually received from your friends group as money that's local income. So if in doubt, give us a call and we'll be able to talk through what, what might meet, meet that and what might, so you don't have a problem with not getting your state aid. That doesn't make me happy. <laughs> so any, you can call us at home. That number is our, our office phone that happens to be in our, in our home at the moment most of the time. So please call anytime. Do you, uh, do you want to explain in kind? Oh, yeah. Let's talk about that. So um, let's say you were a school library. Because um, most public schools, public library funds come through your school. But think about you're housed in a school, but there's things that maybe you haven't thought about that might be local income. Um, Think about if someone's doing your um, payroll and your benefits, and let's think about your internet. Your internet's part of the building, but obviously something's associated with your library. If that's being paid, if your garbage pickup, if your electricity is being paid, if your um, snow plowing, a multitude of things. If it if it affects the school, it's going to affect you somehow. And those are in kind costs. I mean, that money is in income that you're you're taking advantage because that is money that they're paying for the support of your public school library. Um, if you're interested in that, I do have um, a spreadsheet that I can send to you that lists it and how it works. It associates kind of like. Um, FTEs with how many are in the school and square footage of the facility you're in. So if you have any questions about those, please feel to read. I can send those to you. If you reach out to me, I'll send you a copy of that as well. But that is a big thing that people think, oh, well, I didn't even think about that being part of local income. So that's another thing that we can help provide for you. Okay. Um, well, it is 1.35, so it looks like we have time for um, 
some some questions. Now, I want to mention too that um, this is not meant to be, you know, exhaustive as far as um, special, the legal part, and and we have other speakers who are going to be talking about a lot of other things like millage language and things like that. Um, so I'm going to stop my sharing, and now we can see everybody um, and see if there's anything in the. Yeah, there's one in there about a county. Yes, the county. county one. Right. Um, that is true. The county library board can, but the the county board has the say. Um, the this is actually the statute is a little bit uh, confusing. I've actually been going back and forth, and I have been talking about um, this statute. Um, my suspicion is that this has kind of been amended over the years, and I I've actually been researching to kind of figure that out. Because, uh, like I said, at one point, county libraries did have the ability to levy without a without a voted millage. Um, so it, it is perfectly reasonable that the county library board would determine the amount. Um, but the county library board has a different relationship to the municipality than, say, a PA-164 board. So um, if this, it seems um, you are correct that the county board would could quite possibly have the final say on what is levied uh, because the county library board um, is not exactly the same as like a PA-164 type uh, governing board. Um, they have kind of a different relationship. The county library board is quite strong and does have an awful lot of power, uh, but they do work with their municipality in different ways. Um, so, and and when we talk about, so there could be a millage amount that that is voted on. So you may have um, your your voters vote on two mills and it may pass, but then. Um, during this lifespan of that millage every year when you set your budget then you have to determine the amount to um then you have to determine the amount to actually levy and so what that means is um you're just because you have the ability to get at the most two mills that doesn't necessarily mean you have to get two mills in many instances library boards may determine to levy an amount less than the full amount they could levy depending on what their their uh, budget needs are and so that's kind of what's being discussed here um, you may be able to have one millage that's voted but then the amount that the actual county will actually levy depending on the needs um, could be and that's because the language of the statute does is kind of um, the way it, it is phrased in the statute is that um, the amount that that is the amount of the millage that's levied can be linked to kind of linked to the library budget like it's the amount of money that is necessary to operate the library um, so may as far as Megan's question is that makes uh, that is I believe that that is correct um, but with the PPT you will never recoup the lower amount in the right it's not it may not always be a good idea to levy to levy less um, and so part of this is um, it depends on part of this in terms of how you you levy really depends on making sure that your your governing body whether the person who has the final determination is your library board or is your municipality um, if your municipality is is kind of the governing body of the library is is to make sure that they understand a lot of this they understand what ppt is and how it affects the library and that they understand um and that any of themselves have read the statute right you'd be surprised how many um municipalities and municipal governing bodies have not read the library statutes and even a lot of um i'm not trying to disparage any municipal attorneys because they have a lot going on too but they're you know just because someone is a city attorney doesn't mean they understand library law right or just because someone is a township attorney doesn't necessarily mean that they understand all the kind of nuances as far as your particular library um establishment law is concerned and and the millage so it's important that as you talk to these people uh you make them aware you ensure that they do understand um the differences between some of this stuff um and that libraries don't always operate the same as just the municipalities do um will headley amounts be discussed yes um so headley amounts will will be discussed i believe in later um parts of the of the um of the 
uh, presentation, I know Anne Serink is going to be talking about legal aspects to uh, the library millages. Um, so Headley, it isn't really have anything to do with your establishment. Headley has to do with um, a uh, constitutional uh, amendment and that went through some years ago that kind of, uh, oh, it's kind of hard to describe. Kathy, are you, do you have a good explanation of Headley, how to explain that? All I can say is it keeps rolling it back, that amount back and back and back. It's like, why, no rhyme or reason under my, you know, I look at it and think, I don't understand. But so I guess I'm going to say, no, I don't have a very good understanding of, of why that why that keeps happening yeah headley is is complicated um it's it's the idea behind headley was that so um it, you know property when property values got really expensive um the taxes essentially my understanding is that the taxes would not get like exponentially high um there is real some really good explanations of headley i will put in the chat that are from the um michigan state extension service uh, that are really good uh, explanations of Headley and Headley overrides. Now, um, so that, you know, it's, there's a complicated uh, calculation for Headley as how much your, your millage may be rolled back. Uh, I know that there are some discussions. Uh, um, I know MLA has been very much discussing Headley lately. I know there is some uh, discussion about some amendments. Um, so we'll see, but yeah, Headley, it will be discussed further as we move forward. Right, and Shannon mentions a Headley, um, MLA did do a Headley webinar um, that you could most likely access from their webpage. Um, and they talked to uh, the Michigan Municipal League and the Michigan Township Association um, about Headley. Uh, so those are some additional places to go for some uh, more information. And let's see what else is in the chat here. Um, so it looks like I don't see a huge amount of other questions. Um, Kathy, is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, not, um, not right now. Um, I'll, I can say that um, uh, as of this morning, um, we have the rate that we're going to be using for our first 50%. If you hold on a second, I got to just flip my gears to my other paperwork. So our first 50% payments are going to be based on a per capita of 0 0.243990. And those are going, they've gone into my payment system. Um, this week, I am going to work with um, Joe Hamlin, and we're going to start the process of looking and reviewing payments. Um, it's probably going to take a week to 10 days for us to start generating them. We still, still have some testing that we need to do with our um, payroll or our payment software. We always like to make sure that uh, one or two go through with no hangups. We'd hate to send 50 through and realize that the payment system's not talking to the treasury system. So um, bear with us, but we are starting the review. Um, hope to have payments coming out within the next week, 10 days, two weeks, to up to two weeks. So um, hang in there. And um, if you have any questions, like I said, if we see anything that we are going to question, um, I will contact you directly. Um, I don't like to have any surprises come through. So um, if you don't hear from us and you get a payment, it's like everything's great. Um, if we have questions, we will call. So just want to let you know that. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, um, any of your county libraries, um, just a heads up, um, first quarter and second quarter uh, re reimbursable salaries that you guys qualify. Um, I'm going to make those payments together. So you will see two payments. Hopefully I can get them marked as two lines. So you'll know each line is for a quarter. Um, but other than that, we're, we're hoping that we can get uh, payments on the road very, very, very shortly. So that's my good news for the day. Okay. Um, all right, then. I'm trying to see if there's anything that we missed. I don't think so. I know that for some of you, the establishment is a little bit murky. 
um, I strongly uh, encourage you that if you're not sure of your establishment that you uh, talk to us and we will help you ferret it out. Um, over the years, different libraries have reestablished. One of the things I also uh, would like to mention is that you keep your eye on if you have multiple millages and you have a um, a perpetual millage, you know, no longer can you have perpetual millages. They are now limited to 20 years. Uh, if you have one already uh, and you're getting additional ones to, you know, kind of increase your amount of money, make sure that you keep an eye on what your millage limit is for your establishment type. There are some libraries that are dancing extremely close to their, their millage limit. Um, and so it's important that you kind of keep an eye on that. Um, it's also important that if you're having a hard time getting a millage and you're a city PA 164 library, city section one, so you have an appointed board. If you have an appointed board uh, and you're a city library, you may want to uh, consider approaching your municipality about the possibility of an unvoted millage uh, because that is permitted under the statute. If you are in an area that you're having a hard time getting a millage, that may be an option for you, even if it's just for the three tenths of a mill. Um, if you are, um, you know, again, if you're looking at service contracts, this is another thing that factors into your three tenths of a mill. Um, you, you know, there's, you can also ask, you know, your a millage can be part of a service contract. You can ask your contracted area to attempt to get a millage. Um, even just for the three tenths of a mill. So there are different uh, possibilities that you have, you know, for meeting that three tenths of a mill. Um, so, you know, and, and if you have, if, if you have a millage or you don't have a millage and you're uh, worried about getting a millage or you live in an area that, or your library is in an area where typically you can't get a millage, um, we do have John from every library that's going to be coming. And that's one of the things that he's going to be discussing about you know, trying to get a millage in areas where uh, it can be difficult to discuss these kinds of things or where they may be um, uh, you know, kind of resistant to millages. Um, so that you know, is, is another thing that um, is gonna be coming down the pike in, these millage, uh, in this millage series. Um, and I think, oh, will we be discussing millage renewal campaigns and what we are and aren't allowed to discuss? Yes. Uh, we will be discussing that. That's something that Ann Serink uh, and will be discussing. I believe also Shirley Ursima will be discussing that as part of hers. Um, so uh, that also is coming down the, the pike as far as specifically what, uh, what kinds of things can a library do and not do and that kind of delicate dance that boards have to do with respect to yes committees. Um, also, the limitations on friends groups and if, especially if they have a 501c3 status, uh, that they can do in terms of both donating to a, a friend's, uh, this whole idea of, you know, lending uh, their personnel and lending their uh, money to a, uh, say, a yes committee, um, as well as, you know, volunteering or being in uh, on the committee. So all of those will be discussed as we move down. This is meant just to be kind of an introductory talking about uh, your establishment and how it, it intersects with your millage. Um, we still have quite a few libraries that are, are struggling with establishment and um, it is something that's really quite important um, as far as your overall operations go. Um, if you are a 269 Township Library, uh, I strongly, strongly encourage you to consider reestablishment. If you're in a charter township, uh, you can reestablish um, possibly as a charter township library, which would give you the same governing structure. Otherwise, you can be a PA 164 Township Library with an elected board and a millage. Uh, if you're going for a millage, that would be an excellent time to consider reestablishing. Um, as a township library under PA 164, there's lots of benefits for a library to reestablish as a PA 164, as opposed to being a 269 township library. Uh, if you'd like to discuss any of those, I'd be happy to, to help you out and to discuss that. Um, does the renewal uh, of a millage rate mean it's at the original millage rate 10 years ago, or does it renew to the lower rate from Headley that is present? Um, it depends on how you word your ballot language. So um, you can, you know, if you renew your millage and you have a one mil millage and then you're getting that, you know, Headley 
um, taken off the top, Headley is still going to roll back your millage. So if you renew at a, a one mil, the same thing you renewed at before, you know, what your original millage was, yeah, your, your Headley rollback will still occur. Um, your option would be to either go for a higher millage um, so that when Headley rolls back, you end up with um, a higher amount or um, you know, attempt a Headley override uh, after you pass this millage, maybe then you get a Headley override. Um, it, the Headley override is designed to give you kind of a mini millage that covers the gap between what your original millage uh, was approved for and what you're actually getting um, in your, uh, with the Headley rollback. So, you know, there's kind of different options to do depending on your library and depending on, you know, whether you, you know, you need to go for a full millage or whether you're, you would say, have a perpetual millage that's being rolled back. Um, you could go for a Headley override to kind of cover that gap. Um, if you're just renewing your millage, then maybe you might want to, you know, ask for a larger millage uh, to begin with, unless you're at that millage. If you're at your limit, so if you've been asking for two mills and you're a PA-164 library, there's really, you don't really have an option to ask for more. Uh, you're kind of just stuck at your two mills and Headley will roll it back. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the best you can do. You could go for a Headley override uh, subsequently. Uh, you may be able to do a Headley override at the same time you do a uh, your millage. Um, that would actually be a question for Anne. I have not seen that done. It doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, I'm sure it's all in the ballot warning, wording. It's all in the wording of how you how you uh, structure your ballot language. Um, so I think then we're all set. It's I think we're good. Does anybody have any other questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Um, I hope all of you have a good rest of your day. And you So thanks again for coming and we will see you next Monday. Welcome uh, just to the second uh, episode in our millage series. Um, okay, so let's go ahead uh, and get started. Um, with us today is John Kraska. He is the executive director of Every Library. He's a longtime library trustee, supporter, and advocate. Um, he is also a, uh, let's see, he is also a former president and member of the Board of Trustees for the Berwyn Public Library in Illinois, is a former president of Reaching Across Illinois Library Systems, or RAILS, um, which is a multi-type library system, and he was he has been a director for membership development at the American Library Association. He is a member of ALA as well as the Illinois Library Association and the American Political Sciences Association. Um, he is named as a 2014 mover and shaker by Library Journal. And I think that looks like he's with us today. So I'd like to introduce John Kraska and I'm going to hand it off to John. Claire, you're very kind. Thank you. You also nailed the last name. Uh, oh, good. Everybody does it. Just for your information, folks, <laughs> it's, a, it's a Czech last name. It means gardener. They probably should have changed it on Ellis Island, but they didn't, you know. Um, one way or another, it's nice to be with you today. We're going to spend a good part of this two hours talking about the political extingencies and realities of um, life um, well, for libraries, either when they're going to the ballot or they're having uh, discussions with um City councils, county governments, town boards. Uh, the funding formula in Michigan for Michigan public libraries is very interesting. Uh, it has a lot of dynamicism uh, to it as well. And you certainly are, don't exist in a vacuum uh, in terms of the other conversations that are happening in your state. Uh, whether you're planning on going to the ballot uh, in the primaries or the general election in 2022, or if this is something that's a glimmer in your eye many years from now, I'm very glad to ha have you with us today. Um, the work that we do here at Every Library has two components to it. One is our Political Action Committee. It's our 501c4 organization. Uh, C4s are technically super PACs. Um, you can raise and expend unlimited funds if you're a super PAC to uh, advance your nefarious special interests. Congratulations, folks. You are my nefarious special interest. Uh, we do not have unlimited funds. Um, we, we do the work that we do supporting libraries on, on the ballot. Uh, working on legislative initiatives uh, with our partners at state library associations. We run a whole school librarian portfolio. Uh, pro bono and for free though, 
uh, with our donor support. Our donors are individual humans around the country who care about the future of library funding, uh, who believe in the work that we're doing as a C4, uh, and our focus on that one very unusual day of the year, election day, or the day when a city council, county government, school board makes a funding decision, state legislatures as well. Uh, the C4 opportunity, well, we've, we've done 121 election days already for libraries around the country. Several in, in uh, Michigan, uh, many of them uh, with uh, uh, backwards and high heels uh, kind of approach where there's something going on in town that makes it a little bit more difficult uh, to place a measure on the ballot. Uh, we haven't worked uh, all the way across uh, the, um, the state. I can point at different parts of Mittens, apparently. Uh, I'm in Illinois, by the way. I think I understand what that means. Um, but we've done things from uh, the uh, Peter White Library up in, the, uh, up in Marquette, all the way down to Allegan, uh, Kent District Library, some other places uh, right now. St. Clairsville is our most recent one. Unfortunately, it was a loss. Um, the Every Library Institute side um, is our 501c3. Um, that's set up as a public policy, tax policy, uh, education policy think tank. Uh, as a 501c3, it's not a membership organization. It's more of a traditional nonprofit. The way that I like to, to talk about these two organizations together is that our C4, Every Library, the Political Action Committee, is more of our doctor approach. We have one library at, at a time. Uh, they're going to the ballot. You're trying to fight something. You're trying to uh, oppose something. You're trying to encourage something to happen. One library at a time. We have a practice, I guess you could say, as a, do as a doctor. Um, on the C3 side, it's more like public health, where we're working on systems, you know, the, the, the policy issues that impact libraries and the future of library work. So uh, we could work on one patient's cancer, or we could outlaw smoking. You know, there's a third approach that we don't do, which is more pharmaceutical. That's more uh, toolkit kind of focused. We're not a toolkit kind of organization. We're not just read this or fill out this form and you'll feel better about politics and libraries. Um, we're, we're definitely more of that doctor and public health kind of model. What I want to share with you today is, is uh, very much about what we've learned and, un and understand in the current political climate. And all of it is related in some way, shape or form to you personally and to the organization that you're representing that you're thinking about a lot right now. I'm gonna pause several times uh, during this in order to root this conversation in what's up with you. And there will be a moment, I'm sure, where I'm gonna have to say uh, the, the world's worst thing in any webinar, which is, can we talk about that offline? But I wanna let you know that we're not um, interested in uh, kicking the can down the calendar. All of the work that we do with libraries because of our donors allows us to do one-on-one -on -one consultation for free and pro bono. If we don't get to your question today, I want you to call me. Uh, if we don't get to your, your issues deeply enough, that's why we set up half an hour or one hour or, or multiple conversations over the course of a couple months while we help you think through your issues. But I'm gonna be taking you through a couple of high level things today about what we're seeing out in the world in that before the ballot, path to the ballot time. In order to, to, to share with you what we know, and I do wanna take those pauses very deliberately with you. You're gonna see this screen again. And when we do, I don't mind if it's on chat or on mic. As Claire said, Becky's here to help, help us ride herd. Um, I do wanna open the chat for one second though here and uh, echo the welcome that Claire put in there and add my contact and information. You can find us at, at Every Library if you're interested, at Every Library Institute if you're interested in what we're talking to. All right, I'm gonna start our conversation today about, the, about what's going on out, out in the world with an overview of the three languages of politics. Um, and there's actually a fourth one that we're gonna spend a little bit more time on that's emerging right now that is causing a lot of consternation for folks. So the three languages of politics though, are the, the background radiation. They're the, 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 the tawar that any conversation about going to the ballot, any millage, um, if you're in, in California, any measure, if you're in Illinois, any referendum uh, has in it. The funding for libraries in our, in our approach here at Every Library, we recognize, understand, and, and, and um, lean in on the fact that funding for libraries is fundamentally a political conversation. We're talking about taxes. Now, I'm not talking about your collection. I'm not talking about an approach to, to neutrality. I'm not talking about whether or not you can survive a First Amendment audit or not, and we will talk about those in a little while. Um, it's whether or not, um, uh, if we're talking about taxes, politics at its core uh, is what the decisions are, is how decisions are made. How are our value system as a community 
represented in the taxes that we're willing to pay, that we're interested in investing in, in our community anchor institutions like our libraries, directly or indirectly, the choices that we make about how we tax ourselves are, are, are ways that our value systems are expressed. And as we know from America, um, our value systems are not always in alignment with each other. And as we know from library work sometimes, our value systems are sometimes disconnected from our communities, uh, not in fundamental and basic ways though, in rhetorical ways, in, in political theater, in politics of division, they certainly are. But at the core of it all, I wanna help, have us explore for a few moments what it means to be political, uh, political actors. Again, it's not, I'm not looking for you to do some things with your collections or your programs, or your services, but in order to afford your staffing and your buildings, I'd like to have this conversation about politics because it underpins. There are three narratives. Traditionally in politics, we are seeing the emergence of a fourth one. I would like to encourage you all to, if, if you're into this kind of conversation, to read the book that I'm inspired by here. It's called The Three Languages of Politics. It's by a fellow named Arnold Kling. He's a uh, old school fellow at the uh, Cato Institute. It's a libertarian think tank. I think it's brilliant, quite frankly. And uh, it's a little shocking as well about how succinct it is. But the three languages of politics, the three narratives of politics, according to Mr. Kling, have uh, hero and villain narratives attached to them. And I want to share with you his insights and ask you to reflect a little bit about not only where you are personally, but where your colleagues are, where your board is, where your community tends to, to reside in this narrative. Because the, some of these conversations that are difficult around the community are when we have significant unmediated, undiscussed uh, conflicts between these narratives that become disconnects. The progressive ideals, the progressive narrative. I'm going to read these slides because I think they're really smart. I didn't write them. My heroes are people who have stood up for the underprivileged. If you're a progressive, you feel like your heroes, your own self-image as a hero, is someone who stands up for those who cannot who are underprivileged, who are, have less access. The ideals of librarianship, folks, I've been around this business for 20 years. I'm not a librarian myself, but I've met, met a lot of you at different cocktail parties. You seem to be really interested in this kind of progressive ideal. Our rhetoric with our donors, our rhetoric with our, with our um, uh, funders, our politicians, the way that we present ourselves in the newspaper does tend to be a little bit more on the progressive side. In fact, if you were to take a look at uh, the voter file for librarians, the, the, the United States voter file, it's shocking to take a look at it. Uh, you can tell uh, in, in the voter file uh, in certain states that have partisan primaries, you know, you gotta pull a Democrat ballot, you gotta pull, pull a socialist ballot, you gotta pull a progressive or a uh, libertarian ballot, a, a Republican ballot. If we can count those folks up who have librarian or library identified as a place of work in the national voter file, it's like 85% of librarians are pulling ballots that might be construed as more progressive. That's fascinating to me because it then permeates our vocabulary. My heroes are people who have stood up for the underprivileged. The people I cannot stand, again, this is Mr. Kling's narrative here about heroes and villains. The people as a progressive I cannot stand are the people who are indifferent to the oppression of women, minorities, and the poor. And that's an important thing to understand in terms of, of how we might um, position ourselves in our communications and in our marketing. If we do create narratives that are hero and villain as opposed to a conversation about, we can sometimes get into trouble and trip over our own two feet. The narratives that Mr. Kling uh, looks at for conservatives, again, I'm reading the slide because I think it's really smart and something that bears a lot of reflection about how we relate as a library community, a library leadership team, our boards also. My heroes are the people who have stood up for Western values. As a conservative, I am very troubled by well, the assault on uh, moral virtue and traditions. The people I cannot stand are those who are indifferent to the assault on moral virtues and traditions that are at the foundation of our civilization. The barbarians are at the gate. And there are times when I know this to be true around the country, some of the programs, some of the books have a trigger moment 
for Western values. And I don't necessarily understand personally, because I, I mean, folks, I'm a progressive. I run a political action committee for libraries. Let's be honest about it. You know, like I think the canon of Western, uh, the, the, the evolving canon of Western literature is really a great idea. And yet there are people who don't want to see, and they, they love the old Bill Bennett book. How are we speaking to people, though, who make up our elected officials, our own boards, certainly our constituents, folks who use the library all the time, if we have to kind of furrow our brow at them first to understand what they're talking about when it's just a good book? Or it's not a good book in somebody's opinion. The third mainstream narrative, or the libertarian narrative, is the libertarian narrative. Libertarians themselves um, are actually, I mean, in my professional opinion, if you take the horseshoe approach to politics, and over here you got the progressives, up here you got the conservatives, and over here you got the libertarians, you can kind of jump back and forth more easily with libraries between libertarians and progressives sometimes than you can with the conservatives, even though there's a natural and necessary conservatory role, tradition preservational role for conservatives that we have. We might not articulate it as much, but on the libertarian side, my heroes are people who have stood up for individual rights. As a libertarian, I believe that the people I cannot stand are the people who are indifferent to how the government's overreach is taking away people's ability to make their own choices. Folks, I look at this as being uh, potentially very interesting or strange bedfellows on something as, um, as interesting as going fine free. All right, let's take a look at the, the, the libertarian ideal about overreach. You already have your hand in my pocket about taxes, but the library is the one part of government that is multi-purpose rather than single purpose. You seem to be very efficient with how you spend my tax money. If I have to be okay with taxes at all, it doesn't look like it's that bad of an organization in town. And in fact, if you wanna go find free, that's probably a good idea because you're already taxing me once, why are you taxing me twice? And the progressives would say, why are we having fines? It puts up barriers to people participating more fully in the library. Even a nickel, a dime, a quarter, a dollar makes it impossible for some families. They have to make hard choices between things like food and security and safety and a fine for the library. Let's lower that barrier. And I know that in a conversation just as prosaic as going fine free, the unholy alliance between the libertarians and the progressives, the conservatives say, well, what, are we going to at least uh, send them a bill if they never return the book? It's an interesting conversation across these three different modes of politics. And again, the hero narrative and the, the uh, uh, villain narrative, the, the, the indifference about it, we have to be, we, we have to be cognizant of the fact that if our team is aligned in a particular way, and I'm not suggesting all of you on the call are progressives at all, you're not, I get it. I'm not suggesting all of your, your library staffs are not, but if you're variant enough, if you're at odds with your audience, your funding partners, your decision makers, how do we work on our vocabulary, not to minimize our own hero narrative, but to make sure that we're not villainizing somebody else's. How do we work in a way that transmits our moral compass, our value system, our mission, and our vision for our community? Because that's essentially what's on the ballot. The details of how you're funding the library are not what's on the ballot, even though the funding allows you to either staff, collections, programs, services, uh, all the good stuff, the building. But what's on the ballot fundamentally is how are, is our value system going to be realized in our society? And how are, how are all the different hero narratives in the mainstream going to be reflected? There's a fourth way though that is emerging. And I'm gonna pause after this slide folks for some, some Q and A in the chat or on mic, because I do wanna hear what, you, what you're thinking about too and what you're seeing. I, the big question I'll have for you in a moment is, does this sound crazy or not? Because that was always a good, a good uh, conversation prompt, you know? Yes, John, you're crazy. That's always a good prompt. But the fourth type of emerging political language in this country, and you've a particular version of it in Michigan, perhaps longer than some states, the fourth version of, the, the, of a political language is essentially one that I don't think it has a name yet, but it's exemplared in, in a situation like, okay, there's normal book banning challenges now in America. We, we have normal book bans. 
never thought I'd get to this point in my professional career that uh, somebody comes in and they have a problem with a book. And then we have policies that we're going to follow. And we're going to have a, a, a meeting and some hearings. And we're going to have a conversation like adults. And then everybody uh, comes to the table. And then everyone is satisfied with the decision that's made because we followed policy. We look at the First Amendment. We look at the purpose of reading. And then we have abby normal, abnormal. We have odd. We have performative and highly politicized book challenges now in the United States. And the, the way that the fourth narrative of politics is, is, is being, this is still political theory exploration for my part. Obviously, I'm not as articulate as Mr. Kling is in his book, but somebody seems like they want to burn it down. And they want to make a direct attack. And they're not necessarily concerned with a normal process focused on policy. The parental controls or concern vector in those kinds of contexts are extremely important to be aware of. And we're gonna get into a whole slide in a little bit uh, about uh, the, the bans and challenges as a component of, of issues that affect libraries in terms of their path to the ballot. Um, but I always wanna look at whether the book is coming from a personal level of concern or a group think level of concern, um, where if it's coming with, and I hate to use the word legitimate or illegitimate, but if they're not participating in the policy uh, process, they're just making noise in the community. We also have to take a look at the populations that are being represented in the books that are being challenged in this kind of a fourth language of politics kind of way. The, uh, the populations tend to be more GLBTQ or communities of color. We tend not to see other books uh, being addressed or, or, or uh, challenged or questioned. Um, they, it tends to be uh, larger numbers of books, tranches of them, uh, rather than one title where there's been one parent or one guardian who is particularly legitimately wondering why this is on a particular shelf in our library. And the source of the challenges coming in this fourth language are not often indigenous to the community that the library serves. They might not be residents or taxpayers even. Um, they might be coming in from out of town in order to make a point. They might be a part of a larger movement that is uh, regional, uh, statewide, national. And they're not, again, necessarily interested in participating in a solution to a very interesting and difficult conversation about politics. It is not a, po the, the, the po progressive ideal is not, different from the conservative ideal or the libertarian ideal when it comes to challenges. How do we want to apply the First Amendment? How do we want to reflect our community stories? Who do we want to be at the end of this process? In those mainstream political narratives, that's all possible. In these highly politicized and performative ones, that's where we're still figuring this out here, folks, together. All right. What are you seeing out there, team? I want to pause here because this is the, the, the cause du jour right now. I've got 20 minutes under my belt, and if you're not following me yet, it's, it's not going to be a good next uh, couple, couple minutes. Um, are there topics around this political narrative that you want to address? I'm going to be getting into some more tactical things. I have a very long and detailed uh, conversation to be had about the eight sources of opposition to libraries, and book challenges are only one of them, I'm very sorry to report. Becky, is anybody popping up on the chat? There's one um, talking about four challenges this year. Laura Mancini from Northville. Um, she had four challenges, uh, which is a record. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm seeing, I, I know I'm seeing um, quite a few um, and one of the surprising things is that they're coming from uh, board members. Some of them are coming from board members, not from members of the public. Mm -hmm. And again, this is kind of that, an offshoot of some of that um, surprise board member. You know, the board member that gets appointed or elected and is uh, kind of a, a very distinct, different uh, kind of 
uh, philosophy from a lot of the other board members that have been sitting mm -hmm. on the board. So they kind of change the image of the board, uh, mm -hmm. thinking of the board. That, that, that area of, of concern about uh, uh, board members. So Claire, as you mentioned in my biography, I was the board president for my hometown in Berwyn, Illinois. Uh, it's from Chicago, if you know Berwyn. Uh, folks, it's, uh, it's near Oak Park, uh, Riverside, Stickney, Cicero, near West. I can stick my head out the window and see the Sears Tower from here, but we're not Chicago. Um, the, the, the board is appointed by our city council. Um, next door to us in, in, uh, in Oak Park, it's elected at large. Um, the board conversations that are, board members are, are charged with um, serving in the public trust. Uh, but the way that they get on the, uh, the board, um, whether it is elected or appointed, uh, determines who's public they're paying attention to. And the constituents of that particular elected official or the, um, the relationship to that uh, appointed official on your board to their appointing authorities makes all the difference in the world. Um, there's no amount of, of uh, board retreat work um, that is going to convert somebody from an anti-government or anti-tax or anti-access individual um, to, a, to someone who has comity uh, with the rest of the board's ideals, uh, value system about libraries or mission. Um, the fact of the matter of board service is that when it's, when it's uh, uh, a casual first Tuesday, third Wednesday, second Thursday of the month, kind of meeting and you get a couple of committee meetings and we have to address a few things here and there. When it's, when it's normal, um, the value system, the mission, the vision of the board members, the other board members on that board uh, don't have to be necessarily questioned, scrutinized, understood, or even at its most basic considered. When we're confronted as individuals on boards, with somebody who is radically variant or relatively at odds with us based on our value system. And we haven't had the time ourselves to think through the big whys of, of, of well, if we're just trying to be nice people on the board, doing something nice for our neighbors, and we get hit with a, with a big challenge. I can tell you that as those of you who are directors or board presidents on this call today, the thing that we need to be prepared for is a situation where your board members are going to react um, out of their, their unpreparedness for these big conversations uh, in either fear or shame. Um, it is a powerful uh, primary affect and the fear or shame that a board experiences causes paralysis or it causes anger. And those two affects um, of, a, of boards uh, together when there's conflict will do more to um, slow down or even stop a library from making good progress towards a ballot ca campaign, uh, towards a millage, uh, towards a new project. It'll do more, and it, none of it can be addressed very easily in a, in a large group setting. I would highly in, encourage you and definitely invite you to contact us um, and other good folks around Michigan about these kinds of conflicts. Claire, you're asking in the chat for me to relate that to millage struggles. Where does opposition come from is rooted in the hero and the villain narratives. And I got about 10 slides for you in a few minutes. I just, I just wanna be careful about going off the track <laughs> onto, oh, onto the, the um, Band books. Oh, no, I get you. I get you. All right. Let me scroll back up here. Anything in here? All right, team. That sounds great. Let me keep rolling. All right, Claire. I've got some more political theory for you and the team. I hope you don't mind. Oh. Okay. I want to share you some insights on how, on, on, on some, um, you have a big idea for the community. You have a prosaic idea, like simply renewing your millage. Um, you have a new building to build. You have a hope for the community. How are people going to be listening? And how are they, how's this background radiation? Again, the progressive, uh, conservative, libertarian uh, sides of things. How is, how is it going to be received in their hearts, their heads, and their guts? 
there are seven reasons that people are motivated to vote. Not necessarily even, you know, for or against, they're just motivated to vote. Um, it's interesting in Michigan, uh, like here in suburban Chicago, number seven, if it's election day and it's raining or snowing, um, you know, things like I woke up on a Tuesday in November and it's a blizzard will affect how voter turnout happens. This is for anything. This is a candidate. This is for top of the ticket. This is for a library. Have we given them though, number one, the reason to vote? Um, and the reason to vote issues for libraries are not as focused on enlightened self-interest or a user's um, feelings, uh, a user's, uh, um, you know, like, oh, I'd like to see some more stuff at the library. The reason to vote is very much about the value system of the community being expressed in their taxes through the library as an enactor of that value system. It's a fascinating thing because the voters, the, sorry, the user status of the voter on election day does not matter. It's the voter status of the voter matters. Have they been mobilized to vote? And really the library is probably not a big enough campaign to mobilize them to come out and vote that day. There's other things that are on the ticket. Or number four on the list, they personally are voters. They have a habit, a culture or tradition of voting. It's fascinating to me personally. I mean, not, not to make this a personal story, there's, there's all kinds of variant behaviors here, but um, I've voted in everything since Dukakis versus Bush. I love to vote. I bring my kids to vote. We get the sticker, you know? We have, um, I go for ice cream with them because I believe it, you know? And I, if they don't vote when they're older, I'm gonna be mad at them. They know it. So they're gonna lie to me for years if they don't go to vote. But I believe in it because that's my civic responsibility. And if I walk into the polling place and I just read Shell the XYZ Public Library, do a certain millage, uh, et cetera, with some Headley overrides and something about, you know, maybe wolves on it. I'm like, I don't know what that means. You know, the, the, the conversation around opposition actually starts with a lack of marketing. And I'm gonna get into that in a few minutes. It also it needs for successful votes to happen for some candidate or cause that is an expression of your value system to have some personal contact with a candidate or the issue. Now, I've never had any personal contact with President Obama, President Trump, Mrs. Clinton, any of them, but I've seen enough advertising and I've heard from enough people who say that candidate is my guy or my gal in order to have that, that sort of personal contact that says I can, I can vote for them. I also need to know if I, if I have fundamentally any trust in government, at least on a library uh, campaign, you get high marks still amongst mainstream folks. It's interesting to note that there are also seven reasons um, that uh, people become uh, activists. And I wanna share this with you because I look at not only the day of your election for the millage, but I also look at the day after the election, win or lose, you're gonna, well, you win, you've got a lot more people who are involved in what you're doing. How do you carry that into friends organizations, into other fundraising and other, other volunteerism in, in that power building um, that makes sure that the library has the right kind of relationships? Um, the day after the election you lose, it's nice to, to, to have more friends that you've made who are willing to make another run at it with you. It's interesting around activism uh, because the, in the same way there's weather problems in places like your part of Michigan and my part of Illinois on election day sometimes, uh, advocates and act activists, uh, number seven there, if you don't have a smooth pathway for them to participate um, in, in your activism or your advocacy, they're not gonna do it if the tools are bad. But the identified need, for most people, what drives their reason to be an activist, to be a, an advocate, uh, to stand with you uh, for uh, or getting organized and moving a big conversation forward in a community, the identified need is not necessarily a personal need. Even if you're working on a cause as significant as the, like, say, breast cancer research and the walk for, for the Susan G. Coleman Walk for Life. Most people who are walking are not themselves Cancer survivors, their friends, their family, they're compassionately engaged. Most people who donate to Greenpeace are not themselves getting into the dinghy and going out in the North Atlantic and personally saving whales. They have, they have a value system that says, and number five, there's a reputation for the institution 
constitution that says they are valid enactors of your value system. I, I would like to see the whales saved. Can I cut you a check while you go out to the North Atlantic? In both of these kinds of cases here, between why people vote and why activists are activists, the reason that I'm, I'm having this part of the conversation here is because the where where your millage campaign lands is in a landscape that is much bigger than just the library. It lands in a landscape that is much bigger than just the work that you folks do in that particular town or across your service area. The context is really not for the users. The, the context on election day or on the day somebody cuts you a check or decides to be a volunteer is based on the moral compass. And unless you're doing communications ahead of time about which way your moral compass points, unless you're talking ahead of time about how, well, it's not the Greenpeace model of somebody getting in a dinghy, can I cut you a check? But the librarians, the library workers in the community, if we have compassion, if we wanna see our value system enacted, if we wanna see somebody who's on a common mission with us, or there's a vision for the community that I also share, I need to see that mode of engagement from you in order to make my vote happen or my dollars or my volunteer time uh, go to the right kind of work. It is not a conversation about, we've got you know, several features to accomplish. We need more staff. We need different books. We need better technology. The square footage is all wrong. The building's falling down around our heads. All of that tactical stuff is in there. And number five, the trust or the institutional relation or the institutional reputation, they, they expect you to tell them the truth. But when somebody is acting uh, on election day based on their moral compass, again, are we pointing in the same direction as them? Have we used the right kind of vocabulary to describe for a libertarian, a conservative, or a progressive how we are on a shared values system? The personal motivation is not to, to, the mobilization is not to go out and get in a dinghy with you. It's to make sure you have the resources to put it to work on our behalf. Okay, so how are humans wired with that kind of context? There's a couple of insights I wanna share for you. People listen to ideals. People listen to candidates. People listen to the donor pitch. People listen when there's a commercial on, on social media or on TV for, 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 voting, uh, for voting for a particular candidate. They listen in, in one of four potential ways. Uh, everyone has a, a, a potential admixture of these in their own hearts, their own heads, and their own guts. But really, when you get right down to it, most people are, uh, everybody's wired for one of four primary approaches. Compassion drives a lot of decision-making uh, out in society, but so does pride, data, and concerns. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because this is the background, again, radiation, if you will, for how other things on the ballot, how other, other uh, issues that are being um, uh, put forward for donor support, other places for people to be involved emotionally, are trying to reach those folks that you're also trying to reach. Compassion engagement is one of four. It might be the easiest one for libraries. We, we like doing it. We are compassionate for a population. We have a compassion for a particular group of people. We're gonna help that one kid learn how to read. And he, is, and he or she's story is an exemplar of how we've helped other people learn how to read. We are engaged in lowering those kinds of barriers. We're making sure that it's a hand up instead of a hand out. And we love the people. We really do. We sincerely and truthfully love people. And if you love people too, we're taking care of those same people you love. And the messaging on election day prep is truly around that. What's, what's the, the how? Why are we taking care of those people? With what kind of resources? And it's not the only driver for behavior on election days. There's a lot of people out there who are like, those kids, those kids need a place to go. Uh, to get off my lawn, not to be taken care of. Uh, I'm not saying that in the, totally in a negative way, but it's kind of true. Pride of place drives a lot of decision-making on election days. What kind of interesting, thriving, or prosperous hometown are we trying to make 
or reimagine or support or bolster or return to. The interesting thriving and prosperous triptych is really one of systems thinking and not engagement with individuals. Yeah, it's nice that you're helping Johnny learn how to read, but isn't there a literacy center in town? I don't know if the schools do that too. Tell me about the infrastructure of civil society that you're looking to build up here and how those systems can either uh, extend our success or avert failures that are about to happen in the community. And tell me how they're enacted with, with public tax dollars. Those two frames, if you can just get from, from the, the compassion frame and add pride on top of it, community pride, you know, the, the, the what kind of town do we want to be aspects of it and how we're doing that, either turning it around or supporting it, you'll be a lot more successful. Because there's a bunch of people who are, who are, who are not just looking for that, that, that happy story, that sob story. The other place that you could find some additional success in your millage planning is around being uh, aware of and cognizant of and, and solicitous of folks who are data driven in their storytelling and in their listening. If you've sat through another project from me before or another, another webinar from me before, you might have heard me tell the story about my father-in-law, Ed the umpire. Ed is a softball umpire, 16 inch no glove, he's great. Uh, he was a bookkeeper by trade. Uh, he calls balls and strikes for fun. Ed watches sports all night. And then he gets up the next morning, he gets the Chicago Sun-Times, and he reads the box scores because he wants to see if he missed anything on ESPN 1, 2, or 3. He reads all the box scores. And then what Ed does after he looks at the statistics is he turns the page and he reads about the team. He reads about the team. Are they on a slump? Are they on a streak? What's the star player doing? What's management got in store for this? What's the front office want to do? All of those stories about the success or failure of those teams, all the stories, quite frankly, for a, a guy like my father-in-law, Ed, the data is his gateway to knowing whether or not your library is legitimately asking for new money on, on its ballot box and if you're going to do something good with it or not. He does have compassion. He does have pride. But the data drives his ability to understand whether or not the outcomes you're describing are, are, are feasible or not, plausible or not, legitimate or not. And his lens needs to be respected. And on election day, you have a lot of people who would otherwise seem like, oh, they're nice people. They must care about the community. They're civically engaged, or they must have pride about the community. They're, 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 they're registered voters. They want to see what's good out there. And yet they are going to put their bifocals down on their nose. They're going to look over the top of the report at you and say, what are you going to do with the money? And it's not just a pride story. And it's not just a compassion story. Where's the data underneath it all? There's a fourth type of, of human being. I'm not talking about voter here exclusively, though it, it's expressed when they go in and they punch a chad. Their value system around compassion, their value system around pride of place, their value system about being data and thoughtfully driven people. The fourth one is a, a really mainly in play after the disaster. And I'll take it off the slide once we get far enough away from COVID. I always leave it on the slide in Louisiana, though, for the most recent hurricane, for example. Um, the concerned or fear-filled person. And I don't mean fear-filled in a paralyzed sort of way. I mean, their lens is to say, we've just gone through a global pandemic. Things are serious. Things are, are you, are you just trying to tell me another story about helping some kid learn how to read? We've got a fall off in grade level reading now. It's two years. These kids are two years behind. Uh, what are we doing about it? How are you a library shaped solution to these massive problems in our community? How are these librarian enacted solutions? What do you need to get it done? And if all you're doing is storytelling, everybody else has got a good story. I'm going to move on. And I hate to put it like that, folks, but we're in a place now where all four of these are in play, which means we have to be fairly sophisticated and engaged with our storytelling, even if we just want to inoculate ourselves against problems coming from one vector or another. Why do people listen? Why do people listen when it comes to a, a, a concept as important as politics or as important as saving the whales or trying to cure cancer? Why, why do people listen to these messages? Why do people identify the enactors of that value system as a, a candidate or a, a cause, a uh, celeb? 
So I had a very big slide. I'm going to have the first two at the top and the bottom ones on another slide way, way below. By the way, this is from a great book. Again, this isn't me. This is a smart person. Drew Weston. Uh, it's called The Political Brain. Uh, 2008. If you love politics, you would definitely like to read it. If you don't really like politics and you just want to get some more insights, don't read it before bedtime. It'll make you a little crazy. But what drives, according to Mr. Weston, what drives people to become part of a party, to vote for a candidate, the reason that Donald Trump and uh, uh, Bernie Sanders ran as a, a, a Republican and as a Democrat, even though neither of them were, was because of the top two reasons, identification with value systems and identification with, with party. And I'm talking about politics here, folks, because you're on the ballot. This is what people want. They wake up on a Tuesday morning. They go to the polling place. They're not thinking of themselves as users. They're not thinking of themselves as non-users. Certainly they're not. They're thinking about themselves as voters and political actors. And so what's the, does the campaign or the candidate align with my deeply held belief? So if you have not taken the time to describe your deeply held beliefs about, say, literacy, or to describe your deeply held beliefs about taking care of seniors, or helping folks at moments of transition or crisis, or having a book on the shelf for everybody, regardless of ages or stages, that we, if we haven't described our values, how can they see us resonating their values? If we don't have a shared identity as the library party, if I was doing this, this presentation, Claire, in Italy, we could talk about actually building like a library party instead of a minor party. There's like 27% of the American public believe in libraries. It's enough to get like somebody elected in parliament in Italy. But, we're, but really what we have is a party of people who have a value system that is expressed by the librarian who's the candidate. And the library workers too. I'm not just using librarian in a way that's kind of generic here. This is psychoactive. This is where... Folks walk into the, the polling place and they're like, yeah, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote the straight ticket this time around literacy, around economic development, around support for people in moments of different, uh, different moments in their lives. Again, big gap, though, between values and identity and the characteristics of the candidate and the specific policies. Um, the characteristics of the candidate, I always say, if uh, for every uh, Donald Trump, I'll raise you a Bill Clinton, you know. And the specific policies, folks, this is where we spend all of our time in our communications, usually on our millage campaigns. It's where we spend all of our time on our, our community charrettes for our building campaigns, and we shouldn't. There's a certain number of voters, I'll give you. There's a certain number of like, like a particular type of voter who is going to be very interested in if, for a building campaign if you're using carpeting or tile. They're going to be very interested in, in copper piping versus PVC, and they're going to come to all your community charrettes. And yet, how is your value system currently not being supported by your building? You got one hand tied behind your back. The form of your building is not allowing you to function properly as a library. Tell me about your values and your identity as people who care or pride of place or show me some good data about it too. And how are we taking care of the big problems in our society coming through COVID? The particulars, I'm not gonna really pay attention to. That's why you got a board of trustees. There are four kinds of people who, there are four ways that people are aligned in their support. And on election day, in the movement up to election day, the goal for any one of the, these efforts is to try and find more people who are at the center of it or move people into the center of it. The relational supporter, somebody who knows and understands whether they use the place or not currently, knows and understands libraries and librarians. They have a lifestyle. They're not necessarily super users, but they, they the super users certainly are. This country is littered with, with, with libraries named after families that are too rich to use the place. They'll never come in. Your, your library's got book plate after book plate after book plate dedicated to somebody who you only see once a year. Maybe, at, you know, like they might come to the benefit of it or they might cut your friend's group a check, but they care deeply. Those relational supporter types in that, in that uh, election day, they're also the ones that you're looking for for your donors and your volunteers, but really more for your donors, the people who actually want to show up and do something or smaller. Then you've got two other types of, of supporters, kind of the rings out from those relational supporters that are the folks we have to talk about on election day. Um, the ideological people, they have some questions about what the library is doing to, to have uh, to support 
uh, and extend the, the shared ideology that they have. They're aligned with what libraries what librarians do and who, and, and who libraries are, um, but they might be a little out of touch about the particulars. It's a very easy communications campaign, of course, to activate relational supporters. If you know who they are, you've kept in touch. It's a little bit more complicated with ideological supporters because you have to connect a lot of dots. They're, they're, they're not power users of the library. They might drive by, they see your parking lot's full, they think everything's fine, but they have an out of date or disconnected view of how money supports the same things that they believe in that you already do. Because they're not coming in and using it. There's a little bit of the uh, there before the grace of God go I in your in your in, in those ideological supporters. I'm glad the library's there. You're doing the Lord's work, Karen. But you haven't told me recently about how we are truly aligned. There's another kind of supporter uh, for any cause. They tend to be be more activist than um, um, advocacy focused, and that's a whole other seminar. But the aversionary supporters, people who will vote for a candidate because they're actually voting against the other candidate. So, and this is not politics of division. I'm not trying to get into politics of division, but there are people who would like to avoid bad outcomes. Tell me what happens if I don't vote for you. Like what's the, the bad candidate is what? Illiteracy? I'll vote against illiteracy. The bad candidate is what? The, the poverty of our, of our civil society? I'll vote against uh, people not having a hand up. And that kind of approach where, where they say, let's not screw it up this time, is actually a very important messaging vector because your competencies should be driving a big part of why you're going to the ballot in the first place. And of course, there's, there's a kind of supporter for any political action who wants access to the candidate. We don't have a lot of those in libraries. If you can figure out how to get a $10,000 plate dinner, for you, when you're going to the ballot, I'd love to sit with you. I want to learn everything from you. But if they all they want is like a library supporter, a library champion yard sign, they want a library button, they want to they want to put a uh, a yard sign in front of their lawn. They're perfect human beings, as far as I'm concerned. But don't expect too much from them. Other than that, there are only one of two reasons in the entire history of humankind to give you money. There are only two reasons, and one of them is your campaign theme. Stories of success that demonstrate that you are competent already with the money. We have been successful. We would like to extend our success. That's version A. Version B is we've been successful over here. We'd like to replicate our success over there. We've been very successful with story times. Uh, and other kind of really cool programs. We normally do 50 a week, but we're gonna ask for this money in order to do 150. Or we've been very successful at story times. We got 50 kids here, we're at humming along. It's beautiful, life-changing. We wanna do the same thing for seniors. That's it, stories of success. That's one campaign theme. Or stories of failure that are telling a true story that demonstrate your integrity as librarians and library workers, we have the integrity to identify a failure. And we need your help as the voters to either fix it or avert it. There's a failure right now in our community of, around literacy services for kids. We're not reading at grade level. Look at what happened during COVID. We wanna fix that failure. We need this, this funding request in order to do it. Our building is literally falling down around our ears. We haven't had an upgrade since Carnegie died. We'd really like to do something good with the place so that we have their modern building. We're gonna fix this failure or we're gonna avert it. And by avert it, I mean, we know that in three to five years with the changes happening in how people do work around our community, remote work, gig economy, we know in three to five years because we've been paying attention, we have integrity. We know that without the resources that come from this millage request, we, we can't serve them properly. The particulars are very much about your library, but those two themes, the campaign themes, it's because in politics, you either have an incumbent or you have, I'm sorry, you either run as the incumbent or you run against the incumbent. That's it. In politics, you're running either as the incumbent, reelect me, I will continue to take care of you, or you run against the incumbent, get rid of that shyster, put me in, I will take care of you. 
So sometimes you have to run that way as the we've been successful. Send us back to Lansing, send us back to DC. We'll continue to take care of you. Or you have to run against yourself. And that's hard. But the integrity that drives that honesty is also the thing that the voters will actually see. If you're trying to pull the wool over their eyes and say it's all a good, happy campaign and it ain't, they're all those different kinds of supporters are going to punch holes in it. Whether they're relational supporters, they're going to hold their nose and be like, well, I know that the library says this, but it's actually that. All those ideological supporters are going to be like, well, you guys haven't been very good doing literacy services so far. When you're telling me you're great, you're going to extend it. The aversionary supporters are like, this is good going to be, this is, this is good money after bad. The access supporters won't wear your button. If we take all of these different slides that I've just taken you through, including the three languages of politics that drive the narrative here, I think we have 256 potential messages. You, you, add, you multiply the, the types of supporters with the success stories, with the, the political narratives and the value system uh, and, 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 and um, identity issues. I think it's 256 potential messages. I did the math the other day. You don't need all of them, folks. Your community is going to have, well, more than five. We, we tend to have five big stories in, in, in library marketing. Um, kids, seniors, uh, something about our technology as either being like, I don't know, the global marketplace, or maybe it's nice to have because people can do resumes. Uh, that's three. Four is, um, oh, community cohesion. That's our fourth one. And the fifth one's like whatever our local pro uh, thing is, like uh, we have a great genealogy collection. No offense. We need a few more than that when there are so many different vectors. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit on marketing and I'm going to pause. All right. When I pause, you get to ask questions or make comments. Um, that's again, chat, come on, Mike. After this little bit on marketing, then we're going to get to the eight reasons thing. And I know everybody's eagerly anticipating the eight reasons that libraries lose. Okay, team, what I know from out in the world, oh gosh, we're right on time, Claire. It's amazing. What I know from out in the world is that um, the marketing that's done by libraries to have somebody come in tomorrow uh, is great. Come in tomorrow, there's a story time, bring your kids, 10 a.m. There's a program that you might like to participate in. It might be educational, it might be entertaining. Lovely. Come in, get your books. Come in tomorrow, get your books. We're open 10 to 6. But that isn't what drives decision-making on election days in the slightest. There's a whole bunch of humans in, your, in this country, in your community, um, who don't need what you have, but they believe in what you've done yesterday with the resources that you've been given by, by the taxpayers or by the donors. Yesterday, we had 50 kids. We had five kids, whatever the truth is. We had 50 kids come in last week for story time. It was life-changing. The letter shapes and numbers, first language literacy. Uh, we helped the parents become better parents, which is kind of amazing. Um, Nancy, the, 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 our, our youth services librarian, loves your kids. Next week, we got 50 more coming, but we should have 150. We're a little short right now on our taxpayer support. We know that there's another 100 kids out there for Miss Nancy to work with and do all that kind of amazing stuff that she did yesterday. You don't even have kids. You don't have a child who's of story time age. I'm not going to market for you to come to my thing. I'm going to tell you what I did with your tax money yesterday. The impact stories are the hardest ones to tell. And you've gone through a million different webinars from a whole bunch of different organizations over the years saying, collect your stories of impact. Well, folks, you collect your stories of impact, okay? Because unless I'm in a user, specific user demographic, where I have a need or a want at that moment, the thing that activates me on election day on a decision day for city council, county government, state reps, the federal government, as a donor, as a volunteer, the thing that activates me is whether or not I see my value system enacted in the world. And I have an understanding of how it's done through taxes. 
you got to spend some money on this marketing, folks. If it's 18 to 36 months before your election day, the single biggest thing you can do is, is not worry about getting more people in the front door to become users. It's to tell folks what you've already been doing with their money to enact their value system. There are other people out there in the community who should be able to vouch for you. And this, when we get into working with you in a particular place, I'd be happy to take you through the inventory. Um, there's a lot of different vectors for these conversations that are bigger than just my story time, literacy focused, read by third grade, pre-K readiness examples so far. And where, what they are in your particular community are going to be peculiar to your particular uh, election day. And I'm good with that. Because the same issues around do we recognize and realize and operationalize a value system and a shared identity as people who care in a place that wants to be more interesting, thriving, or prosperous is all rooted in these same places. And it would be very nice if I'm if in the lead up to election day, in the lead up to your millage planning, that you had the right kind of endorsements. The easiest way for me to dismiss your library millage as somebody who's in opposition to you, either active opposition or passive opposition to you, is to wave my hand. This is a patented gesture. It's the dismissive wave of the hand. It says, if, you're not, if I'm not on screen right now, folks, just imagine the queen waving her hand dismissively, saying, get these dogs away from me. I don't want you to be a special interest group. And we tend to be more alone than we should be. And therefore, we are perceived potentially as being a special interest group. It's just those library people who want it. What I want to be able to do with this is say, who else is mission aligned? Who else is, has a common vision for our community? Whose value systems intersect and interact with ours? And ask them to endorse us. Because when problems come across pol political speech, when there's opposition that pops up for ver various different reasons, uh, the library itself, unless you have a lot of raw political power in town by yourself, needs a bigger tent. All politics is bigger tent. The only way that you can get anything done uh, on election day is to make sure that it's more than just your core party. Oh, by the way, uh, one of the fun things I like to talk about when we get into the weeds with you, if we're going to do you know, direct kind of support for you, one of the things that, that I, I, would, I, I wish I would have known when I was on the board for my local library, I was on the board for eight years. I was board president for six years. We were in two strategic planning processes. And I really wish that we, I had known this back then. You know, the book, the candidate writes, you know, you, you, like I would love for, the, for the, the ABC, CBS, CNN, Fox, everybody just to ask the librarians, hey, at the next big presidential election, what's circulating? You know, what, what, what books are circling right now? Is it, is it, it takes a village? Is it make America great again? Is it uh, dreams from my father? Because you know in those circ stats, folks, people, they take that book out. They love it. They, 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 they're going to buy it for their friends and their family. And if they don't like it, they're going to throw it at the television set because it offends their value system. Your strategic plan, if, if my strategic plan that I was going to take to the ballot if I could give it a better title than uh, Library Strategic Plan 2030, I'd really appreciate that. And if we can talk about the value system that we have that's going to be enacted if it's properly funded. The hope that we have for the community, our integrity that says there's problems if we don't. The features of our strategic plan make all the difference, yes. After you win the ballot measure, or get the funding that you need to enact it. In fact, we encourage libraries to write two strategic plans, one that is properly funded if it passes on election day, one that is improperly funded. Because unless it's a, a sudden death election, and there's, those do happen around the country, unfortunately, um, unless there's a sudden death election, you have to describe to them what happens, what happens if it fails. In fact, we, we, we try and root that uh, in plan A, and plan B. Our communications philosophy for anything that's going on the ballot, uh, you don't get a multiple choice test on election day. The only thing that's on the ballot is shall the XYZ public library levy a certain millage in order to, you know, with Hancock and, you know, no, Headley. 
it's Headley in Michigan. The um, Hancock's in Missouri, it's just as bad. Um, it's not a multiple choice test on election day, but the communications campaign, what happens if we're properly funded or empowered? That's what happens the day after the election. How are we re realizing our value system? How are we operationalizing our mission? What's our vision uh, for, for tomorrow? Year one, year three, year five, our strategic plan. It takes a village with this library at the center of it. Dreams from my hometown public library. Uh, make our hometown library great again. Plan B though, and this is very important. We tend not to do this. I'm not sure why. Because you've got a whole bunch of people in your community who are suspicious, not necessarily of the library, but of taxes. They're suspicious of government. They're suspicious of how things have been going in the community. Uh, they're downright ornery. And yeah, there's a lot of relational supporters who love plan A. They wanna hear about the good stuff. They're relational, they love you already, even though they don't come in very often. And there's a bunch of people who are ideologically aligned who are like, oh, plan A, that makes sense because I also wanna see these, these things happen in the world. But the, some of those aversionary supporters are downright suspicious. And they're like, don't lie to me this time. What happens if we don't? And being able to tell somebody, here's what happens if it passes, here's what happens if it fails, brings up both your competency, which we always like talking about, but our integrity as well. And the only reason to vote for you as a proxy, because that's what you are, by the way, if you're not, a, if the individual voter is not a super user, all you are is a proxy for their compassion or an enactor of their pride. That's a powerful place to be, don't get me wrong. That's incredible. But to deliver both of those messages allows you to cut through a lot of other noise put a lot of daylight between you and other sorts of boondoggles that have happened in the community before and to root it in something that truly matters. All right, did I ask the big question of what are you seeing on this next slide? I think I did. Let me take a deep breath here while we look at the chat, Claire and Becky, what's come in since and what's on your minds, folks? Um, we have one question. Um, mm -hmm from Michelle that says, my millage is in three years. Should I start using this language now? Yes. In our publications, yes. social media, et cetera? Yes, 100%. And the mar if nothing else, okay, so here's my, if nothing else, the baby steps thing is write your annual, annual report every month, okay? Um, what do we do? And then describe the impactors of it rather than the features of it. Just start with that. Um, though, if, you, if, you, if that's a lot of work, I have an easier one even to start with now, which is to humanize your social media and your marketing. So even if you're just looking to promote things that are happening tomorrow, tomorrow, story time, 10 a.m., bring your kids, please use the next sentence, which is Miss Nancy, who loves your kids, is gonna teach them some wonderful things. If nothing else, if we can at least humanize, the folks who are working there, the numbers right now nationally on understanding and trust of librarians are, are terribly low. And it's part of the vulnerability that we're seeing a lot of these challenges happening is that they're actually going after the librarians themselves too. They're questioning your integrity, they're questioning your competencies. And it's not just getting you out to be seen, you know, um, at, a, at, a, at a, a local fair or some, you know, 4-H thing. It's who is doing the work? Because the, the questions that, that every single voter has is not just where's my money gonna go, but who's spending my money? I'm not looking at the check, Claire, what do you got? I, I don't see anything else in the chat. Groovy. Um, is there anybody out there who would like to unmute and ask a question? Nope, we're groovy. Nope. Okay, cool. Okay. okay. So we're coming around the horn. Let me get into opposition, all right? Now, you're gonna get all these slides, don't worry. And each one of these, these particular things, you might need to call me, all right? If you do, that's great. Um, but don't call me if it's just one of them. If you have like three of them out of the eight, then, I, then give me a call, okay? Um, otherwise, well, you can call me even if it's just one. If you're just like, hey, John, I got a problem with, 
great, we can talk for a few minutes, but we tend to work more closely. I said at the beginning about backwards and high heels campaigns. We work with about 10% of all of the library election days around the country every year. It's super weird to me. It's like a phantom uh, statistic. I don't know how it happens. If there's 240 libraries on the ballot, I'll, we'll do 23 or 24. If there's 90, we'll do nine, like there was last year. It's, it's so, but let's talk about where these things are coming from. And it's much bigger than just some of the, the, the noise happening in society these days. Where I look at opposition, folks, is not uncomfortable questions that are legitimately in the minds of your voters and your donors and your citizens. These are communications conversations here. These are like, let's tell some good narratives about what we're up to. Why do we, why do we exist? This is not, these are not pleasant. Somebody comes at you with this at a town hall meeting, um, at the grocery store, over a cocktail at Thanksgiving, because that does happen. Hey, I didn't know that people still these libraries. How's your job going? These all have answers to them based in the work that you're either going to try and succeed at or the failures you're going to try and fix. But this isn't where opposition comes from. Opposition comes from, I'm sorry, yeah, those are three legitimate questions for your slides. You can be like, okay, great, that's nice. Eight reasons that libraries lose, and there's some corollaries here. And you're gonna get the slides, don't write them all down, you're fine. But the eight reasons with a couple of other corollaries in here um, are really driven by three different uh, locuses. One is uh, external opposition, the other is internal opposition, and the third is existential dread. And I can't really figure out a better word for that um, than existential dread. And I'll get to what that means in a moment. The key re one, the first reason, and these are not in order. Uh, you might have the third one only. You might have none of them. God bless you. But they're important to take a look at. But the first one I put on the list is the easiest to ameliorate. It addresses our, our colleague who was wondering about 36 months from now. The biggest source of opposition is simply that we have not done any marketing. That the opposition comes from the fact that when people walk into the polling place, they have no context other than their ground state as voters for what is on the ballot. Shall the XYZ public library levy a certain amount of money? The millage shall be, and they don't know why. If you're the ground state of the voter is somebody who's very suspicious. If the ground state of the voter is somebody who needs a lot more data, if the ground state of the voter is somebody who you haven't connected the dots with about how you're on a shared mission, it's very difficult then for us in our current society to assume, well, the national number for library, the Library Party of the United States, the, the true believers, the will always vote for you always, provided that the ballot language isn't confusing about some sort of holdbacks or penal fine things or you know, I mean, you get some complicated ballots in, in Michigan about how uh, it's a renewal, but it looks like a new tax. That's the hardest one. God, when they do that to you. <clears throat> if they haven't had something coming to them about what the devil it's all about, I don't like that that's the source of opposition. It's perfectly internal. It's something we can correct. Number two. Opposition from local elected officials, even though they're not um, running the library, but they're going to run against you. There are lots of reasons that local elected officials can oppose a library millage. The sign here uh, is, is, is one of them. This is the eastern shore of, uh, of uh, uh, Virginia, you know, the Delmarva Peninsula. The... Uh, the um, Sorry, this is the Maryland uh, Eastern Shore. The county commissioner, Chairman Crockett, uh, ran against the library's building initiative out there. It's far enough away that we don't know the guy, you or me, but I know him because he ran against my library. Um, he ran against the library. Uh, he got on the radio uh, on his weekly radio program, and he, he talked about how it's not the right time for the library to go out for the, for the, for the ballot. And it wasn't a big opposition campaign, but it was enough to knock five, seven, 10 points off of the polls. Now, the reason he did that, it came out after the election, was that his brother-in-law had a parcel he wanted to sell to the library. And those small town politics drive a lot of decision-making. 
the disconnect also between the platforms of our elected officials and what the library espouses, sometimes are cause for opposition from local electeds. If you are not uh, necessarily um, helping to operationalize or realize their platform, they might be coming out against you. If they are more into economic development and you look like an extension of the school district, it's very difficult sometimes with these, these, these local elected officials to say, why should we be spending more money on the library when the schools already do their core work? There's ways to ameliorate this sort of problem. Uh, and that quite frankly is the endorsement request. Getting these folks on board with you early in the process, uh, bringing to them the, the idea that they are, well, alongside you, responsible for interesting places to live. And they might not know about your programming as being actually interesting. That they're responsible for thriving places to live and your literacy programs and your, 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 your health informatics and your um, uh, community cohesion work is aligned with their platforms. And that they're also responsible for, responsible for prosperous places to live which means that the economic drivers that you produce need to be well positioned properly as economic drivers. And to ask them to be a part of the campaign is, well, maybe it's unusual for you, but it's a way that politics is done. Third reason, third source of great opposition. And you've seen this in Michigan, seen it in Illinois, seen it all over the country, organized anti-tax groups. Um, the organized anti-tax group might not be huge. It might not be the Tea Party. It might be three or four old, older dudes who are spray painting signs and putting them up on their on their 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 mailbox. You know, four by eight sheet of plywood with optic orange paint saying "Vote No for Library" it happens occasionally in Michigan. Sometimes you see organized. Uh, organizing of anti-tax groups happening in the in the comments section of a newspaper online and we have not had the permission or perhaps courage to engage that group as it's organizing my strongest advice for you with any anti-tax organization if you're anticipating problems is to in the 18 to 36 months or even 60 months ahead of time um, before you're going to go to the ballot either because you're obliged to by statute or you have a hope for new funding is to bring them in as early as possible not with the opportunity to veto your idea but with the idea that radical transparency and a vocabulary of political speech that might not be immediately familiar to you personally is employed to talk about and to answer all of the questions. And it has to be bigger than literacy and it has to be bigger than little kids. There is a sincere belief system behind anti-tax organizations. Anti-tax organizations that are not simply bomb throwers have a philosophy of government. It's smaller government, it's fewer tax dollars. This is not a, a ideological fight by radicals. This is a conversation that says, what does a small amount of smart tax money do in our society? Now, if, of course, if the anti-tax organization is like, we're just gonna burn it all down to the ground, that's a couple slides from now. But the reason you bring them in early is in order to have the conversation uh, so you're a November election. In October, they'll pop up out of the woodwork at you and start fighting you. Uh, unless, of course, you talk to them back in April or March or last October to say, Gary, Steve, we had this conversation already. We answered all of your, all of your, your questions. We showed you all the books. You guys didn't have any problem with it back then. Why are you popping up now? And to be able to have the right kind of, of representative say that, and that actually might be the director of the board. Number four, the local watchdogs. This source of opposition is fascinating to me. The local watchdogs are the kind of folks who say, hey, what do you have, uh, what, what are you against today, Greg? And Greg says, what do you got? You know, a couple of weeks ago, it was about the parks and there was a dog park. You know, a couple of weeks ago, it was about the schools. A couple of weeks before that, it was about some fence or somebody used like the wrong kind of concrete. You know, these guys, and I am mean, speaking in an ad hominem kind of way, sometimes it's those gals, 
But the watchdog, when they take a look at the library and they make it part of their campaign, <clears throat> you can't really answer it logically. You can't necessarily answer it to them uh, with, with uh, facts and figures or even mission, vision, and values, because their value system is that they're going to guard the community from its own self. What you need in many of these kinds of watchdog cases is a guard dog for the library. Because if they're crusade, or sorry, if they're anti-tax organizations, or even if they're crusaders in certain ways, um, you can you can you can you can have a conversation. But unfortunately, a lot of these watchdogs, you can't. You have to push back. And you have to push back in a way that guards, well, you know, what's a guard dog, okay? Guard dog is on your side of the fence. You know, when, when if you're on this side of the fence with a guard dog, the guard dog's all slobbery, you can pet its head. You know, they're, they're funny, you throw frisbees with a guard dog. Somebody comes over that fence at you, there's a problem. And so the guard dog has a, a, a moral authority, a moral compass. The guard dogs say the, the librarians are enacting our value system. Your value system and our value system is not in agreement, watchdog group. We're in agreement with the library. Who else is with us? This one is the most potentially hazardous, aside from coming right at, at local elected officials who are against you. And I'm not suggesting that you can do it casually. It needs training and support. But without a full voice, good people in your community are going to be like, well, Gary said that there's a problem with the library's budget. And I haven't been paying any blessed attention myself, but Gary's been right about the fence before. And Gary seemed to be right about the parks, or Gary just yells a lot. We have to answer it in a full voice ourselves. Oh, by the way, there's a whole group of people in any planning process for any millage that I want you to evaluate very early and work on engaging with throughout. And that is the local networkers or gossips. It is not the only way to, to forestall a watchdog event, but a lot of watchdogs are local gossips. And I'm using that word very purposefully. Uh, they will make stuff up in the absence of information. Uh, my biggest goal for early communications to forestall any watchdog problem uh, is to engage those folks that I know are going to be talking and give them 80% of something instead of 100% of whatever they made up. You know potentially who they are. I can name them in my hometown. Okay, 4A, watchdogs, 4A, 4B, crusaders. This is not materials challenges. That's the next one, it's 4B. 4A is somebody who wants to make a point and they're gonna take the library down in the process. It doesn't, I have no idea what that one is in your town, but they're going to go after you as a proxy for the fight that they lost before. This has to be addressed for what it is. And this, this sign is a real sign. It was from, it was somebody who, who, was, who was frustrated on the local vote yes committee in Winter Park, Florida, because there was all kinds of conspiracy theories in Winter Park about how they were going to, I don't know what they were going to do. There was a lawsuit after the election to try and nullify the election. That's how crazy it got in town. And yet the crusaders, they have to be answered in the, really in, in the court of public opinion, because directly they're not going to back down. And you have to tell a countervailing narrative. The banning folks and the audit folks are part of this watchdog crusader kind of envelope. They're only one version. I mean, you've already seen we got three others before this about other places for opposition. I got three more after this one. Four more. The thing about the book bans that we need to be, be talking about, the materials challenge bans, um, is that, um, again, the difference in the disconnect between normal ones and politicized and performative ones. But the, the core that I find most interesting academically prof and professionally here is that it's really the First Amendment that we are, that, that it's conflicted around bannings and audits and things like that. Um, the First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech but it also guarantees the right to petition your government. And you folks are the government. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about 14th Amendment violations here. I'm talking about First Amendment, where the, you folks are the government. And so your dignity in how you answer 
how you address, how you engage this um, is going to be the decision maker between whether, whether or not somebody coming after you is a problem on election day or not. Even with very performative ones. The fact that policy is your guide, um, you know, it's like uh, um, Jiminy Cricket, right? Radical, radical transparency and authentic engagement. There's no chance right now for you folks to let something pass over you, brush by you, get, get swept under the rug anymore. I know that there was a period there where, where it'd be like, well, if they didn't come back and fill out the form, they're going to come back on social media. We have to stand on mission, vision, and values because that's what's resonant with other people. Our mission, our vision, and our values, which includes about the First Amendment and both aspects of it. Not just freedom of access, but the fact that people can have a dialogue, assemble, and petition. This is our democracy at its finest, even though it's its most difficult. I got to tell you, though, folks, the First Amendment people are already with you. Don't take them for granted, but they're already with you, Okay. Your, your time is not a, a, a First Amendment campaign. Your, your time on this needs to be communications with the constituencies of the people those books represent, because it's a lot easier right now for some crusaders, some book banners, some wedge issue folks to go after the books than it is to go after people. And I said before about GLBTQ and communities of color, we need to have a bigger conversation about what our value system is in terms of access. And uh, you need to be prepared as well as boards. You need to be prepared for, for performative trouble. Because when people see in the news that the library has been disrupted, the, there's only a certain small number of them who want to stand up and rally for you. Most people are waiting for somebody to tell them what happened. How's it being addressed? How are we working this thing out? All right. When I said about external and internal, this is part of our internal reasons for trouble. This is part of our sources of opposition. Personal attacks, which is different than book banning, of course, and different than politi politicians coming after you. We have these problems sometimes around libraries where they're coming after the librarians, the library director, certain members of the board for personal reasons. It's a small town. There's a lot of legacy here. One of them that I remember that was the worst was in Northwest Ohio, where the library director, her husband was the only Democrat on the county commission. They couldn't get to him. So they went after her when the library millage was on the uh, terrible. We've had situations where the former director, the previous uh, uh, president of the, the Friends Group or the foundation, I mean, New Orleans, the guy who was running the foundation stole from the library and then we were on the ballot in, in, in May. The, 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 it took five years for that case to go through the courts. We were just on the ballot last December. People are still talking about it. Don't hide. The biggest advice that I have for you is to be honest and get out in front of it. And this isn't damage control. This isn't like uh, we're watching Scandal on ABC. This is like what's really happening here. The shame and the fear that I talked about before, about how, how if we're not prepared, part of your evaluation in going to the ballot, three years out, five years out, 18 months out, is where, where are we going to attract trouble? That's why I'm giving you eight reasons that libraries lose. One of the things that helps mitigate prior problems or even scandals is when you have a broader base of support from those other organizations that also care. Again, you can't just wave your, your hand and say it's a library problem or it's a library special interest group. What we always counsel is uh, the honorary co-chairs, for example, if you're like your yes committee in Northwest uh, uh, Ohio. Did I say Ohio before? I meant to say Ohio. Northwest Ohio, where there was that problem for that library director, our honorary co-chairs for that campaign were the former sheriff, the head of high school athletics, former head of high school athletics in that county, and the grand dame of the arts community in that the biggest town. And that was a weird group of co-chairs. You know, they're not related to each other. They represent a lot of different constituencies. And then you could say everybody wants this, and you don't have to worry about about the, the old stories. We're vouching for this library director. We're vouching for this library community. Also, we might have a tendency uh, to look at job titles 
as being the only uh, person who can do outreach or, or, or conversations because they have the right job title. 364 days of the year, that's true because that's why you hired that human. But uh, on a, when we're heading up to election day, that one weird day of the year, um, it might be about who's got the right networks rather than the proper job title. And sometimes you have to get out of your own way. All right, another reason that libraries lose, again, we have eight, it's number six. We had a couple corollaries in there. The difference between new town and old town, the fight between a town that's on the rise or maybe a town that's having some problems. When it's on the rise, um, there are oftentimes um, issues around development, the pace of development, the nature of inclusion, the goals of how are we changing that uh, the elected officials or the politicians haven't ever asked the voters if they like it or not. A lot of development happening in town. The library is the first thing on the ballot that people have to say something about. They haven't been addressed. They haven't been asked. Nobody's ever asked them. So the library millage becomes a referendum on everything else. There has to be a lot of work that is honest and transparent about distancing yourself potentially from that or, or not siloizing yourself, but finding the big tent that the library is in, inside of to say that, yeah, we have issues with the new shopping development, the new condominium complex, the new um, uh, um, uh, you know, agribusiness or, or industrial park that's going in. Library is immune from that only by immunizing itself with a wider coalition. Likewise, in towns that are having some trouble, there is a scarcity mindset that kicks in. There is a fight for scarce resources, and there's often a conflict between the old timers and those new people. Those new people, this is a race class problem, folks. This is my 6A here. This is a, a us versus them. It's pernicious, it's sad. And yet the library, as welcoming, as effective, as um, different than the rest of society, means that we might actually need to be doing some values-based marketing and some values-based convenings before we start talking about our, our millage election. Who do we want to be? Who else in your town, by the way, has the standing that you do to convene that conversation? It's not the politicians. Who do we want to be? How do we want to keep faith with yesterday? How do we want to be welcoming? Why are we having trouble being welcoming? All of those moral conversations do more for you on election day than you could possibly imagine because you can't paper it over with money even if you win. The invitation to it means you have to be willing to name it as a problem. Because again, your integrity, if there's failure happening, moral failure, our compass is not pointing in the right direction, you have to stand on your integrity. And it also might mean that, that you need to do some sincere healing before you can take it to the ballot. So it's not a referendum on, well, it's a referendum about our neighbors rather than those other people. All right. Number seven, and I got one more after this. So if you got somebody to type in the chat, want to keep one ear on what I'm saying, that's great. If you want to type in the chat. Number seven, internal opposition. I know more libraries that have failed because the staff doesn't like it. The board doesn't agree with it. Nobody's comfortable. We are sitting on either fear or shame. And the board members in the room today, if you're watching this on, on video, I used to be one of you. I like being a board member. It was one of the best things I ever did civically. But there were times where I didn't read the packet before, before the board meeting. I'm sorry. I apologize to the directors that we had at the Bourne Public Library when I showed up and I read the packet while we're doing the meeting. You know what happens then? If I get called on, I'm either afraid that I don't know the answer and I want to look like I know what I'm talking about, so I'm a bluster, or I'm, uh, I'm full of shame and I don't want to vote on it yet until the next. Like the paralysis that happens, the legal side of this too, folks, this is not a casual thing. You need a good lawyer. 
This is not a casual thing. You need a good financial advisor. Oh, you know, the, the, the county clerk told us it was going to cost this many mills. That's nice. What's it going to cost you in 20 years? The statement of economic feasibility and the legal briefings that you need to mitigate fear, to overcome that, that sense of, 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 of paralysis that comes from shame, you might even need to do something as radical as participatory budgeting. Why do we need to go out for new taxes right now? The staff is uncomfortable. Didn't we just waste a whole bunch of money doing X, Y, and Z? I mean, folks, this is this. what happens at the grocery store. Somebody on your staff, somebody on your board's like, I don't know about this one. The I don't know about this one campaign against the library, and I'm not sure. It doesn't seem, I don't know. I don't like it. I'm not going to say anything at work, but I'll talk about it on Wednesday night and Sunday morning and Friday. It comes not just with training at people, it comes with a participatory approach. Trainings don't do nothing. People sit through a training story right in the face. If they have to become complicit in finding the solutions that have money or new facilities attached to them, you'll be surprised at how it turns around. Or you'll be surprised at the fact that maybe you weren't right. And maybe we wait a little bit longer before we go to the ballot. All right, here's big number eight. This one only is for, for building initiatives. Primar well, it's primarily for building initiatives, but it's true. Number eight, nostalgia kills building projects like nobody's business. And if I'm opposed to a, a library building initiative, if I'm an elected official, I won't even, sometimes I'll be like, ah, oh, it's not the right time. But other times I'll be like, well, what's gonna happen to the old library? If I'm a watchdog, I'm like, what happens to the old library? I don't, want another, I don't want another empty building in our downtown. There's nothing left here anyways. The Crusaders are going to be like, well, that's just waste, fraud, and corruption. They're going to go build a Taj Mahal for themselves. We need the library where it is because I have a great deal of affection for the library. My neighborhood deserves this library, even though it's the worst library in North America. I love it. Some of those are tactical. Some of those kinds of oppositional moments are really just driven by the irrationality of the fact that you, and you, you folks reinforce this, by the way, in your messaging, you learned how to, the, the person learned how to read there. They taught their grandchildren how to read there. The library is the center of the community. How can we tear it down? How can we abandon it? There has to be a couple of factors that you're, that you're bringing into your communications play. One is what's the legitimate next use? Legitimate might be to tear it down, don't get me wrong, but what's the legitimate next use? And not just that we'll figure it out later. But sometimes it's really just an emotional conversation. I don't know how many of you are baseball fans. I mentioned my, my father-in-law, the umpire, who's also a bookkeeper, the data guy, watches all the sports. I'm not that, he and I don't hang out with it. His, his favorite year was 2005 when uh, the White Sox uh, won the World Series and his first grandchild was born in that order, okay? Like the Camden Yards story, I don't know if any of you know this one, but apparently there's old Camden Yards and new Camden Yards, baseball. Uh, old Camden Yards, last, last uh, game of the year, April or uh, in October, uh, win or lose, doesn't matter, generations of people, it was the last game for the old baseball stadium. So they're crying, they're hugging each other, last out, everything. And, and as, as people are celebrating that last moment in the old baseball stadium where they went there with their grandparents and their grandparents brought their grandchildren. It's lovely. The warning track doors open up in center field and this limousine comes on uh, on the field and, and, and drives down the third base side and comes around home plate and parks by home plate. And the whole place just gets really quiet. And these two dudes get out in tuxedos wearing the white gloves and they go over to home plate and they pick up home plate and they place it lovingly in the passenger seat, not the trunk, in the passenger seat. They get back in the, they drive up the first base side, out the warning track doors, the jumbotron comes on and it follows it all the way across to New Camden Yards where they drive to the warning track, they come out, they take home plate lovingly out of, out of the passenger seat, place it in New Camden Yards. The jumbotron says, play ball, New Camden, April 1st. And crying, I mean, I'm not even, a, I don't even, I get a little chill every time I tell that story because I'm wondering what your, what your home plate is in your library. 
like you have the opportunity to, to, to inoculate yourself against a problem. If you tell people that bathtub that the kid gets to sit in when they get their, their library card is going to be carrying, carried lovingly on a palanquin like a medieval saint and translated from one building to another. But we're planning on doing that. Let's talk about that celebration that we're going to have if this thing passes. And if we don't have that, then like, okay, we're going to spend six months before we close the library. Every family is going to get to make a little, little heart symbol and it'll be part of our narthex, you know? Most, th this is an emotional conversation and we've, we've made it so because that's our rhetoric about how libraries transform. All right. That was my eight reasons. If you have another one, I'd love to know what it is, but I'm terrified about it. I mean, I've been at this for a little while now, and I think I got it kind of covered. Claire, you've been at it too, though. What are you seeing? Well, we have a couple questions. I was wondering yeah. if maybe you could. Before yeah, yeah, yeah. We, um, so uh, we have uh, a couple questions. Um, one is, um, given the current political climate, is an August or November ballot preferable? <laughs> That is, a, that is a very specific place-based question. Um, I can tell you the answer based on the research that we've done. We have, a, we have a report on our Every Library Institute side, folks. You want to go to every, everylibraryinstitute.org, go up in the research tab. It is called Factors of Success. And the reason I didn't lead with it is because, unfortunately, the factors of success are unattainable. Um, I'm sorry, unknowable. Uh, we took a look at, at uh, several years of library election results and added in the IMLS PLS data about what the activities of the library were. We combine that with the uh, US census factors, uh, data, data points about like uh, race, ethnicity, gender, uh, or preponderance, no, race, ethnicity, educational attainment, uh, income, tax rate. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of external factors that drive your success or failure on, on, on election day. Um, Likewise, there's no statistical difference between uh, primaries, general elections, state and municipal off cycle. The only thing that, that, that you can control for about which election day is more statistically likely to be positive is if you can control your own ballot box on a special election. But otherwise, I got nothing. I would have led, we would have had one slide an hour and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So, the particular and peculiars though, if you're gonna do survey work or polling, a survey I always say uh, is something that you can do uh, from with library money, a poll is something you're gonna to need to do probably without library money, you know, a third party, because polling questions ask more about tolerance for taxes. Surveys uh, look at more about value system and is the value system being realized or not. Um, but um, the only thing I would look at is in a survey, it's cross tabs of likely voters and polling it's just targeting likely voters for that particular election. And then um, she's the same uh, person asked, do you recommend any specific approach to for a millage renewal as opposed to a new millage? Um, if it doesn't say new and it just says renew, then you're either looking to extend success um, or you're looking to replicate success. Um, and the, well, provided that, that you haven't had just a disastrous previous five years with a strategic plan, no offense, you know, uh, but generally speaking, it's an extend, it's, it's, it's an extend success or replicate success. Um, the um, re straight renewal um, in the last couple of years, even in very contentious elections across the United States have been renewing at, I mean, my goodness, the 2021 uh, just straight renewals was 94% of them. And nine out of 10 of them um, renewed. People are not looking for drama on election day. People are looking for stability, but they're also looking to understand very clearly what new money is gonna go do. And then um, he says, can we as the library directly recruit these partners? So the, the distance from election day drives a lot of your ability. Um, mm -hmm. The the five years, three years, 18 months out? Yes, um, because you're not actually advocating for anything. There's nothing on the ballot. Uh, the closer you get to election day and your behavior would start to be construed as being ballot advocacy, um, no. So we always like to, to, to go a little bit further out. Um, our advice, which is not legal advice, but our friendly advice is that you should always be able to talk about plan B as well as plan A though. In fact, you, you want to have your board officially adopt 
a plan B as well as a plan A. Doesn't necessarily have to be the same kind of level of detail, but uh, those things you can talk about as close to the ballot as you want, and then people can, can respond to that. Uh, but again, further away from the ballot, it's more about strategic planning at that point or facilities planning than it is for ballot planning too. Because there's a lot of other conversations to have besides that one fixed point election. Does um, the length of the millage, this is a new question, does the length of the millage affect the chances of approval? I have to say, I only have ANIC data about this. I don't have any actual data. Um, my ANIC data is that 15 years ago, you could do a, a, a perpetual. Now it's like 7, 10, 15 years um, is where people are comfortable. Um, we've seen some, some millages for non-library related in, initiatives around the country that were like 25 to 50 years that weren't about bonds. Bonds are different. Bonds are bonds. Okay. People understand that the mortgage is a mortgage, but, um, but operating, we've seen some for like parks departments around the country where they've tried to go out for 35 or 50 years. And people are like, that's my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Can we, so there, there's a reasonableness level. It should not be decided on by committee though. It needs to be decided on by the financial forecasting that you're doing and the feasibility of it. Um, but perpetual levies right now are fewer and farther between across the country, across different sectors of government. Okay, we have a couple questions here um, that are more about that line between, um, you know, in Michigan, uh, libraries are all government entities. Mm -hmm. I know some states, it's a little different. Um, and so this is kind of that question about that line about how close can a, like a staff person or library staff, you know, advocate or, mm -hmm. you know, for a millage. Mm -hmm. um, and so one is that question specifically about staff, you know, what mm -hmm. can staff do to encourage the public with a millage? Now, you know, in Michigan, when they're off the clock, they can do as an individual person a right. lot. But when they're on the clock, mm -hmm. now that becomes a very, and again, in Michigan, the law says that they can distribute factual information. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you wanted to, to say anything about that. Yeah. So we never skirt a line with any of our trainings. We never encourage people to run it right up against the line. It's not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, the difference between plan A and plan B needs to be described to the, to the community, to your voters. Plan A, what happens if it passes? Plan B, what happens if it fails? That's factual information. The mm -hmm. advocacy um, feelings that people have, if they want to be expressed, you know, like you said, Claire, there's, there's, no, there's no problem on personal time. Nobody's given up their mm -hmm. First Amendment mm -hmm. rights, mm -hmm. you know, by working at a library. Certainly nobody's given up their First Amendment rights by being on a library board, you know. No one should be compelled to participate in the campaign either. You know, I know you, I know that's the advice you would, you would always mm -hmm. give to anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, it's, it's having a robust, clear, um, mm -hmm. accurate plan A and plan B framework. Uh, it talks about outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have a set of expected and hoped for outcomes. We have a, a set of cautions that it would, would persist. I and mean, we're not going to the ballot just for fun. We've identified some shortfalls. So no, we don't, we don't do any line grazing, you know, there's no reason mm -hmm. to. Right, my, right. My, my friendly advice, and I don't know if I, if I always phrase this properly, but if you're ever feeling like, hmm, am I going too close? And you want to see it pass, pretend that you're advocating for it to fail. And then you've gone too far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good suggestion. Well, um, <laughs> well, I didn't mean that. Like, <laughs> I mean, it is a good suggestion. <laughs> um, now we have another question. Um, if we have someone who is willing to or has agreed to advocate for the library during a millage renewal or increase, would it be okay for them to go to a board meeting to discuss the advocacy? Um, I see no point in doing it at a board meeting. It's, I think it, 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 has, it doesn't pass the duck test. You know, it's, it starts to quack like a, like, like a yes committee. Then just do it at somebody's house afterwards and have a, mm -hmm. have a, have a drink while you're doing it, okay? Right. Like, there's no reason for it. Don't, right. make it. don't make it become the business of the board. Right. Yeah. Right. The board, the, the board should not be involved in the yes committee uh, except 
as if they time. right on their own yeah. time yeah. and they should definitely no board member should be like an officer on the yes yeah I, I agree with you on that claire i always ask i mean like first off it's kind of cheap like get some new people involved right please. if you can't right. six or more right. people who are going to run your campaign with you you're in right. trouble already right it just kind of again it skirts that line a little too too much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then this one says, can library friends groups help with marketing and or advertising? If they are comfortable and capable, yes. But a lot of folks signed up to do book sales and bake sales, and that's all you're going to get out of them. Right. And, you know? and I, I'm, not, I'm not being flipped. God bless right. them. You know? And, and they have to be careful themselves if they're, if they're a 501 3C. And in Michigan, there are both campaign um, laws dealing with nonprofit corporations, as well as um, there are um, uh, there's limits tax wise for if you're a nonprofit. So it depends okay. on on various factors. So the library friends groups are going to have to make sure that they are following their own rules for their organization yes. in in that endeavor as well. And I run into this around the country. I, I don't think I've, ha I've had this problem in Michigan. Congratulations, team. But if you have a situation where people think there's a friends group and they're just cutting checks to the library, then you don't have a friends group. You have a club. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that's a real problem too. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, I'd be happy to do some, some direct advising on the, on the C3 side of right. things. Um, but the, the structure of a campaign committee, a campaign yes committee, needs to exist in every community for the transparency around political uh, spending, even even if all you're doing is buying 50 yard signs. Right, right. You, know, and, you don't want to wash that through your C3. Right. And and I know that Shirley is going to discuss, yes, committees mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in hers as well. Um, but I also just want to make the point that friends groups, your friends group is separate from the library. Friends group is not part of the library. They're very mm -hmm. closely you know, they have a close relationship with the library, but they are not part of the library. They are, the board is not oversee the friends group, that they're a separate entity. That's right. Um, so that's important to remember. Um, does anybody, I see that we are at... Yeah. We're just about, I got, I, got, I, got, I got four more quick pieces of advice. Okay. okay. This, this is my coda here, folks. And if you got one or two more things at the end here, I'd be happy to entertain them. Um, ways to plan for success. This is my, my speed round with you. Number one, the thing about it all right now, and this, you're going to get the slides, you can read these later. It's not very, very, very uh, fast, but the funders in your community, whether they're policymakers, elected officials, voters, donors, philanthropy, want to see good money going after good right now, whether it's taxes or donor dollars or grants. Uh, they want to support projects that can be measured and justified. They are willing right now to put their, 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 their voter dollars their, their uh, grant-making dollars, their donor dollars to work to solve problems. Everything that we've seen. This is not a time for you to say, oh, it's rough out there. We should wait. This is a time actually to tell the truth about your mission and how it's funded. Your value system, what a budget should look like. And the, the hope that you have for the community either to extend your successes in supporting people in places or fixing failures out there. The Background, you know, radiation on this is that folks are under are able to understand when you map your agenda that needs funding to their vision, values, and mission, and it's much bigger than just literacy. It has to be in the 21st century. We've been saying it for years. We have to start talking about it in our lead up to these these millage campaigns. Interesting places to live. Your programming your collections, your thriving places to live. That's where literacy lives right now, folks. Thriving is inside literacy. Literacy is inside thriving. Health, community cohesion, all that kind of good stuff, like I said before. And the prosperity conversation, especially in some of your particular communities up there. How are we helping people find their first, best, or next job? How are we helping to people find their, their side gig? How are, they, how are we building a more prosperous community? And then the duplication issues that are out there, Right now, people look at government as, unfortunately, as waste, fraud, and corruption. And when they want to look at you as government, it turns into one of the reasons people lose. Finally, two more things. One is there's three survey questions. Pardon me. Three survey questions I'd ask you to, to start thinking about. Including them in your polls or your surveys. 
where does this particular request for the library lie on a continuum of priorities, not just about the library by itself? Putting like coming through COVID, what's your priority in life? Where are your deepest concerns? And how does the library fit on there? You don't have to be number one, two, or three in order to move something forward. You need to know where you're starting from. Number B, the polling question of all polling questions. What do your neighbors think about the library? Because they will lie to you when you are asking, what do you think about the library? They want to be nice people. And if you ask them instead, what do your neighbors think? Or in addition, you'll get some more truth out of them. It's amazing what happens when people are like, well, my neighbor Jim thinks the library is ineffective and he hasn't gone there since he was a kid. Or like everybody loves the library, let's go. And then C, asking a voter in particular or asking a resident or a decision maker specifically, how much does it matter if we don't do it? People will tell you all day long, it's a great idea. You guys are doing the Lord's work over there. And they ask them, well, what happens if we don't do it? They're like, ah. I want to see you get above 42%, which is the eh kind of factor. And we can talk about these very specifically in the way to phrase them. Um, you can reach out to me anytime. Finally, folks, it's time to make the argument. Last year, we only had 94 libraries around the country go out for, for renewals. We got like, there was like 17 or 16 libraries overall that went out for new money. If COVID has slowed you down, I'll forgive you. But if you're thinking that things are too rough out there politically, no, no. we've gone through the Great Recession. We've gone through the Nixon administration before. Come on. <laughs> so it's time to make the argument. And these are for your own reflection later, because the fifth one is about your own particular place. All right. Last call for questions, Claire. Hi, there are no new questions. Um, does anybody want to say anything? All right, team, here's my information. Um, we are, again, pro bono and for free. This is not a commercial for us. You're a cost center to me, and I love you, and I want to talk to you if you need the help, okay? And thank you so much. That was really good, really interesting. Absolutely. Team, thank you. And you know, really, just to encourage you, you know, on this, it sounds like a, a, an awful lot of work right now, but it's actually an awful lot of reflection about how much work you're going to have to do within this framework I shared, so... Okay, folks, be well, be in Thank touch. You. Cheers. Me too. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started this afternoon. Welcome to session three of our 2022 virtual millage series. We're glad that you could all join us this afternoon. I'm gonna turn it over to Claire. And she's going to take us away this afternoon. Thanks, Claire. Sure. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good, good afternoon. The weather's not too, too bad, a little gloomy. First day of spring, finally. Um, I'm going to introduce Anne Serink. Um, you all know Anne. Well, most of you know Anne, and we all love Anne. Um, so Anne is an attorney with Foster Swift Collins and Smith. Uh, she practices uh, primarily municipal law and library law. Um, she specializes in um, OMA and FOIA, as well as library law. Um, she's kind of like, she's my library law Yoda. <laughs> and probably most of us, most of you as well. Um, so I'm going to let Anne take it away. I'm going to display her her slides while she, while she finishes the introduction for you. Well, I appreciate that, Claire. Thank you so much. Um, I have been doing a lot of millages lately, so I know this is a topic of interest this year. Um, and so the goal of this session is really to, to establish what the legal issues are and what you have to think about from a legal position. And really what that is, it is two main things. One is making sure your ballot language is correct and accurate and that you have all the information that's required by law. And two, um, to talk a little bit about the Michigan Campaign Finance Act and what you can and can't do as far as marketing your campaign um, and using public money to do so. So the first part of the presentation, which Claire's putting up right now, um, um, is uh, drafting, drafting the millage proposal. So we can go on to the, the first slide. So anytime you talk about money, 
um, and what what you can do as far as how you can spend the money, what what money you can have. You have to look at your statutory authority to do so. Um, depending on what type of library you are, there's different rules that apply to you. So I'll go to the next slide, Claire. Um, section 13, for all of you that are district libraries, this is the um, this is the um, um, statute that's going to apply to you. Um, most district libraries, not all, but most district libraries have um, a district-wide tax. Um, and the Section 13 of the District Library Establishment Act specifically allows district libraries to levy a tax to support the operations and, um, of the district library. Um, it must not exceed four mills. This is actually a lot. Um, most libraries that I know of don't go close to this. There are a few that are up there, but this is a, a, a actually, actually a very high ceiling for district libraries, which is one reason, and I, and I pause, because it really has nothing to do with, um, with district, with millages per se. But for those of you um, that are libraries that are capped at a lower rate, this is one of the reasons um, libraries want to become a district library is that they can um, capture a higher level of their tax base with this four mills. Two mills can be in perpetuity and two mills must be not more than 20 years. So that's the, that's the, um, that's the, the issue with the district library. Um, if it's a district wide millage, the entire district must be loving the same um, millage. This is really important, as I mentioned here, if you are having a participating municipality that joins after your initial um, establishment. We have seen this before, um, where a municipality joins the district later and then the, the, the rollback starts at a different level. So be really careful of that. And I'll give you an example. If you are a district library and you have a one mill that you approved years ago, and now it's rolled back to 0.9. If a new entity joins your district, they have to vote in what you voted in, which is one mill, but make sure to, to levy the same amount um, for them as um, you would any other municipality within your district. Everybody has to be uniformly levied. So that's one thing. If you see something that's a little bit um, not quite right that way, reach out to your attorney and make sure that you have that right. Um, here, dis the district library board has the exclusive authority to determine when you go for your millage, how much you go for the millage, and in what amount. One of the frequently asked questions that I get is, if you are you required to have your participating municipalities approve your millage? And the answer is no. The district library board, whether you're appointed or elected, has exclusive authority to determine that. Um, you, you decide when and you submit that question to your voters. Next slide. I do want to point out that um, before we go on to PA 10 and PA 10A uh, libraries, um, that there is authority for participating municipalities in a district library to levy your own millage to support the district. That might be your case. For example, if you have a township and a city, the city and the township can each independently um, levy a millage to support the district library. That's permitted by the District Library Establishment Act. But again, that's a little bit different than they would have the authority to determine how much and what amount. Maybe it's required. Maybe there's something in your district library agreement that um, mandates what level they have, but from a pure statutory pers perspective, that is a little bit out of the hand. So if that's your situation and you have questions about that, I think um, certainly you can uh, approach your um, library attorney about that. So Section 10 and 10A PA 164 libraries. Um, you know, one thing Claire and I talk about a lot is to make sure that you understand what kind of library you are. And this is one of the prime reasons why you, it's very important to understand what type of library you are, because if you are a 10 or 10A 164 library, you have a lot more authority than you would if you were a section one or a, like a city charter library. So it's really important to understand what you, um, what you, what your formation is and, and what what, um, because it really becomes important for your funding mechanism because there's different choices that you have when you're PA 164, 10 or 10A. Um, originally to become a PA 164, 10 or 10A, you should have had 50 uh, voters of um, the village incorporate and present to the clerk or of, of the village or township or the city 
and whichever your specific municipality is, asking for a tax to be levied to establish the library. Um, so I want to pause here a minute because um, one of the frequently asked questions that I get, and I think it causes confusions even between township clerks and city clerks, is that there's a deadline for when your ballot proposal has to be into the county or into the township or city or whoever you have to submit the ballot proposal. For the August ballot this year, that is May 10th at four o'clock. The other deadline is about two weeks before that, and that's when a petition to submit a vote would be due. So if you are working with an entity um, that is not yet formed, a PA-164, 10 or 10A library that's not yet formed, and you want to form and go for a millage, just keep in mind that there's an additional earlier deadline that you have to have to submit that petition. But that really is, for most of you who are already established, that it's the May 10th or the ballot proposal deadline that you have to worry about. For 10A or 10 libraries under PA 164, you can have um, up to two mills for an unlimited duration or it can specify a number of years. So you can have millages in perpetuity. Um, as I mentioned before with district libraries, they can also have two mills in perpetuity. Um, I do want to say that this is a very unusual provision for libraries. It's, you don't see a lot of entities that have the ability to have perpetual millages. Um, most uh, townships, for example, are capped by 20 year limitations uh, under the Constitution. So because this is an 1877 statute and predated the constitutional provision that put that 20 year limitation on it, you can still levy a, a millage for, um, for an unlimited amount of years. What that means to you though, is that you can cap it at something over, the tw over 20 years. For example, um, you need to, um, you, you can have a 30 year millage. So it doesn't have to be you know, 20 years or unlimited, it can be anything in between. Um, I did wanna clarify something because I saw something in the chat about a petition for district libraries. Um, district libraries do not need a petition. This is only for PA 164 or um, 10 or 10A libraries. And the petition is only for the original establishment of the library as a 10 or 10A library. So there's very limited situations in which you would need a petition. If you're an already established district library, you don't need a petition. Um, if you are an already established PA 164 or 10 or 10A library, you also don't need a petition. All you need is a resolution from your board to set the millage rate and adopt the millage language. All right. Um, so when, if you are a section 10 or 10A, once that millage is um, approved and the voters approve it, the city, village, or township, again, whatever entity you are connected with, levies the millage and deposits it into that um, library fund. The other great part about being a 10 or 10A library is that once you are established, there's a section of that of PA 164 that says the library board determines when and how much to renew within that two mil limitation. And this is why that's important, is that you as a library board are in control of your millage. You tell the city or township or village that you pass a resolution, you submit it to them, and they have to put that on the ballot. Um, there's a I think that the law, and I've had lots of conversations with libraries over the years, PA 164 is, is an old law. It has a lot of things that aren't clear. One of the things that is not clear and that I, I would get some clarification on in your particular situation is whether the, um, I think there's authority that only the library board has to pass the resolution. Some of you may work with a city township or village that also basically passes a resolution and rubber stamps it because the, the millage language in this case will say, shall the city or shall the township or shall the li or village levy the millage um, for the library. So it, it, looks like a, it looks like a city millage. So sometimes these cities, townships or villages also wanna pass a resolution. That procedure is not well, I think, established in the um, in PA 164. I think there is precedent that only the library board has to do it. But this is one of those things that I don't like to wait until after the deadlines pass for you to, to work this out with your municipality. Claire, did you have anything? I don't want to put you on the spot. Did you have anything that other than that with that issue? Okay. 
All right, so we can move on then to the next thing. Um, so if you are a section one K-164 library, and this is a library that you will have, a, you're a city, it doesn't apply to um, um, townships. Townships have to have an elected board and under um, PA-164. Um, so we have um, one mill without a vote of the public. So this is something that's, I, it, this is, I told you that the unlimited um, perpetual millage was, was, was something that's very unusual. This is very unusual. A city library under section 1A can, can ask for up to one mill annually, has to be an annual decision every year by the city for the um, support of the library. And also you can ask for a second mill, um, a voted second mill. So there's many libraries that have this. Um, so the, the fallback, so this is a, a benefit because the city can decide every year that they want to levy one mill. It doesn't, it's not conditioned on the vote of the people. Uh, again, that's very unusual. The downside for that for the library is that the city gets to decide. So there's nothing you can do really as a library board if they don't want to levy the full mill or they decide that they want to cut back on the library's um, um, money and funding. That's really within the discretion of the city of the city. So that's that's important, to, like I said, for knowing what kind of library you are, you know what kind of bargaining power really you have with respect to how, how you levy your millage. Um, it, it, for, unfortunately for section one libraries, it's really not within the library board, it's the city council that does that. Most city councils and libraries work together and you, you know, the funding, they, you know, they see the value of having a properly funded city library. But we've seen some situations recently where the city wants to be, you know, to show that they're good with taxes and looking out for the tax rate. And sometimes what they do is they look at the, the library millage and decide that they want to tinker with that. So just be aware of that issue. I think there was something in the chat about, this is also applying to the townships as we have contract libraries. Oh, um, there's a question about contract areas. Um, so I, nothing I've talked about at this point has really covered that. What it, what it is, though, is that a township or city or other entity has the authority to levy a tax, voted tax, um, to support a public library. Um, so, the, um, so, for example, if you have a township that's a contract area, they can, they can levy a millage in support of your library. But again, that will be a township millage. If you want them to levy one mill and they only want to levy half a mill, that's, you know, that's within their discretion from a millage perspective. If they have a contract that says they have to levy one mill to support the contract, that's a different issue. But those will be township or city or munis other municipality levied millages and those won't be library millages. But I will, I do want to take, make a point of this when we get to um, a provision about what has to be in the language, because there will be an important language that has to be um, in these, this language um, that protects the library a little bit. And I'll get to that um, when we talk about what the content of the millage language is. All right, I think we can move on. County libraries. Um, County libraries have the authority to approve a millage. I put here what is in the statute. It's very vague. We're still kind of working. <laughs> I'm working with Claire to kind of figure out what the parameters are of that. So if you have a county millage, um, circle back with us um, and we can discuss that a little bit more. I don't want to take up too much time from everybody here, but there is authority for counties to levy millages in support of libraries. We have that here. Um, but, you know, talk to your library attorney about what the parameters of that are, if, you, if that's what you're thinking of doing. So I, I always throw this slide in here because especially, and libraries are so tax conscious. I know you're, you don't want to ask too much from voters. Um, you know, a lot, you know, you understand some, you know, that, you know, people are, you know, having some tough, rough times with the economy right now, and you don't want to ask for too much. So really consider other sources of revenue um, when you are, um, when you're thinking about what level of millage you want to levy. Um, the, the one thing I do pause and say, because I, I think when it comes to this, I think most, most 
and most people, most voters don't really understand penal fines and state aid. They don't really understand that. Um, what they do hear about is one, gifts and endowments and your private donations and capital campaigns. So if you just received a $2 million you know, bequest you know, and then go out for a millage, you might get questions on that. Why do you need this money when you just got $2 million? And there might be a variety of reasons, you know, maybe that the, um, the gift had a condition on it, that it was to be used for a building. Maybe you are going to build the building with the gift money and need additional funds to operate it. But that's one of the questions I think, if you have a huge fund balance, if you have a huge donation or gift, anything that's made the papers that people will read about, that's something I'd be prepared to, to, to have some talking points about when it comes to an issue we'll discuss, late, discuss later, which is sort of marketing your millage. Um, but other than that, you know, these are the obvious things in your income side of the equation in your budget that, to consider when you need to determine how much tax money you need. Well, um, other factors too, um, are voters in your area approving other millages? If your millages in your area are struggling or if your last millage struggled, you might decide to be conservative, for example, on how much you ask for versus if your millage is passed by leaps and bounds every time, it doesn't matter whether you, you know, go for one mill or 0.95, you know, you might have a little bit more flexibility. Um, do you anticipate Headley rollbacks? This is a little bit harder to, to anticipate, but you know, it depends on the property tax value in your area. But I do tell, tell libraries that have a lot of Headley rollbacks to really keep that in mind because that's really gonna affect one, the amount that you ask for and two, the duration, because it's gonna roll back every year. And you wanna make sure that the, you have, you're beginning with an amount that um, is going to satisfy you as far as your budget. And, and I say this because if you think one mill, for example, if you if you are in an area that has headley rollbacks or significant rollbacks and one mill is just getting by, you might want to consider asking for a little bit more so that when the rollbacks um, you know, start to factor in, they're supposed to basically even out the amount of money you actually raise every year, you know, because what they do, the headley rollbacks, for those that don't know, and, and this is a, the very simplistic terms, but um, if you um, have a, um, if you go for one mill, and let's say the one mill raises $500,000 for you. Um, next year, the rollbacks are supposed to work so that the next year, you're going to be raising about $500,000. Again, it's supposed to roll back a little bit. So maybe you, you only get point you know, 0.98 mil, but that 0.98 mil raises the 500,000. So it's really supposed to keep that, um, amount you get levied pretty steady and you can't get the advantage of maybe a big boom of taxable value. Um, so because of that, really think about how you want to handle that as far as what, you know, projecting out into the future, how that might affect you. Um, also, do you have long-term plans for the funds? There may be a situation where you ask for a millage for five years that may seem like a lot, but what you're doing is you're, is you're saving it in a fund, for example, maybe to build a new building. So again, those are the things um, to consider and be able to explain to voters um, of how you plan on using that, um, that fund or that money from the proposal. Um, how does a Headley override ballot measure work in this regard? I will get to that in a minute because that, that's we're going to talk about that when we get to the ballot language. So um, Shauna, if you just, if I haven't answered the question after we get through um, new or renewal of millages, um, remind me and I'll get back to you on that because that's a, that's a really good question. All right, we can move on, I think, to the... So Michigan law has very specific requirements for ballot language. If you look at ballot language, um, and I don't know if you... I am, I, I look at ballot language all the time because I draft them all the time. So I'm always looking for new and creative ways to do something in the ballot language. Um, and it has very specific requirements for ballot language. Uh, in 1999, they used they actually established um, Act 248 that that now has what has to be in ballot proposals. And I say this now because 
um, and it, every year it gets less and less that this will be, that this will happen. But if you're, if you've got a, like a perpetual millage ballot or a 30 year millage that you were using, you have to be really careful now not to repeat using that ballot language because it's likely not going to have the stuff that has to be in there. Um, so keep that in mind. Don't, I would never recommend just rehashing old ballot, uh, old ballot language because likely it's, it will have changed. It may even have changed if you did it like four years ago. There's ways I word things a little bit differently than I did even four years ago. Just, you know, having, um, had an experience and seen how ballot language is progressing and what seems to be the most effective way to do it. All right. So first of all, and you'll see each slide has an italicized um, information, italicized in a bold. That's what the statute says of what has to be in the ballot proposal. And one of them is the millage rate to be authorized. Um, this is um, expressed in mills. Um, a mill is one tenth of a cent. So one mill is one dollar per thousand dollars of taxable value. A half mill is fifty cents per thousand dollars of taxable value. Um, just as a, if it's one mill or less, you ask for a mill. If it's over a mill, the ballot language should use the plural of mills. But um, again, um, we often put in our ballot language too that we ask for an amount not to exceed this amount because it is possible. And we've had libraries do this where you have, if you ask for one mill and let's say you discover and and let's say you ask for one mill for operating because you plan on going out for a bond for a new building. And unfortunately, your bond doesn't pass. You might not need that full mill in that first year for operations. So you might levy something less than that. Now, I would find it very hard to believe that somebody would try to challenge you for levying less than your authorized amount, but you never know people these days, right? So you wanna make sure you have that ability that in the amount not to exceed, um, so you could actually levy less than what you anticipate you will need um, in any given year or what you're less than what you're authorized by law to do. Um, the estimated amount of revenue that will be collected in the first year that the millage is authorized and levied. This amount should also be expressed expressed in terms of taxable value. So every ballot proposal has to state in the first year of levy, this is the amount that we expect it to do. And this is a math problem, you know, take your taxable value of your district, if you're a district library or a city township and multiply it times the amount of millage that you expect to do. So a lot of you library, libraries are planners. I love it. Um, um, and many of you go for your millages prior to them actually expiring. Um, in, in any case, you know, sometimes what you have to do, it's just an estimated amount of revenue. So let's just say that your, your millage expired, uh, expires in 2022, but you want to know, or you, you're not going to love your first millage in 2023, but it's going to be on the ballot this year. What we do is we try to find a reasonable increase. Maybe it's a one and a half percent increase over what taxable value amounts we know in order to account for the fact that it's gonna be an additional year before you before you have that. So consider that if you only have 2021, a lot of you only have 2021 taxable value numbers right now because it's early and your, that your ballots are due May 10th and you might not have any more updated numbers. What we recommend is to give it maybe a, if, if you have an idea based on past history, that's better, but at least maybe bump it up a little bit. One and a half percent is what I seem to use um, just to anticipate if you're gonna levy it years down the road. So consider the first year in which it's um, authorized and levied. Um, using the duration of millage in years. Um, we recommend using the number of years and then providing the exact dates. Um, I, I really caution this. You have to be very careful because if you look at this millage, it says 20 years, but then you look, well, shouldn't that be 2022 to 2042? That's actually 21 years. Because if you levy it in 2022 and 2042, that's actually a 21 year levy. You can't count both of those. So that's why you have to be very careful the way you draft this. If you have an old millage, um, a millage that um, has been in effect for a long time, and actually every millage, if you, I, I recommend that libraries go back and double check this because we have seen this um, 
on more than one occasion where you actually think that your millage is up one year, but it's actually up another year. Um, we've seen mistakes on your L4029 or 20, yeah, for L4029. Did I get that right? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I, I've, I've seen a couple of mistakes where the, the taxing authority also thinks that your millage is a different duration than it actually is. So just be really careful about this when you have, when you're going for your millage, because you want to make sure that you give yourself time. You know, unfortunately, for example, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a district library that thought it was going a year ahead of time for its millage. And in fact, the millage had already expired. So they were able to get the millage on and everything was fine, but they didn't have the year cushion that they thought they had because of this. So I think one of the things I like to do is have, have you go do a little bit of a homework assignment to figure out what your, um, if you don't know what your actual dates are for your ballot, or if it's been a while since you looked at it, I go back and dig that out, um, especially if you're going to go for some sort of renewal or new millage. Um, I always ask to see the old ballot proposal just to verify that you got the correct dates. Um, so consider the year that the library uh, desires the initial levy. Um, so a library may be concerned about voter approval for a millage renewal. The library's last levy will occur in December of 2021. Um, again, this is an example of what the um, the millage should be 2022 and the last year is 2031. So really just be careful making sure that all these dates match up and you don't just cut and paste from the past ones. So the library must submit its millage amount to be levied to the county clerk. That certification, that's this L4029. For district libraries, you have to submit your own. If you're a city or township library, village library, you may be included on the city, village, or townships L4029. But I do want to caution this um, that you, if the statute allows you to um, still levy in December of that year with a little asterisk that I'm going to talk about before. Um, so if even if you've already submitted your millage proposal, your L4029 for the year, and you have a ballot proposal on the November ballot, typically you can still levy that. That is one of the questions I would always ask your municipalities, your district library, and ask your taxing jurisdictions. Um, the other thing um, can, is, is to make sure that you are actually able to levy their millage. And, and I say this because if you're a district library, and you have a city and a township as your district, um, um, in your district. There are times that cities are either by charter or otherwise, they only levy in the summer. So you have to make sure, for example, that you have sufficient time because you have to levy uniformly in your jurisdiction. If you're a district library, remember I we, we talked about how you have to levy uniformly in your district, in your um in your, um, within the district. So how this will affect you is, let's say that um, you decide to go for a millage this year in 2022, and you want it to be levied in 2022. Well, if you go for a November or August ballot, you can't levy in the city in 2022 if the city um, has only a summer levy. Your first year will have to be 2023 because the city can't levy um, the same amount of millage in 2022. So that's something to be very careful of if you are a district library. It might not be a big deal for you. Maybe you're a district that has, you've done millage after millage and you always levy in December and you know that you can levy then, that's fine. I just want to make sure that you, that's one of the questions that you ask your municipality so that you don't have a situation. Because sometimes what happens is you just can't, you end up losing out on a year of levy because you're not authorized to levy um, in the first year that you think you can. So that's something that we always ask, you know, make sure that you know what year or make sure to confirm, for example, that if you go on the August or November ballot and you want a levy in December, that you can do that. Um, clear statement for the purpose of the millage. And I say um, a question about brownfields and we are definitely gonna get to that because that's an interesting part about library millages that's different from other millages. Um, you have to have a clear statement of the purpose of the millage. Um, I put this attorney general opinion in here because I want um, you know anybody we talk to about millages to understand that it's actually a legal requirement. You could only spend your money for how it is worded in your millage. And that's why it's very careful. You have to be very careful about how you word the purpose of your millage. 
Um, most I have a what I have is sort of a standard language that I use if you want to use it for everything. So for district libraries, we say all district library purposes authorized by law. Um, for other types of libraries, we have we you know we talk about operating, you know, constructing, purchasing, equipping. These are the types of things that you want to make sure it's as broad as possible. Um, I I have. Um, a concern about using just operating because operating might be viewed by somebody as limited only to operations and not capital improvements. So if I, I unless there's a reason that you want to stick just with operating, I really recommend that you make it broader than that. Um, also, um, if you are, is there if there's any possibility for example, that you are a township, city, or village library, either under PA 164 or you have the voted millage um, as a section one library. If there's any possibility that you will go and form a district library, you also should be very careful not to limit the purpose of the millage as to only the money only going to this specific library. So I'll give you an example. Let's say your millage language says your city and let's say sell shall the city levy the millage um, for operating equipping and funding the you know new town city library and you want to you want to go for a district the district library establishment act says that any you can use existing millages until they expire unless the ballot language prohibits it now i think we can make an argument that you know, the intent was to have it for library purposes. Um, but what we usually do is we usually add a, a, a provision after there that says for the Newtown um, City Library and any other library purpose authorized by law. If you put that catch all type of phrase in there, then you, you're not going to have to worry about that being excluded. But again, I, I want to I do want to point this out so that it's very um, it's very deliberate. You can go to the next slide. I think I have some examples. So example of a common problem, we want to use money to operate a new building, but our ballot language only provides money for the construction. We want to use the money but to, op to operate a new building, but our ballot language only provides the money for the construction of the new library. Can we use the money for the operations? Well, use of money for the operations may be subject to challenge if you specifically said it would be used only for construction of the library. Um, the excess funds, what the law says is that if you have a millage, let's say you have a millage for construction and the millage raised 800,000 and the construction was only 700,000 and you have 100,000 um, left over, um, the law says you have to keep those funds in escrow until you can find a purpose that's permitted under the act. So either you don't collect them, you refund them, or you have to keep them in escrow until you actually can spend them for the purposes of the ballot proposal. Um, so a fix is to anticipate the other uses, and I already mentioned this um, before, but you know, for the purposes of this example, if the library is to build a new branch and the millage is levied to allow the new branch to become fully functional, the library may want to request a millage for constructing, equipping, and operating the building. And there might be reasons why you really want to focus this. You might want the voters to understand this money is going to go to a new building. And, but there's ways that you can, I think, work with the language to, to carry that point across without losing the flexibility to use it. You know, you can say for, you know, for construction of the building and for operating and, you know, all they're necessary for that new building, for example. So the focus can still be on the new building without being limited. If you go to the next slide. So two years, another common problem. Two years ago, the voters approved a millage for 10 years to operate the John Doe branch of the Newtown District Library. Now we are considering closing the branch. Can we use the millage funds for other library purposes? Again, um, the library um, may be subject to challenge if that money is used for other purposes other than the John Doe branch. Because if this is the stated purpose that you're going to use it for that branch, and you might have had a calculated political reasons why you did that, it will um, present the possibility that you could be subject to challenge if you then use it for other other purposes. Again, a fix would be to make the language more general to, you know, operate any branch of the Newtown District Library. You could even say including but not limited to the John Doe branch if you really wanted to stress that branch. Again, there's ways you can do that without making it 
completely limited or off limits to use it for other reasons. So we asked voters for an, operate, uh, for an operating millage last year, but the millage is not going to be enough. We have to reduce the hours the library is open. Can we ask for an additional millage to increase the hours of operation? So that this in this example is, you, you already went out for a millage. You just ask voters for something more general. And now you want, you are intentionally wanting to ask for something more specific. That's okay. As long as, again, it's, it's within your authorized amount, but the money can be only used to add those additional hours. Um, so again, if you want to make it more narrow to serve a, a political purpose or to have um, a specific activity or function, um, um, you know, to have that be intentional, then um, certainly that's something that you can do. You just have to understand what the consequences of that are. Let me see in the chat, I think. Um, let's see, does the inclusive language ever cause voters to be suspicious, too broad? That's a really interesting question. Um, I, I don't, I have not seen that. I have not seen that yet. Um, I think the ones that seem to do uh, a little bit that I hear about are the ones that are very limited in what they are because the voters, but if you, if you go into the ballot box and you see library millage proposal and you see for all library purposes, I don't know. That's a really good question. I have not heard that yet. Does anyone, I guess I'll open it up. Does anyone had an experience as a library putting on a broad proposal that people thought it was too broad? I don't see any, I don't see any hands. That's a really interesting question. If, if I hear of anything, I'll funnel it back through, through Claire, but so far I haven't heard of anything, but that's, that's really interesting. All right. Oh, a clear statement indicating whether the proposed millage is a renewal of a previously authorized millage or the authorization of a new additional millage. So I want to pause here because there's, two ways you have to, well, three ways, really, you have to label a millage proposal. One is called a renewal. Two is new additional millage. Or three, you can have something that's a renewal and new additional millage under some circumstances, okay? But to call it a renewal, it must be a true renewal of the millage as last, last levied. By way of example, if the voters authorized a millage, a one mil millage years ago, but it's re reduced to 0.87 mils, the renewal must be a renewal of 0.87. If you want to restore it to the full mill, you must ask for new millage of 0.13. And I want to pause here for a minute because one of my areas of frustration is, and I get this a lot from libraries, is to say, well, I know you say that. But our township or our village or our local other municipality doesn't do this. They just ask for the whole one mill as a renewal. Um, I, to that, I say they're, they're, I think they would be subject to challenge if somebody had knew about the rule and was inclined to, to have litigation over it. I, I just don't think that that, I just can't recommend that for my clients. So I'm very um, comfortable stating that this is the way that this is the way we've read it for a while and then um it's been a while now it's been a while now I keep thinking of it as a new AG opinion but it's probably 10 years old now at least the, the AG then came out and confirmed that this is the way that to read the opinion now AG opinions are not binding upon um you know anyone other than the person that asked the AG opinion but they're very persuasive and I think that I believe that 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 the AG opinion got it right as far as the way that they interpreted the statute so this is the way we recommend um, that the library, be, the millages be treated. All right, you want to, next slide. So any millage that is not a renewal is a new millage. And I, someone asked a question about Headley override. So a Headley override um, is a is just a type of a new millage. So when and in the last example the 0.13 mils would be considered a Headley override. What it is, is it's the amount of new millage that you have to ask to get back to the original authorized amount. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I think we discuss how we kind of handle this. Nope. 
So I'm just going to tell you how we handle it. Um, so what we would do would, would be, for example, um, if you want a, um, a true, and I think we might discuss this in other slides, but I'll just tell you now and we can skip over it pretty quick, quickly later. But if you want to get back to that one mil level, what we do is we'll say, you know, shall the library levy an amount not to exceed one mil, of which 0.87 is a renewal of a previously authorized millage that expires in, and then we give the date, and the 0.13 is new additional millage. And sometimes, depending on the client, we might say, you know, to, um, you know, we might mention that it's to, um, you know, get you to the original amount lost due to headley rollbacks. That's going to be something that you, it's a matter of taste how you do that, whether you mention Headley or not. I always try to think of whether, whether the average voter is going to understand what that means. Um, and so some libraries are very adamant about wanting to include the Headley in there. Some of them don't, but that's a matter of taste and that's how we handle it. All right, Claire, we can go on to the next one now. So the, low, the ballot shall fully disclose each local unit of government to which the revenue from that millage will be dispersed. Um, a local unit of government means city, village, township, school district, intermediate, uh, school, intermediate school district, community college, public library, or local authority created under the state. So this is where the, the most recent change has been, and I think it's just been absolutely fabulous for libraries for two reasons, okay? One is that, um, your live your millages prior to January 1, 2017 would would have been subject to automatically to any existing DDAs, LDFAs, um, CIAs, um, and a few other authorities, unless you had originally opted out. Okay. So what that would have meant from you from a ballot perspective is not only you're getting your money captured, but you have to inform voters on the you have to inform, and here's the list of the um, the ones that cannot capture anymore, and I'll get to that in a second, but you not only, sort of like an ad, insult to injury, because not only is your money being taken away, but you have to tell voters that your money is being taken away. Um, and I will tell you, um, I thought it was a very good question before about, you know, what are the voters going to think about the broad language? Would they be suspicious? I will tell you that this, that having to disclose that you were being captured by the DDA and the LDFA had caused a lot of problems with a lot of municipalities. And I'll tell you why it happened. For example, if you are a district library that has a township and a city, the township folks would often say, well, I don't want my money going to the city's DDA. I think DDAs, I think the average voter doesn't really understand that it wouldn't be their money. There's a district that only captures from that district, but that's sort of beside the point. It's a very complicated thing to explain to voters in the context of a ballot campaign. So one thing that was great is that after the, the, um, the um, MLA, I think a lot of library folks, a lot of people were involved in this. It was a great accomplishment, got libraries exempted from DDAs um, in, a couple, in a couple cases. One, millages that are in effect prior to January 1, 2017 could be, um, you can have those millages not captured if you, the DDA expands their boundaries or expands their duration. But any millages, including renewals that are approved after January 1, 2017 are automatically exempt from disclosure or exempt from, ex exempt from capture. Sorry, I was doing FOIA stuff before this. <laughs> my my uh, worlds were bleeding together there. So anyway, ex exempt from capture. So what this means to you is that your new millages, so anything that you, even if it's a renewal, you are not going to be subject to capture. I do want to pause here on an unrelated note to say that do not expect that your cities, township, villages are going to understand that or know this. So you're going to have to reach out for them and explain to them this. And then do not assume that they're going to give up graciously on this. We've actually been having quite a few fights with local DDAs over this very issue. So it's something to get out right in front that you are not... Um, it might come up when you submit the ballot language and they say, well, you know, our township millages, we have to say that the DDA captures, how come this millage doesn't have that in there? And then that's an opportunity to explain. But I would send something, if your millage passes in August, 
send something to your uh, taxing entities in um, right after it passes saying, hey, heads up, you can't capture this millage anymore. But what this means for you, for these, um, these entities here, okay, and um, I, I do want to talk about brownfields separately, but for these entities here, you no longer have to provide on your ballot language that they will capture your millage, unless the caveat to all this is that you can agree to allow the DDA, for example, to still capture. You might have a library that's in the DDA district, and the DDA might spend tons of money beautifying the street in front of your um, library. So your library board might decide that you um, want to capture that you might that you want to capture um or you want to still allow them to capture your your money it might they might be giving you more than the capture is for example in that case your library board and that dda and the whatever entity will enter into an agreement to allow them to still capture what this means for you in the millages is that then if that is the case if you are going to enter into that agreement or likely going to enter into an agreement you really do have to disclose that the dda will will still capture you so that's one of the things to consider i think these seem like totally, you know, might be totally unrelated issues, your millage and the DDA capture, but because of this requirement to disclose, um, you will really kind of have to think about, you know, during the duration of your millage, what's the likelihood that you're going to allow them to capture it? If it's nothing, then, you know, you don't have to put it on. If you're, if you're going to enter into a contract with them, I would err on the side of putting it on there. Um, you know, I just switch to the next slide. Um, Kim had a question about debt payment. Kim, can we wait till the end of the question and answer section and I'll get to this question because it's a good one? Okay, I'll just remind me if, if I haven't, um, if I haven't, um, again, if I, if I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, so the exceptions are, the, the one thing that um, they were not able to get an exemption for brownfields. So one of the questions that will be asked or should be asked of you when you're drafting a ballot proposal, are there any brownfields that capture the millage? They can be county brownfields, they can be local brownfields. So you will still have to disclose if a brownfield is going to capture your millages. Um, so the other thing I want to, um, to talk about is, um, if you go to the next slide, Claire, I don't think it's on here yet. I'm sure that voters know. So yeah. Um, also, if you if you go back, and I won't make Claire go back several slides, but if you go back, we we talk about this disclosure. Um, we talk about this disclosure for it mostly comes up with DDAs, brownfields, all of that. But it, if you actually um, give part of your millage by contract to another library, let's say that you're through your district library agreement, you're required to give a percentage of your millage to another library, that should also be disclosed on that because it's any other public entity. Um, and an interesting question is, and it, it, I, don't, I haven't found a really good library example. Um, and so if you have one that you would like to share, I would love to hear it. But um, I do also township and other millages. And um, if you are, let, let's say you're asking for an ambulance millage and you, ha and you have two contracts, your township has two client contracts, one with an ambulance authority, a public entity, and the other with a private ambulance company. And let's say half the millage goes to the public authority and half goes to a private company to have, provide ambulance service. You actually only have to disclose the public one because the statute says it's only the public entities that you have to disclose. So it doesn't require you to list every contract you have and how you use all your millage money. But if you give it to another public entity um, that, um, you know, I, we recommend that you, you disclose it in that way. Again, voter education is, is gonna be very important if you have, um, uh, Brownfield, the, the, those are the, a lot of the questions to come about from that. Um, would that be a question for the clerk? We are a county library. Usually, if you're asking for about information about captures, usually the treasurer or county equalization should have that information. So if you, it depends on what type of library you are. If you're a city library, the city, some city clerk or the city treasurer should have that or someone in the finance department 
um, county libraries, um, um, yeah, um, those are the same things. Yeah, Van Buren has agreements with other two libraries to share millage revenue with them. Thanks, uh, let's see. Yeah, so it, you know, it depends a lot. This is one of those things too, like I wouldn't get nervous if your millage language doesn't have that in there because that's not something that I think is really been on the radar, but it's just one of those good things to put in there if you if you share. Now, if you have the type of contracts I would talk to your lawyer about because I think they really only apply to people who you actually share a portion of the revenue with, not necessarily people you contract with. So um, I wanna be clear on that. If you have a contract you're concerned about, I would talk with your lawyer um, when you're doing your ballot proposal about whether it's in your best interest to disclose it or not. Let's see, I'm sorry, my chat's in the middle of my <laughs> Oh, do we need one or two questions? Um, a taxing unit that levies a millage shall not submit a single question to the electors of a taxing unit requesting both a renewal of authorized millage and the authorization of new additional millage if the new additional millage is greater than 0.5 mil. And I'll go to the next slide so it provides some illustrations about that issue. Okay, so um, renewal of a millage. Our library previously approved 1.5 mils for 20 years. The millage expires this year. The library currently levies 0.97 mil due to the Headley Amendment. If we want to ask for the restoration of 1.5 mils, do we need one or two questions? And the answer is that you would need two questions if you want to characterize the 0.97 as a renewal. You'd have to ask for 0.97 in one question and then the new millage of 0.53 in a separate question. So and, and this example, if you want to characterize a 0.97 as a renewal, then you have to have it in two questions. Okay, the next one. The library desires to ask voters for a renewal of a previously authorized millage and ask for the amount lost to Headley Amendment. And so our library needs a renewal of a previously authorized millage and has expiring millage um, that was one mil when voted, but now has been reduced to 0.9. You can ask for the 0.9 and the 0.1 mil um, of new millage in one question because obviously the 0.1 is less than 0.5 mil. All right, you wanna move on to the next one? Um, I, I do want to stop a minute because this happens once or twice um, a year when we do, we have a lot of millages. So what are your options in that case? One is you can, let's just say you don't want to ask for, and that I'll give you the 0.97 example. Um, if you don't want to ask, let's say what you would do if you want to ask for one question is you'd limit the new millage to 0.5 instead of the 0.53. So you'd ask for the 0.97 plus an additional 0.5 of new millage, and you can do that in one question. Again, you, as long as it's 0.5 or less. So you're not getting back to the 1.5, you're going to ask, be asking for 1.47 mil, but it's, if you wanna ask for it in one question. The other way to do it, if you wanna ask for the full 1.5 mils, but you don't wanna ask it in two questions, you can ask for the whole 1.5 mil as new millage. You don't have to characterize it as a renewal. You can tell them it's all new millage. That's typically not ideal. Most libraries want to characterize at least portion of it as a renewal, but it is an option and, then, and it might be the best option for you to avoid having two questions. Um, so millages, a library must adopt a resolution to place the millage question on a ballot. So it has to be a resolution. I would have that resolution um, drafted in advance so that it has everything in there that you need. And you can only have two millage elections um, within one calendar year. Um, again, talking with your cities and villages, you wanna make sure that the election date will work for when you um, want to levy the millage. Also, um, if you're a township, I'll give you an example where this may be a problem. Let's say you're a township. And right now there's really only three election dates um, that you can go, there's the August and there's the November, and then there's, you know, the, the May election typically. Um, well, if, if let's just say the township already put a proposal on in May and you put a library proposal on, which is also a township millage in, um, August that you may be prohibited from doing a millage proposal in, um, in November. That's one thing to, if you lose in August, I would work with your township to make sure that you 
have all that worked out to make sure that you don't have any problems that way. District library is a little bit easier because you're your own millage authority. So you could pick the two millages that you want. If you lose in August, you can go back in November. Um, for those that, that are thinking about that, for having those of you that have the August um, elections and you're concerned that you might lose, it's a very short window. Um, it's an August 2nd ballot. And I don't, I don't have, Claire, do you have the exact date of the November um, ballot? deadline but it's it's it would be within the it would be within two weeks to 10 days um after that election so it would be in the first part of august so the turnaround time is very um very short so if you have a significant belief that there, your your millage could be tight um i would plan on at least in your mind having an uh, an idea of when you would have a special meeting or in you know, and what we you would do differently if you wanted to go right away in november again because there's nothing that would legally prohibit you from doing so all right, moving on to the, okay. Local ballot proposals must be certified 70 days before the election. Um, there's some dates in the District Library Act that are 60 days. So if you meet the 70 days, you're gonna meet the 60 days. So um, I definitely, um, and I love this because when we when I started, I actually had to sit down with a calendar and um, go back and do all the calculations. And now the state of Michigan has a wonderful um, ballot um, and election deadline booklet that they put out. Um, I did mention before that sometimes your county clerk or your local clerk will mistake that petition deadline, which is really two weeks earlier than the ballot deadline, as your deadline. So if you are going, if you are going for a um, an August ballot, I'd confirm with your county clerk or your local township, whoever you submit your ballot language to, that they also agree that it's May 10th. Um, you, you don't want to get into an argument with your with your clerk or whoever's accepting the ballot proposal after a deadline's been um, deadlines passed. So that's one thing I always re recommend to verify your deadlines to make sure that you're both on the same page. Um, the actual language should be approved by the library board. Um, there is a provision in the district library act and i do want to say the actual language because what i what i get a lot is um i and i don't i don't get this so much from libraries but other municipalities they'll they'll call me and they'll say okay well our our board voted last night to ask for you know one mill for 10 years can you draft up the ballot proposal and we will send it on to the county clerk I, I, I cannot recommend that. I, I like you, the board should have the actual language of the millage in front of you when you when you do that so that you have that you know exactly what you're looking at um, when you approve that and not just approve the concept, so to speak. Um, for district libraries, um, one of the things that you should consider that if you're a district library is that technically when they amended the district library establishment Act years ago, they they have provisions for a school district election coordinator. And there's a technical requirement um, under um, the District Library Establishment Act, if you have a school district that's a participating municipality to submit the resolution to the school district election coordinator. As a matter of practice, my understanding is that most school district election coordinators have delegated that authority to the county clerk. So it really, what I understand is that most of the time that you're just dealing with the county clerk, but um, we recommend that you submit it to the school district election coordinator just as a um, check the box thing to make sure that everything's the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So um, again, you know, we don't want to get in a situation where you didn't, you submit it to the county clerk, but not to the election coordinator. And then someone raises that as an issue. Haven't seen it yet. But again, our whole, our whole, the purpose of this and everything we do is to avoid that issue. Um, Michigan can't, we're going to switch gears uh, um, from ballot language, and I think um, we're going to have plenty of time for questions after this, so we can, if you have questions, we can certainly open up for questions, but um, I did want to spend some time talking about marketing your millage. Um, the Michigan campaign finance laws apply to library millage elections. So what this means is that um, the and I'll get into a little bit what the finance act says, but it it's one of those things where you have to be really careful. I recommend seeking attorney review of your millage materials. Often we get, and it's it's kind of hard because a lot, a lot of libraries are very sophisticated and they will hire a consultant to put together their millage materials. 
the consultant is a marketer. So they're going to want to, they're going to want to do things that have the, the millage pass, right? But some of the things that are in the marketing materials that I see might have problems under the Campaign Finance Act. Um, now, we rarely see campaign finance accusations against libraries, but I have seen them. So they're not without, it's not without risk here. Um, before we get into um, the ins and outs of the Campaign Finance Act, I do want to stop and talk about patron lists because you cannot give your patron list out to anybody other than the library. So if you are, if you are, if you're the library and you're putting out your own material that's in compliance with the Campaign Finance Act, you can use your patron list to send out that material that's in compliance with the Campaign Finance Act. What you cannot do is give your patron list to the ballot question committee or the friends of the library if they're helping you to conduct millage functions. So it, that's an internal use only document and, and, and by internal, I mean only library. Um, so you have to be careful how you um, use your media rooms and spend your money. And I'll go to the next slide and we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. So section 57 of the Michigan Campaign Finance Act prohibits using public funds for local ballot measures, but it allows for the, that's to promote local ballot measures, but allows for the production or dissemination of factual information concerning issues relevant to the function of the public body. Um, it must be factional, not promotional, persuasive, or aspirational. And a violation of the Campaign Finance Act is actually a misdemeanor, so you want to be very careful of that. I, I don't know anyone sitting in jail now for sending out a library brochure. So I, I mean that I'm I'm pretty sure, but that what will happen likely is that the Michigan Bureau of Elections will contact you after they get a complaint uh, on that. And then you'll have to respond to the complaint. And so oftentimes there's a fine. That's usually what, what we see happen. So I, I put that in there just so that you, you know, aware that that's a possibility. But again, I don't think people are locking people up for, you know, per, you know talking about how great their library is. But with that said, we really want you to make sure you're in compliance. So what do you mean by promotional, um, factual, or um, aspirational? So I'll give you an example. Um, anything that's backed by statistics is going to be okay in my mind, for the most part. So if you want to say our circulation is X or our budget increased by X amount this year over last year, those are the kinds of things that you can say. The ballot language itself, always appropriate. How much an average um, um, voter or the average household would pay, also always appropriate. Um, anything that the library board has approved. So be very careful about this. So I'll give you two, an example of how this could, can, could maybe work and how it would be a problematic, okay? One thing to say is if, if our millage doesn't pass, we're gonna to have to cut our hours. Now, I would say that's problematic under most circumstances. That where it might not be problematic is that, that if your board has made a motion to cut the hours to this amount if the millage doesn't pass, if there's been actual concrete action that you can point to um, by the board doing, again, I, I'd be very careful of that because you wanna make sure that it still remains factual. Um, you know, so those things seem like promotional. Like if you don't, if you don't um, approve the millage, our library will close. Well, maybe that's a possibility, but it's it's going to be more viewed more persuasive than factual. So you have to be very careful about that. Um, I I saw one library did um, had some material that was like, you know, our our staff is you know we have the greatest staff. Okay. And this is the hardest one for me because I don't want to tell you you don't have the greatest staff because I'm sure you have a great staff, but that's opinion and not fact. Now, if you were awarded the Library of Michigan's Greatest Staff of the Year Award for 2021, you can put in there that you were awarded the greatest staff, of, you know, you can put that's factual versus opinion or aspirational. So um, those are the types of things you, you have to be very careful about. That is, and I want to stress again, if you are um, working with public 
money. So if you're using the library funds, it does not matter whether it's tax money or donated money or other type of money. Once it hits the coffers of the library, it's going to be public funds. So that's a question we get a lot. Somebody wants to donate $500 for our campaign. Can we now do a promotional material outside? No, that's still going to be public money under the Michigan Campaign Finance Act. So what can you do? I've talked a lot about what you can't do, what you can't do. So we am going to talk a little bit more about what you can't do, but I want to talk about what you can do. So um, public body employees without public uh, policymaking authorities are prohibited from expressing views on behalf of the public body. Um, and you are also um, prohibited from expressing your own personal views during work hours, okay? So you have to be really careful, and I want to make this point, is that when you're on the clock, you have to be very careful, okay? So um, if, you, if you are, let's just say I'm a library employee and I, and I want to volunteer to help pass out literature from the ballot question committee, I can do that on my own time. Um, salaried or salaried um, employees, it's a little bit harder um, because um, you want to make sure that, um, I, I just, did, what, when are you scheduled to work? You know, if you're salaried, you're sort of like, you know, you don't necessarily have, you know, definite like clock in, clock out, but you have scheduled work time. So you can do it on your own unscheduled work time. Um, you can't use any of the public body's materials um, to promote the election while on the clock. So um, um, you have to really be careful about that, too. And one of the one of the, the a really common thing, frankly, and just be very careful before this happens um, and oh, and Kathy just asked a really good question I was going to bring up too, so I'll get to that in a second. But one of the things that kind of makes me a little bit squeamish is when I'll have a director call me um, and ask me a ballot question committee question. Now, if you're a director and you call me about promoting the library's, um, you know, material that the library can do, that's fine. If you call me and ask me about millage's millage language, that's fine. But if you call me like in your capacity as the liaison for the ballot question committee. Then you're spending lawyers fees, which are public funds and your own salary for the ballot question committee. So be very careful of that before, before you make the call. Usually I'll say something that's kind of awkward, but, I'll, you know, I, I will want to make sure that you understand. You know, we, we can talk about generally what you can and can't do. And if I'm explaining to you what you can't do, that's fine. But if you're a volunteering for the ballot question committee and you're also a library director, be very careful that you wear two hats and you'll have to, you know, uh, wear one hat at, at a time, so to speak. Um, one of the, Kathy asked a really good question. I wanted to talk about this. Yeah, yes, you can, there's no legal prohibition for you for putting materials about the ballot if it's, if, it, if they're in compliance with the Michigan Campaign Finance Act, okay? You can put those at the library. The ones that are from the ballot question committee, I would make sure that you treat the same way that you would treat any other um, if you don't allow pamphlets and stuff in your library, then you can't have the ballot question committee material there. But if you have a rack of brochures, you can put the ballot question committee if you treat it like everybody else. But the additional problem is, and where I have a concern, is that if you have, let's say you have a, let's just say you have a rack of flyers. Um, and you say anyone can leave a flyer under specific parameters, et cetera, under your bulletin board policy or whatever. And you have the ballot question committee's flyer there. And it's at the circulation desk. And someone asks a question about the millage to your staff member about that using that brochure, then your staff member might be put in a position where they're a public, you know, entity or public employee uh, on the clock using public funds now promoting the ballot, you know, campaign. So you just, I just that that's a little bit. Um, I think that can be a little bit awkward, um, and so that's why I just caution when you do something like that, just to be very careful about that, you know one of the things we get asked a lot like bookmarks can you put you know you know election august 2nd in there and give them out of bookmarks well if if doing that you know maybe informing informing library patrons that there's an election on august 2nd isn't is factual there is election on august 2nd but then it leads to the question that you know you might have staff then encountering these questions on times that might be viewed as more promotional so just be really i think i'd be really careful about that um, same with buttons and things like that. Um, so because public bodies are prohibited from using public funds to promote millage campaigns, any lawn signs, brochures, or buttons telling people to vote yes or vote for the library may not be purchased um, 
with um, uh, with public funds. Yeah, I mean that you can't you can't do it. Can't say oh yes. Can't say support our library. The, all those things are going to be viewed as promotional. I'm glad Claire is agreeing with me with her head nods because I, I I never like it when I think Claire doesn't agree with me on something. So anyway, Cla so Claire, I think we're on the same page with that. Um, again, I've already mentioned this before, but public funds are not limited to tax revenue. Donations may also be included. Let's see. Next slide. Um, oh, meeting rooms and facilities, and this goes for copiers and anything else. So uh, use of a public facility by a committee promoting election may be permitted if any other candidate or committee has equal opportunity to use the public facility. So, for example, you can allow a ballot question committee to meet in your meeting room. If you allow, if, if there, you don't have to go out and seek a vote no committee to also rent your room, but if a vote no um, committee wants to come in and use your room and you let the vote yes, you have to let the vote no. Same with um, the copier. If you have a public copier um, and, you know, or a printer and you're, someone's printing out stuff and paying for it, just like they would any other patron, you have to let them do it. You can't tell the vote no people they can't do something to allow the vote yes people to do it. So that, I do ask you to think about that from the flip side though, because if, if you have an active anti-tax group in your area or people who might actually be specifically opposed to the library millage, be very careful about what you allow the ballot question committee to do. Um, if it's in compliance with your um, meeting room policy, you can't turn down anybody because of the subject matter of what they're doing. If they're having a meeting, um, an organizational meeting, um, you can't restrict them in either way because if you allow other organizational meetings, but um, you certainly cannot allow one group um, access and another group not based on the subject matter of what they're talking about. That would be a constitutional violation um, and likely a campaign finance issue too. So what else would you do? Uh, uh, marketing the millage, ballot question committees. You, you, you can have a ballot question committee and by you can have, I mean, not the library, that the citizens in the area can form a ballot question committee. Um, this would have to happen if the group desires to spend over 500 promoting um, the campaign. This committee must be independent from the library, but the ballot question committee, and there's lots of good material on the library, the state of Michigan's um, election site um, about how to format what you need. You really need a good treasurer from what I understand um, to, because there's reporting and, and intake requirements. It might not be that big a deal if you're not you know, actively fundraising for it. Um, Often the friends of the library can assist in forming the ballot question committee. And I really wanna stop for a minute and, and talk about this because one of the confusion is, is that the friends of the library as a corporate entity can't form a ballot question committee. But some of the friends, like let's just say that the, the, the three, the president, the um, secretary and the vice president of the friends wanna be the ballot question committee, they can form their own ballot question committee. Um, but I would, I get a lot of questions that are asked by the library about the friends and the ballot question committee. Like a common question I get is how much can the friends spend on the ballot question committee? So I really can't answer that question because again, I don't represent the friends. And also that would be an, you know, an, an, an you know, potentially problematic um, expenditure of funds for the library. So um, there are some resources. I don't know, Claire, if you have, I thought that they had some ALA friends resources on that, but that would be the first step. But the state of Michigan's website has really good materials on forming a ballot question committee. From your perspective, you just know you should stay out of it. Now, you can help the ballot question committee in any way you would help any other member of the public. Um, again, but don't treat them differently than you would anybody else as far as your time and um, your commitment to them. Well, I think that's it for my my spiel, but I think we had some questions. Here we go. Hey, Anne. Yeah. Um, I get a question all the time. Um, the Could you just speak a sentence or two about the board being on the ballot question committee? Like being being officers or forming the ballot question committee? Yeah, so um, I, I, I think I skipped over a little bit, but board members have a little bit different role or position in the ballot and under the Michigan Campaign Finance Act. A board member that has policymaking authority 
um, as long as they're not using public funds, can do a little bit more advocating. And, and a good example is that that your president of your board can do an op-ed um, to your local paper, asking for people to asking for people to um, approve the millage. That's that's not a violation of Campaign Finance Act. Um, again, I would be very I, you know, if the president of the board is willing to work with you, I'd make sure that that your attorney agrees with the content of whatever that op-ed piece, so it doesn't have a problem. But generally, that's something you you can do. The reason, though, that the that the because they have this ability to um, you know promote the election, having them on the ballot question committee may be problematic because sometimes people don't know if they're speaking as the board member or speaking as the ballot question committee member. Um, as far as a practice pointer, I don't recommend it. I just, I just don't. I, I think wearing two hats under that is, um, is problematic. I, I realize that a lot of times you can't get people to do things. Um, I certainly wouldn't have the board member be the treasurer because then you're talking about the money and being responsible for the money. It's just, it's just one of those things. It's just a really bad idea. So unless there's like nobody else and and you're very very careful and you've vetted it all with your attorney I, it just wouldn't be my recommendation is that fair claire are you let's see did we get the chat we have someone who's running to be the library board this year let's see okay hang on a second If a board asks the lawyer about the ballot question, the lawyer would still be paid. So does the ballot committee have to have their own funds for that? Uh, I don't know if I'm answering the question right. Is our board asks the lawyer about the ballot questions and the lawyer would still be paid by the library's public funds. So does the ballot committee have to have their own funds for that? I so I I think that I think that I feel comfortable as a public lawyer answering some basic questions about the the like how this works, okay? So how does it work? What can you pay for? What can you pay for? Um, but as far as if the, as a public lawyer, if if I was being asked about what the ballot question committee can do, what can they say? How can they be formed? I don't think that's a proper expenditure of funds. So I hope I hope I got that right. If, if, if I haven't clarified that, Sue, if there's something else, please let me know. So like, you know, for example, I can tell I feel comfortable explaining to a public body that what they can and can't do, and they shouldn't really be spending public money on something because that's part of the representation of them to let them know what they should it should not be doing. So I, it depends kind of on what the, what's being done. Yes, yeah, saving the percent of the budget that would be lost would be okay, right? Without a projection of what the loss would mean. Yes, absolutely. So if you have, this is exactly what I'm talking about. If you have, if, for Megan, if you have statistical um, facts and figures to back up what you're saying. I think those are all appropriate for public. I can support those for public fund expenditures. If we have someone running for the board this year, that's not currently on the board. Could they be part of the yes committee? Yeah, I don't think they're, they, they don't have an official role. Yes. Um, on the board. Um, maybe it's basic district libraries must time their millage when all the townships hold it. Otherwise they have to pay. Oh, you, this is an absolutely fabulous question because um, must time their millage when all the time. Okay. District libraries, you can decide what election that you pay for or what you are on, but you might have to pay a greater percentage of the costs or all of the costs. Um, if you are a large district, this might be a big issue for you. I know if you're a county library or if you're a district that's part of a county, sometimes the cost can be prohibitive. For example, you might not be able to go in May because you might have to pay for the whole election. So that is an excellent comment because, you know, when you talk to your clerk about a couple things you should, you know, when do you, when's the ballot deadline in your opinion? Um, you know, you know, and ask them, you know, find out when you can levy your millage. Remember, if, if it's make sure that you can levy it at the time you want to levy it. And the other question for the clerk is, is and what do you have a ballpark of what this is going to cost? Only because I don't think counties, and I don't know if there's a memo that went out to counties lately, but uh, I've gotten, and maybe in the last year and a half, a lot more questions and more. I don't know if you guys have seen this, where um, libraries are not being billed when they weren't billed before. Is that clear what you, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I think if you look at the statute, I think they, you know, I, you'd have to look at the specific bill, but typically they can, they can 
get back, you know, actual incremental costs of the election. So you want to make sure you review the bill and make sure it's fair and what they're paying for. But I think it's, it's catching a lot of libraries by surprise, not that they, you know, maybe that they didn't understand that they could be charged one and that two, that they've just never been charged before. So all of a sudden they're getting charged. So that's the one question that you should talk to your municipalities about, about the cost of the election. Thanks for bringing that up because that's a really good point. What are criteria are typical in deciding whether a yes committee is necessary or not? Um, if one of the things that I like to is how, how, how much do you think that your um, millage, if your millage passes like 90% every time, it, like people just see library on the ballot and they just vote yes, that's just, just like automatic, then you might not need it. Um, so, you know, if you've got a heavy, um, you know, um, anti-tax group, you might, then you might need it. The other time where I represented a library that had a ballot proposal on the ballot and we, and the library lost because at the same election, there was a very unpopular school um, proposal on. So all you saw was signs for vote no. People didn't know what they were voting no on. They just voted no. So you may, if you realize that there's going to be an unpopular proposal on that another entity is uh, doing it, or maybe a controversial one, you might want to have a, um, you know, so you can write, vote yes on the library. So people will understand that it's it's a different millage than, than people are opposed to and for what reason. So um, it really depends on... Um, you know, I'm just gonna say anecdotally, I hope I'm not going on a limb here, Claire, reel, reel me back in if I am. But I think that library millages pass to me at a greater percentage than other services. But even in these times, I've been seeing them passing a lot, but, but there's also library millages that lose by votes. So it's really gonna depend on, um, you know, what your area is and typically what, you know, what you wanna do. Plus, if you look at what Ann has said about what the library can and cannot talk about, mm -hmm. if you don't have a yes committee, you're very limited as to mm -hmm. what you or your staff can tell people about the millage. Mm -hmm. a, good, a good place, I think a good place for you to talk about, um, and I want to pause because I have um, another, like a, a, a point I want to make about the millage material where it can help you. So if you want to explain things like why your library's millage is being captured by the BRA, that's something you can do on your own and you don't need a, a millage committee to do. If you want to explain, so the, the other thing too with, with like a, a lot of entities want to put in the ballot language things I don't recommend. Like for example, um, if, if you pass this millage, then we won't spend this. That's really not appropriate for a ballot proposal itself, but it might be appropriate to put in your campaign materials. You know, um, you know, for example, um, if you have another funding source that you are, are going to use or that if you get this source, you're going to like reduce the millage proposal, um, things like that. You want to maybe that that's appropriate for your literature maybe, um, you know, so, but if the library can do that and you don't feel like you need the ballot question committee, it's really the vote yes, it's the yard signs, it's the, we've got the best library, we've got the best staff, you know, if you, the ballot question committee can say that the, our services will go way down and it's, it won't be the library that you want for this community if you don't vote this millage in, that's all stuff the ballot question committee can say and you can't, so it really depends on the messaging and what you need as far as, you know, voter turnout and voter approval. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, can a member of the ballot question? Yeah, any, any a member, can a ballot question committee regularly attend board meetings? Yes, anybody can attend the board meetings. Um, you can even ask questions of the ballot question committee at the board meeting. So that definitely is yes. To confirm, to pass a millage for a district library it just needs to be passed by the majority overall. Yes, that's true. So if, if you have, um, you know, if you're, if your population, it's, it's, it's the majority of the entire district. So you could actually fail in one particular municipality, but if you still have the majority of the votes district-wide, it'll pass. Yeah, that's a good question because there's some authorities that require it in every single entity and district libraries are not this way. 
Can non-salaried library staff and board members put yards in? Okay, okay. So this is where I think I'm confusing people. Okay, <laughs> so um, your you can put if you can put vote yes signs in your yard, regardless of whether you're salaried or unsalaried. That's your house. That's your personal time, your personal space. You can do what you want in that personal sign, but you can't put a vote yes sign in the window of your office. That's that's the difference. So it's what you're spending your on the clock time doing. Um, even, I'm gonna go out on a limb, even if you work from home, <laughs> you can still have your own personal yard sign. That's your first amendment right to have that yard sign um, out there um, on, on your work from home time or at your house. So yeah, I just wanna be very clear. This, some of this gets a little bit jumbled when you're, when you're talking about all these different issues. So that's a really good question, but yeah, you don't lose your own you can go out, you know, at night, you know, after work and go door to door and knock on doors and say, vote yes. Um, but again, it's, it's what space you're using and what time you're using. That's important. That's a good what question. It, what about on the lawn of the library? So I say, well, here's, okay. I don't like that because then you have to allow every other sign on your lawn at your library. I actually write policies that say you can't have that because there's 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 authority that says you don't have to allow signs on public space, but that means no signs. Um, the thing about signs um, that there's a very big U.S. Supreme Court case that came out a couple years ago with signs and regulating signs that basically says that if you have to read the sign to know how to regulate it, it's a First Amendment violation. So you can't pick and choose the signs based on content. You can't even technically say okay, this is an election sign. It has to be down 30 days after the sign. So that's why I don't like signs because you can have someone that puts like, you know, no, you know, ban the library and you can't even say it's an election sign. It has to stay there until it deteriorates. Essentially. <laughs> so um, I don't like any signs. That's just my general recommendation for that. Okay. If a patron asks the library staff if I vote yes, are they allowed to give them the contact information from the committee? I think that's a research question. I mean, honestly, I, I don't, that might be a little close, but, um, you know, I think, I think it, I don't like when the libraries link, libraries can't link their websites to it. Mm -hmm. um, be careful if you link your website to the friends group. And then that friends group links to the website to the <laughs> question. You know, um, I mean, the most conservative answer is no. I I doubt you're going to get some, because I think if 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 your library if 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 I think it's a factual question about whether a ballot question committee exists or not. Um, so are you spending your public funds getting information? Well, if you're if you're at the re reference desk and you would. And someone asked you the contact information for the, you know, agricultural society, or the, I, I think that's, I think that's okay. Claire, you, I don't know if you want yeah. to jump in. Yeah. I mean, if they asked, if they came to the reference desk and asked for any other ballot, um, yes, committee for any other proposal that yeah. was on the, you, you'd do it. Yeah. I think that you, you got to worry about optics. So what I think the optics are is if, if you're a patron that's anti-library and you're in the library, so first of all, overhearing this, that, that's an issue. But anyway, if you're in the library, um, you might just be an anti-tax person and you are waiting for your reference question and you see your reference, you know, staff member, you know, talking to your, you know, patron about the, how great the library is and, oh, I'm so glad you're contacting them because they're great and they're going to pass our mailage. That's where you get it to be a problem. So that's why I, I the, having the materials at the library where it, where I talked to you about before, it just, it, 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 it invites the interaction that could be a violation. That's the, the concern that I have. Does the committee or the library pay for that cost? I don't know what cost. I lost track of, I lost track of what it cost we're, we're talking about. The election. The, oh, the, the library itself can pay for election costs. You can pay for um, ballot proposal um, drafting. You can pay for the election costs. Actually, the statute requires the library to pay for it. So you don't need to raise money or have a committee to do that. Ballot question committee. Um, let's see, there's a question about, oh, a ballot question committee only needs to be formed when there's $500 spent. 
So I don't know if that answers Megan's question. So if there's not $500 spent, that you don't need a ballot question committee. But it's one of those things that you can't have someone here spending 300, someone here spending 300 and like have it like be, try to be independent. They're gonna look at like kind of like the sum total of who's, who's in an effort towards that, that goal. Um, if a member of a ballot question committee came and the board asked, what would happen? Could the board answer that question? And so this is the other sort of gray area. In the context of a public meeting, I think you can respond to questions from the public. Now, and 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 the, the ballot question committee can go out and say, we asked this question, here's what the board said. Because the ballot question committee can promote the election, right? It's just that the board itself can't tell you what's going to happen unless you've made it, unless they've actually made a decision in that, you know, following that. There was a, there was a question up here from Denise about the funding source required for it. Do you have to say on the vote yes or no campaign signs who paid for it? I think you do, but I don't know. I'm not an expert in the um, ballot question committee, but I think yeah. you have to the, say paid for by the, I think that's one of the, that's one of the requirements that should be in the material. I was just going to say, I think that ham, that little booklet that the state puts out about ballot question committees, I think that tells you that's pretty comprehensive. So, so uh, Kim had a question, she asked me to go back and Kim, thank you for reminding me. So Kim's question, and I hope I'm getting this right, because I think there's two scenarios that we're talking about here with DDA captures. Okay. So the the there's a the statute had a deadline of January 1, 2017. So any millage that was let's just say you have a perpetual millage that's in effect um, um, prior to January 1, 2017. So it's a perpetual millage. So in what circumstances um, can you get out of that? Okay. One is if they expand their district or lengthen their district, you're you have you can pass a resolution to get out. There's also a circumstance, and Claire, I can't remember if you're automatically out or if you have to pass a resolution. I think you're automatically out if there's no, if they have no outstanding obligations. So I think that's where you have to, you have to tell, you have to send them a notice that you're going to pull out. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's some, if you, so if they have bonded, if you have a pre-existing millage and they still have bonded debt and they haven't changed their boundaries or extended their district, you might still be subject to capture Anybody who's still subject to capture, I would have a conversation with your lawyer about that just to make sure you're looking out for the right things and asking the right questions. Because like I said, you cannot depend upon these municipalities to, to, to volunteer you not to be captured anymore. Um, so I think that's where the bond debt is. If What they're saying is that you're pre-existing, we can still capture you if there's bond debt. The one thing I wanna say though, is that let's just say the DDA has a bond, okay? And the bond was started, it's a it's a 20 year bond and they're in year 15. If you go for a renewal or a new millage right now, you don't have to pay for their existing bond. It's only for the pre-existing millages. So if you have, if you're being, if you're still being captured by your DDA, I would definitely recommend having a conversation with your with your lawyer about whether you should be or not. Because often we write letters to say, look, do you really have bond, do you really have debt? Because some of them don't have any debt either. You know, they'll claim that they're, you know, the executive director of the DDA's contract is an obligation. And so it, it's sometimes it's a fight, but um, we certainly will. Um, I think it's certainly something you should talk to your lawyer about. I don't, I don't think I have any more questions. Anybody else going once? Going twice? Well, th- I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about villages. Thank you, Anne. All right. Bye, everybody. Okay, it's one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us for the fourth and final session of the virtual millage series. Today, we have with us longtime Kent District Library trustee and library millage campaign consultant, Shirley Bursma. Shirley's going to cover tools for a successful millage campaign. Shirley, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Who is the millage queen? Well, (laughs) I've been doing this for 22 years. 
Um, I was dubbed that name back in 2012 in Flint when I did a workshop for the Mid Michigan, uh, Mid Eastern Michigan Co op. Um, I've been doing this for 22 years. I've completed 134 millage campaigns to date for both small, medium, and large libraries. 130, I won on the first ballot. Four, we had to redo, and we did it on the second ballot. Um, one, I have never, ever lost a millage, um, otherwise to put it that way. Uh, my uh, Probably my biggest uh, time was in 2014. I called, coached and consulted on 22 campaigns in August of 2014, and I won all 22. So that's kind of my highlight that I build on. I've always had full support of the library and the library community, and that is the key to winning a millage. 15 of those 134 are second time campaigns. In other words, these were uh, campaigns that um, where they asked me to, they had used up their 10 years and they had asked me to come back and, and I was honored to help them again. And there's one that I've done three times. They didn't have the 10 years, they had eight. And so we've already done the third one. Many years of library and trustee experience, I'm gonna share with you for a few seconds. I've been on the trustee, KD, I've been a trustee on the KDL board for 18 years. Before that, I was on the county board before we became a district library for five years. I've been on the Lakeland Cooperative Board trust as a trustee for 30 years. And I'm proud to be a co-founder of the Alliance of Trustees from 2011 to 2021. Some of my key experiences as a speaker was I've presented multiple times, uh, including millages at ALA, PLA, MLA, I've given over 200 workshops for library trustees across the state. In fact, I just did one this past Saturday. That includes trustee responsibility and, and governing board's topics related to that. I've given five big millage campaign presentations. Four of them were in Flint for Mid Eastern Michigan Co-op. And then the fifth one was at Library of Michigan in person. Um, I enjoy doing them and I have always done them in person. I would always state that I do not do PowerPoints, that I would learn to do them when I got older. Well, guess what folks, I'm older. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, there is probably six to 700 of my folders floating around out here in Michigan. Uh, and I'm sure some of you have some and nothing has changed in those folders. And a lot of what we're doing today is still applicable to that, except for the dates. A couple of worthy notes of my past. I was, um, uh, MLA Lifetime Achievement Award in 2016. The boardroom at KDL was named the Burzma Boardroom in January of 2020. And I'm listed in the Library of Congress by a Michigan legislator for the awards I've gotten. And in 2009, I was named ALA Trustee of the Year. That is part of the many awards that I've gotten. One of the last thing, maybe the most important thing I will tell you about myself is that I'm a mom of six beautiful kids, now adults, of course, grandma of 10, great grandma of 11, and I was a proud bride of 66 years. Enough about me now. I'm here to help you. I'm honored and humbled to be asked to share coaching and advice on running a successful village campaign with each of you. Thank you for joining today. Great to see a nice turnout. I know we all wish it was in person, but I'm thankful and to you and I be, to be able to be here in the midst of a pandemic 
And of course, with the price of gas, we can uh, save on travel time. So let's get started. We have a lot to cover. And hopefully out of all of that, you can um, get uh, some information that you need to do a campaign. Post any questions you have along the way in the meeting chat. There will be a brief Q&A also at the end of my presentation. And before we begin, I know many of you will have questions, so that's how we're going to handle them today. Steps to success, defining the library's need, create your key message and focus, it takes a village of board of trustees, of library staff, of volunteers, talking to voters, anyone who will listen, publicity, publicity, publicity. And of course, post-election activities and important dates recapped. That is the outline of what I'm going to cover today. I have a lot of dates to share, but don't worry if you miss a few during the presentation, We'll, we will recap them at the end. And of course, you can ultimately print this off for future reference. First one is define the library's need. What do you want? Put it in writing, get it on the ballot. The administrative team decides and identifies what we want, what we need, and what we are asking for to not only maintain funding, but to increase needs to make the library better. From there, the director and staff decides on what the biggest and most important needs are. They um, and are and recommend actions to the board. The board of trustees agrees to support the director's recommendations and then votes to take action only. And keep in mind, only the Board of Trustees can pass a resolution to move this to the attorney for review. Put it in writing. You want to draft the ballot language to match what was voted on by the trustees. Ask legal counsel to review it. This is a mandatory part of that. Use a library attorney to ensure accuracy were at all possible. Uh, it's good to use a library attorney, and we've got uh, one out there, in fact, probably several. Um, and then that's in preparation for submission to the county clerk. Don't forget all the good tips Anne gave us last week at her presentation. Get it on the ballot. We want to request the local county clerk or election clerk to place it on a ballot in a timely manner and on schedule. Beware of strict time limits for this process. Make sure it has been submitted before the deadline for the August 3 election. And that deadline is May 10th. For the November 8 election, it is August 16th. Both deadlines must be in the hands of the county clerk or election clerk to be processed. Libraries, Remember, this is a ballot question, and sometimes we get that mixed up. It is not a political candidate campaign. This is a ballot question. Libraries help everyone. We try to keep the politics out of it, but by focusing on the ballot question, we can bring both sides together to help keep the library open and, of course, operational. If there is a chance you do not pass the millage in August and want to run again in November, the August 16th date still applies for November. However, you need to be very organized and be ready for a quick turnaround. And a PS from me, the millage queen, if I was your coach at the time, I personally would not recommend doing it and if you're interested in, in why I say that, I can explain later or you can send a question in on the chat. Moving along to the next slide. Keep your message, create your key message and focus. Keep your message simple. 
choose style and appeal. We need to create an image. And remember, it's a good thing. Keep your message simple. Don't get bogged down in nitty gritty details. Have a message that is what you are going to the voters for. In other words, build a new library, add a new wing or addition. Another simple message may be just to renew the existing millage or ask for a small increase. Whatever the decision the Board of Trustees has determined. Make sure you explain the cost to the taxpayer. It's a dollar per thousand of assessed valuation of their property. And some of us are aware that this year the assessments went up. The library will receive $100 annually on a $100,000 home or assessed valuation or less than $8.50 $8.50 monthly or $2.25 weekly or less than $2.15 a person for a family of four. The point is a good can be done with a lot and a little bit from everyone. Will ballot language be a straight renewal or a renewal with an increase? A straight renewal and some of my um, Yes, committees are doing that this year. They're not even going back or going out to get the Headley rollback back. They want to just a straight renewal. And that's real simple on a ballot. If um, you don't have to work as hard at it, if it's a straight renewal uh, with the increase in state aid and um, some other uh, facts coming along, they're they just feel they didn't need to even recoup the rollback. Now, the increase, renewal with increase means that you're going to try to um, go for millage and then recoup. However, it has to read, this is an increase when you are bringing back the ballot language um, to say, um, a renewal plus an increase because you're picking up what Headley rolled back, unless, of course, you're asking for a little bit more. If you are going for a large increase, that's an increase over five tenths, then you're going to have two ballots. So keep that in mind. It can be a little bit more complicated um, when you've got two ballots, but that is um, at the advice of the uh, attorney that we have to have two ballots if the increase is over 0.5%. Um, and if anybody has extra questions on that, we can address that at the end. Remember, there might be a Headley rollback to consider capturing. In other words, the term Headley rollback became part of a municipal finance lexicon in 1978 with the passage of the Headley Amendment to the Constitution of the State of Michigan of 1963. Rumors have it Mr. Headley migrated to Michigan in the early 60s from Ohio. I'm not sure. I've always wondered why he didn't go to Indiana or Illinois, why he chose Michigan. But anyway, here it is. In a nutshell, Headley requires a local unit of government to reduce its millage when annual growth on existing property is greater than the rate of inflation. As a consequence, the local unit's millage rate is rolled back so that the resulting growth in property tax revenue community-wide is no more than the rate of inflation. A Hadley overwrite is a vote by the electors to return the millage to the amount originally authorized by a chapter, state statute, or vote of the people, and is necessary to counteract the effects of the Hadley rollback. Keep in mind, not every library has Hadley. And when people call me to coach their campaign, one of the first things I say, do we have Headley involved? Because it always makes things a little bit more interesting and uh, a little bit uh, more cumbersome. 
And um, so the millage rate um, is predicated a lot of times on the Headley rollback. Ask what your what is your community need? Keep the library open in some communities, of course. And this is a delicate situation. I've run into legislators and council people who think that we do not need libraries, that brick and mortar is um, done now, and so we don't need to uh, do these millage campaigns. But I, um, of course, love to take them on and, and discuss with it why that is not true anymore. Another item to be aware of is the state of the economy and potential commit competing millages. In other words, you're, you may have on the ballot the schools, uh, parks and rec, um, there may be fire and police doesn't mean you shouldn't proceed. It depends on the depth of them. Some people decide to wait uh, till the next millage um, or the next voting campaign is out there uh, because they don't want to um, be in competition. But every one of those that I just mentioned really um, are within themselves. Uh, the police are there for safety. The firemen are there to fight fires. Park and rec are, they have a purpose. So everyone has their own purpose. And we have done millages where it was all on the ballot and everybody won. So I'm just throwing that out there to, to make sure that if you have the right message and support, you still should be able to pass it. Um, you want to increase services and programs with your ballot. Technology and internet access. Everything now is done online. You need the computer equipment to help patrons find jobs, apply for college, do homework, write resumes. Remember, not everyone has a computer at home. And, not, and some don't even live where there is uh, service available to hook up a computer. So um, all of those things play into it. Job skills, building new skills, learning new trades, e-resources, streaming platforms like Canopy, Hulu, Netflix, e-reading platforms like Libby and Hoopla, music platforms like Freegal and Musicat. Stick to the point, just the facts. And to get the point, be transparent. That's going to be so important with your campaign is transparency. Have an explanation for a decision on why the requested amount was chosen. Design materials that will appear to your audience. Presentation matters. Include bilingual iterations. In other words, if you have a community that has a huge, um, say, Hispanic uh, community, a Vietnam Vietnamese community, know your different ethnic communities, have material in their language if necessary, depending on the size of the community, uh, include in their native language. And you might also want to make sure or have a, a gathering so that they know they have to be registered to vote. Maybe you could have a clerk come out and register them if they're not. So all of this is important in getting uh, your uh, ethnic groups involved. In some communities, that is definitely an issue. Have a speakers bureau. This is a group of community members willing to talk, debate, and ultimately be the vocal representative of the yes committee for your millage. Expect to talk to all groups, no matter the size, from large gatherings to small book clubs to local coffee um, gatherings in your area. There are a number of ways to, to make contact and most of them are interested and would love to have you come out there and do that. Every community needs a great library. It is the heartbeat of the community. 
And as some of you know, in some of the places, the library is the only building in the community. Believe in what you are asking for. Feel excitement, show enthusiasm, fight for it, be proud when asking for the support of the new millage. Some of my information throughout this presentation is going to be a little bit repetitive, but I'm trying to emphasize the critical statements to make sure I get the right message to you. We have a, a chat here. If we have a rollback to recoup and we put our ballot language in the ballot a year ahead, what happens if there's an additional rollback? That, um, <laughs> that's a good question. I'm not sure that I have the proper answer for you for that. There is um, those rollbacks. First of all, I know it happens and those rollbacks are not that large. And so um, it will come off you know, the, the tax again for the following year. However, I have never run into where a, in 10 years, and that's what I always advocate is 10 years, where it's less than um, a tenth of a mil uh, that this uh, happens. In other words, um, I shouldn't say a tenth of a mil, I should say like, say you're going for a whole mil. It never gets much below the 0.9 on your um, taxes. And of course, that's less that is being asked for. I mean, that is less that the taxpayer is paying for. But then when it comes to the 10 years are up, obviously more that you have to go back and ask for. Um, so, but there's never been, I help one library completely read you um, their millage campaign, but it was because they had a, a, a huge remodeling job done and they needed added staff and computers and so. And so um, the attorney recommended completely voiding the current millage. We went out for a whole new one and was able to pass it. So there are, you can go back to the voters if things got really uh, dire, but I think right now we are so blessed with this increase in state aid. Um, as you know, state aid is, um, the statute said 50 cents per capita. We are at 48 cents at the, or a little over actually, 48 cents. And that is um, thanks to a couple of legislators that advocated adding 2 million to state aid this year. Uh, we've only ever had one where it was 50 cents per capita, and that was many, many years ago through the Engler administration. So um, I can remember back in, I think it was 08, 09, 010, when the economy was really tanking, we were down to close to 19 cents per capita. So I think all in all that you still should come out okay, even if that um, Headley rollback would, would be a big increase. Your Board of Equalization is the one that can answer that question also. So um, next it's, I wanna talk to you about creating a yes team. Actually, this is a grassroots committee of six to 10 individual, individuals also known as the Citizens Advocacy Committee. You want to create a name for this committee. This can be chosen by the Board of Trustees or it is usually chosen by the, the uh, committee itself. And it can be a catchy name. It can be, I know mine at Kent District Library is uh, Kent um, District Library for for uh, millage and so, uh, but and it can be books for so and so. It can be uh, um, any name that you come up with. And I I should have brought a list. There's a a bunch of catchy ones that some people come up with, and but a lot of them use books for so and so. Uh, the new name then is submitted to the county clerk. 
along then with the treasurer's address. And that is um, one of the committee people that I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, and that goes then to the county clerk. The treasurer's address would be the person's name and a treasurer's address. There can be no box office number. And um, so, but anyway, you want to get a good cross section of the library and community members involved in this grassroots or what we call the YES team. Friends of the library, homeschool parents, they need public libraries more than ever. And I have found in all the millages I've done, homeschool parents are dynamite workers. They want to be a part of your campaign and they do a phenomenal job out there helping. Uh, donors, obviously we need donors for the YES campaign. Uh, you need the library director and some key library staff. Remember, this is considered personal time, not when they're on the library payroll. And of course, board of trustees uh, members can also be a part of the grassroots committee or YES team. You need to create officers and some subcommittees. You need to select a chair. And I like to advocate getting an honorary chair. That's someone really visible in your community and who is a huge library advocate that's out there speaking for uh, the millage and the reasons that we need to do that. And of course, appoint a treasurer. That's probably the most important position because there is a lot involved in that position. Some examples would be recording of donations, recording of in-kind related services, sending out thank you letters, receipts, various filings as dictated by the county clerk, plus others. Remember, once you win this millage, and you can, and should, um, once you win the millage, there is um, some ample time afterwards, but not a lot. And all these positions expire. All these committees expire. Um, that's the beauty part of winning the millage is you're, uh, you started to end it and with a winning total. Um, some committees are absentee voter committee. Uh, aim for the first mailing in the second week of June at the latest. The social media committee, so very important. Do not neglect. Now that is separate, of course, from the social media committee of the library, um, the informational part of the library. Uh, street sign committees. I advocate using street signs um, on corners, on uh, not along the road, but in the yards. Um, and then marquees and businesses, churches, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I'm a huge advocate of road signs. I think they do a lot of good. And uh, the uh, marquees and so that we do the last weekend before the election. Um, there can be a postcard uh, mailing committee, um, design work, parades, farmers markets, farmers, that's why I like August millages. You can use farmers markets. There can be tables there from the Yes Committee and from the Informational Committee. Uh, fundraising, of course, the biggest key to printing and mailing success. Letters to the editors, other publications, this is all available or will be available for the month of July. Do YES committee members have to live in the library service area? Yes, that definitely should be. It's not a fast and, and um, road and cement rule, but yes, um, that would be a, a much better. Sometimes the um, honorary chair does not, or because depending on their uh, visibility to the community, but yes, no, they should be in that community. What if 
our library is on a township county line. Well, you're, wherever you vote uh, is where your priority is. Um, and it, um, and, and there are plenty of those out there where you're on the county or the township line, but um, you only vote in one of those two areas. So uh, that's where the uh, priority for the campaign. How do we create a committee if as a director, I'm not supposed to be involved in campaigning? At no time is the director not involved in campaigning. Um, and they, you work together. In other words, all the information that the YES campaign uses is the very same literature that the director and staff use for the informational material. They have to be identical. The only difference is the yes committee can put on their literature, vote yes. The uh, street signs can say uh, paid for by the yes committee. That is a, a definite, no, no the, the director is always involved I know there has been some, um, what do I want to say, information that they're not, but um, I have never, ever been involved where they were not, including my own, and nobody's more involved than my own director. Uh, but anyway, I do know, though, that you can be involved and you can help to design um, the not only the literature, but to because the yes committee cannot go into your um, list of uh, patrons. Uh, years ago, we could do that. We can't do that anymore. You can't be a part of that list. And so, some recommendations can come. Um, and of course, the friends group. If you have a friends group. Um, it is such a big help to be a part of the YES campaign, not only with donations, but with help. And um, they know a lot of people in the community, but no, you definitely uh, can be a part of. Now, uh, another issue there is, well, the director is supposedly a 24-hour person, but that's not always true. When they leave the, the library property, uh, First Amendment rights allows them to be a part of the community and the YES committee, um, etc. I hope that answers your question. If not, we can uh, go back to that later. Um, and uh, so the uh, other committees, letter to the editor, publications, um, all of that. Um, some places, of course, don't have a, a place to send a letter to the editor, but that does uh, a lot of good, too, if you can. Um, don't worry about the size of the list at the beginning. Get everyone's input, reorganize, focus the list on what is best for your campaign, actually for the size of your population, number of precincts you have. There is... Um, and of course, I, some of it too is, you know, how much you're asking for the millage, how much are you going to have to really uh, be out there uh, beating the, 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 the streets for. Uh, but a few of the big step efforts that are often forgotten, county clerk deadlines needs to be top of the mind, biggest priority. Mailings and door-to-door -door visits. We don't do phoning anymore because of the uh, cell phones now, uh, but door-to-door -door in large sub, uh, suburban areas are always good. And I can relate how we do it in my library. Of course, as some of you know, I have 20 branches. I have some co big communities. We set up on Saturdays, the month of July. Every Saturday, we'd go to a different community. And I personally got the setups together. I would call a church in that area and see if we could come in for a half hour, 45 minutes. 
I bring um, nibbles and uh, drinks and, of course, maps for each one to, to know where they were going to be walking. We would bring door knockers for them to hang on doors. And um, so that's how we did the, the door-to-door part of the campaign. And my director was always front and center on all of them. Loved doing door to door. Um, and, and of course, letters to the editors where uh, papers are available. Staff can be involved if off premise because they are also a patron. And then the bilingual uh, large groups in some neighborhoods we talked about handouts, material from the US committee, make sure it reflects all the key facts that the informational committee is also sending out and then meetings with local organizations and agencies that I will uh, bring up a little bit later. And then um, that includes every civic or community group. Are there guidelines or examples we should follow for letters to the editor? No, that actually comes from the heart. Um, you can, um, as a patron, you can go out there and say, I feel that um, uh, my library um, is worthy of this uh, millage and uh, the uh, uh, previous millage is, is um, retiring and we need to and why you feel it's important, what that library has done for you personally, what the library is doing for the community, for the programs that it's put on, how it stayed viable through the pandemic with the curbside service. And so you really want to just from the heart explain that. Board members can write letters to the editor, you bet they can, and, and I know many of them that have, um, including at my own library, um, that um, because you're going to personalize it, and that's why you want to do it that way. Um, and uh, sign responsibilities to the S committee, share the workload, uh, keeping the voters informed, don't lose sight of the deadline in the calendars set regularly scheduled meetings. Meetings should occur every other week at a minimum. Keep detailed min meeting minutes. And, and if I am your coach, I ask those to be sent to me uh, because that way, if there's something that was discussed at the uh, committee meeting and was headed down the wrong road, I can quickly enter intercede and say, uh, uh no, we don't do that. No, you can't do that. Uh, so, uh, and the other main thing is all yes committee meetings must occur offsite. Never meet at the library. There's plenty of locations. There's township halls. Some churches will let you meet there. Um, last week, I met with a committee at a fire station there's a lot of locations where you can meet, but never yes committee at the library, never any of your yes material at the library, no signs at the library. Uh, create a timetable. Um, at the end of my presentation, I've got a, a, a timetable that we'll go over um, that um, we'll review. But if you can look ahead, Lay the foundation two years to six months in advance. I have already have libraries asking for my assistance in 23, 24, and 25. Um, that's uh, getting going ahead of time, and that's when their millages are expiring. And so those are um, directors that have called and are uh, want to be on the ball and ahead of the game. Organize it as early as possible. Get the issue on the ballot. Organize the campaign six to nine months in advance. Prepare details. Organize the work no later than five to six months in advance. Run the campaign no later than three to four. This is the heart of your effort. 
during my workshops, we get deeper into the specifics and lose and look at samples of successful millage campaigns. I have 26 townships and two counties in my district. It is helpful to attend township board meetings to get info out of the community. Is it helpful? Yes, and I will address that pretty soon. Definitely, um, you need to go to every one of those um, areas. Um, that's like my 20 branches. I know what it's like, and it's more work when you're in a community that size. But thank you, that was a great question. The library is the key of every community. We've talked about that before. They apply so much value to the community they serve. And so you need to be ready to tell your story, what your library provides, what the library is on top of from uh, cradle to grave. The library is the most um, biggest entity to address that. Um, there is lots of entities out there, but none that address cradle to grave. I've used that expression for the 34 years I've been a trustee. I just think that that is one of the uh, things that libraries are there to address. And of course, um, your newspaper, radio, TV station, uh, and um, many, in fact, I have run into TV stations that have let me do spots and many of them will share that free, uh, which is great. Anytime we can save money and it's not easy always to, to uh, earn uh, funds to do a millage campaign. So if you can get some uh, stories out there free, uh, some will even do interviews with yes folks, some will do interviews with the library director. Uh, what is all this about? What is going on in the community? Why are you doing a millage? Um, and then here was what I referred to a minute ago, attend local meetings, school boards, chamber of commerce, city council, village township council and make sure you've got handouts to take to them, but you also wanna be able to uh, be very transparent and talk to them about what you are doing, what you're asking the voters for and why it is um, important that this millage pass. Obviously, sometimes it's just to keep the doors open uh, Rotary Club, Lions Clubs, wherever the Yes Committee can get in the door. Um, ask someone on the um, um, Yes Committee to make the phone calls. You want to call all these places. Ask if you can be on the agenda, if you can share three minutes of their time and that you want to explain to them the um, fact that the library is going for a millage and the prior approved millage is expiring and to continue operations, they need to, to uh, win a new millage. And uh, you can explain if it's a straight renewal or an increase like we talked about a minute ago. Uh, and you wanna explain the total uh, campaign. So that is uh, very important that you address every one of those um, that we just talked about. Some places have a lot of schools, different schools in their municipality. Some might only have one, but I always advocate that you start out with the school. Um, and also um, that uh, depending on the timing, would it be okay if some information went home the last week in uh, May uh, to the elementary and junior high? Senior high, they wouldn't get home anyway. But if we could get some information home with the student uh, to explain what's going on. Uh, social media, of course, is a, a very important uh, credit for uh, the uh, uh, media, social media platform, 
Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. That is what we want to um, be able to cut down a lot on our mailing, uh, a lot on, on presentations. Uh, you can post success stories, post support stories, post often as much as you can put on social media, take part in that. Also, the other reason that I like the uh, millage in the summer is the parades create floats if time allows. Um, the uh, August primary elections are, some people think that it's too busy, there's too much on the ballot. Trust me, there's more on the November ballot. And sometimes depending on the year, there can be a lot of state um, proposals on there. Um, I've already been involved where there's been six or eight proposals on. So, uh, but these are 99.9% um, .9 successful in August. Um, and uh, they can be done by the Yes Committee and the library informational with the parades and the floats. But don't throw candy. Make sure you hand it out uh, instead. Uh, have people walk along the sides. You connect with the community that way and um, have some uh, attractive informational and yes committee handouts as well. Next slide, publicity, 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 social media, brochures, flyers, bookmarks, local media we just talked about, ad slick, banners, paid advertisements, business marquees. And again, we mentioned the social media because I listed it again because it is so important. Is it correct that you cannot promote the millage on library social media accounts? No, not on in the informational account from the library, but the YES Committee is going to have their own social media account. And on there is where you promote it. And that's what I just uh, got done talking about that is where you promote on the social media side, the Yes Committee side. In other words, there's gonna be two social media sites, one for the library and one for the Yes Committee. Can you promote voting in general on the library account? Um, well, the li yes, they will on the informational side of it, the library pays for that. Um, and but they do not pay for anything that the yes committee is doing. So thank you. You're sending in some great chats. Um, and uh, the press kits. We used to do a lot more press kits, but now there's not that many presses anymore uh, to um, uh, promote. Uh, but you can s send uh, kits to. Oh, like if some uh, bigger groups if you wanted to, but uh, we don't do that as much as we did when we started out. The, the go door to door on Saturday, we talked about that. Bookmarks um, are a great way to get the word out, but those are to be used in the library. And of course, cannot say vote yes on. The uh, staff at the library, people are gonna come up and say, how should I vote? What do you think? Should I vote yes? And they just say, I think uh, we would all appreciate your support. That's it. They cannot get into any uh, conversation with the patron at the time, but um, it does happen. And uh, so, but anyway, uh, you want to um, uh, be a part of the, and if you do go door to door, by the way, um, do not, um, do door hangers or uh, door knockers on homes where the lights are off. You will make yourself lose a vote right away. You want to uh, just hang the door knocker on the door. If people come to the door and they want to uh, dispute the millage or uh, use a little harassment, just uh, stick to your message. Don't get bogged down with them. Thank them for their time and move on. 
uh, sometimes you always have people that would like to uh, carry on a conversation, but not in a in a nice way. Uh, banners. Now, I've already been involved in millage campaigns where people that were able to get them printed for next to nothing put banners across main streets. Obviously, it's where the roads are ingress and egress. Um, some cases, depending on the street, you might want to talk to your road commission or uh, someone in in uh, authority to do that. Uh, paid advertisements, paid for by the Yes Committee where funds are available. I did one last year where they didn't do hardly anything other than paid advertisements. They had the money to do it and that's what they did. The Yes Committee um, took out ads in many places. They placed ads in restaurants. They they did, um, we won the millage, of course, but um, so there are different ways to do with paid advertisement. And then business and church marquees, this is what I had alluded to earlier, uh, planned for the last weekend before the election. I just started this a few years ago and we had some little communities who had very little funds available. And the um, uh, one committee went to all the uh, hardware stores and churches and, and uh, oh, I think there was a, a couple McDonald's that had marquees and asked if they would put up. Now, some will not say vote yes, but they will say vote for your library, which would be the following Tuesday. In this case, August 2nd, we'll vote. Uh, remember to vote for your library August 2nd. And so it was um, uh, a great idea. It's a big money saver when it comes to having signs made. And so that was another um, uh, way to get the word out. And they seemed really, really um, interested in wanting to do that. We have another chat. How can we counteract negative comments on our Yes social media page? Um, I don't know that I've ever had that many on there. I've never had one report a lot of negative comments. And generally, unless you're going for a huge increase in millage, um, it would not be necessary to uh, unless somebody just wanted to have something to do, but uh, I'm not sure how you can uh, do that. Another one is promote materials from the S committee should be, should say paid for by the S committee, correct? Yes, it definitely should. That should be on your street signs also um, that you put um, in front of homes. Um, remember, no yes material can be stored in the library. Um, their signs go out a minimum two to three weeks before election. Now, these are the ones that go in front of homes or uh, if somebody wants one in front of their business and they call and ask for it. A lot of municipalities have a policy that anything hanging for longer than two or three weeks uh, may not stay there. And, um, and if you do it before that, a lot of times they become garage sale signs, we found out. So uh, two to three weeks, four years, um, uh, street signs. Also, remember to the committee should try to and, and ask throughout if anyone has wires. Wires are the most expensive side of street signs. And sometimes you'll find that, um, I just had one two weeks ago that said, oh, my neighbor's got 50 of those wires. They had run for office and had 50 of those wires in their garage. That is just a gift. When you can get something like that, then you have the signs made and most of them are taped on three sides. They just slip over that wire and then you have a committee that brings them to where they've been requested for. And I just think that that is the neatest way to, um, and especially if you can put it corner ways on a corner, people see it coming and going, and it just is um, 
uh, a neat way to advertise, but make sure that you have approval from that resident or that business before you put it up. Um, and when it's all said and done within 24 hours, uh, make sure that you've got notes of where those signs went. And um, sometimes the people will ask if they can bring them back to you. And of course, that would be nice. Otherwise, you have your committee go out, pick them up, and make sure that they do not go to the library. Have somebody's garage available to store them in and tell the yes committee decides what they're going to do with them. Or um, maybe they can give the banners to somebody else to use or the um, wires. Uh, but do not bring them to the library. Since library funds cannot pay for yes committee activities, how is the yes committee funded? Well, I thought I had addressed that. It is done by fundraising. Uh, there is a fundraising committee out there. There are some businesses that are more than happy. Um, in my case, and a lot of them, the friends groups are big donors. In fact, friends groups can start donating donating, in other words, my um, millage at KDL is in uh, 2024. I have friends groups donating already because there's a, a formula out there that they can only donate so much each year. And so they're donating to the 2024 millage campaign so much each year. And so there is a um, a checking account already started for that. And um, so Citizens for Kent District Library already has money in the bank towards that. Uh, but if you don't um, have anything started ahead of time, usually I advocate you ask your friends groups and many, many libraries have them to donate the first couple hundred dollars so you can get the checking account open, you can get the uh, committee registered with the county and they want uh, the uh, uh, name and you know, the bank and the bank account number, all that goes on paperwork that goes into the county clerk. One thing the treasurer has that I was the first treasurer of KDL 20 some years ago, we had to bring everything in or go down to the county. Now everything is done on computer and it is so handy and so nice. But anyway, that is, um, yeah, no, you have to go out and ask for it, but board members can donate to it. Staff can donate to it. The first time I did it, I send out, I'm very fussy about thank yous. I send out 415 thank yous. I did it out of my own pocket, but I just, thought people needed to be thanked. And sometimes it was down to $5 from a staff member. And of course, I'm with a library with a huge staff. So no, there is always uh, people that um, need to be asked, of course. Uh, some large donors can be out there, uh, but um, you do need to, to have funds to work with. What is a reasonable budget for the S committee? It depends on the size of your community. If it is um, a big one like um, KDL, which is a whole county, um, we're talking uh, seven, eight thousand uh, dollars, maybe even more, depending on how many signs, et cetera, we do. If you're talking a little community or a small township, it could be a thousand dollars. And so, um, yeah, it's going to depend on your community and the size. Um, also, the number of precincts have something to do with it because it depends on how many uh, precincts that you're going to work in those given areas. Um, the post-election committee, we're getting um, back uh, to the slides, is uh, thank the voters. Thank the committee, board of trustees, friends groups, library staff, provide frequent updates. Most important, keep your promise. 
thank the voters, let them know they are appreciated, be upbeat and encourage them to continue to support the library. I've been involved where libraries did, small communities did um, a parade afterwards, thanking the voters. It was a little, one of them was a little farm community and we knew it was gonna be touch and go. The <laughs> saving grace was there, the, the chair of the board's husband was the biggest farmer because we were afraid the farmers were not, this was their first millage, they'd never had a millage. And, uh, but anyway, so afterwards they, they did a farm float and uh, thank the yes committee. Half the town was, was closed up. There wasn't businesses, but there was one library that, or one uh, restaurant that handed out brochures left and right for the yes committee and got the word out. And in fact, that was one of them we won in, when we won the 22, so. Um, but you want to be sure and thank them. Thank legislators too, if they get involved. And sometimes legislators will donate to these yes committees too, but um, have an open house at the library a couple of days after the election and invite your legislators, provide some light refreshments uh, and make sure that you've got um, signs up. If you've got branches, have a sign up at every branch where it's visible to thank the voters. Um, that means a lot to them. I've had them tell me that and, I, and I'm sure it does. So continue to say thank you and um, get the signage up and messages where it's visible. And above all, keep your promise. In other words, you promise to add staff or you promise to add computers. You promise to add um, more uh, books or more programs. Remember, that is how you won the millage and you want to do that as soon as possible. Um, it is really um, important. And remember, the voters will be watching, even the naysayers will be watching. So that is something that you definitely want to keep. Um, uh, first and foremost is keeping your promise. And um, is it okay for thank you signage to be on library property? Absolutely. Absolutely, and you want it in every building. If you've got branches, you want it in every building and make sure that um, it is where they can see it. And that's why I advocate doing a, a little thank you uh, party afterwards and let them know how much you appreciate it, uh, winning the millage and what's going to happen. In the meantime, the uh, library has, of course, done their work with the um, millage campaign as far as getting the word out there. They're going to promote the, what they do as a library. In other words, how many, um, um, I've got one south of here doing one right now, and, and she put down every program, uh, how many programs and how many people visited the program. And this was all during the pandemic, how many hours they were open. All of that stuff can come from the informational campaign. And that also alerts the voter on how important that is. And then we've got a millage campaign timeline recap that is, um, we're gonna go over on the uh, uh, slide here. The uh, starts out the, the one to two years before, think, dream, and vision, ballot language deadline to the county clerk and the dates, of course, this would change with a, another election. And what to do six to nine months before, and mail why info to absentee voters. That I don't believe I went through with you. 45 days before the election, the county clerk has to get absentee voters to 
the voter and what you are going to um, advocate as a yes committee is a letter to the absentee voter. I know we didn't talk about it. I'm glad I thought of it. That information will emphasize to the voter what is going on, what you're doing, what you're asking for, but it's also going to go out. I think I did talk about the second week in June. That's when that letter needs to go to the absentee voter. Now, the county, township, uh, city, whatever, the clerk gives you the name and address of the registered absentee voter. Um, and years ago, they, they didn't do that, but they do now. And um, they have to if you ask for it. You ask for that, and that's how you're going to mail out this literature. Remember, you're only mailing literature to those that have already registered to vote absentee. You're not going to get all of them because some of them are going to register after the uh, registered voters, uh, absentee voters got the first mailing. They can register to vote absentee right up till the day of election. So you won't get all of them. If you do a second mailing, and sometimes the yes committee does, depending on funding, uh, you can also mention what I'm going to state to you right now. One of the things that you want in that information uh, brochure that you're sending them is to go to the end of the ballot to vote. Statewide, libraries are the last item on the ballot, and you want to make sure they, a lot of times they'll vote, they'll get that ballot, they'll tear it open, they'll vote for the um, campaign uh, folks, and uh, maybe if there's a, a judgeship or something on there, fold it up, put it back in the ballot uh, envelope and send it back. They don't go to the end of the ballot to vote for libraries. And that is the key reason that you're going to have that letter out. By the second week of June, by the third to fourth week of June, they will have those absentee ballots from the county clerk. And um, so that's why we want to get that very first mailing out right away. And um, that is... Um, probably one of the most important mailings you can do, but you want them to make sure that they know to go to the end of the ballot to vote for the library. And, uh, and of course, on that material, you can also put vote yes. Um, so back to the millage campaign timeline recap, um, it, all of it's on there, including the 45 days before when the county clerk mails absentee ballots, and that's by their uh, law. And then um, there's a three weeks before uh, we call mail Y info to all voters. If you wanna do a second mailing two weeks before, and then of course election day, August two or August 8th, um, and then ongoing celebrate and keep your promises. So that's, um, kind of the recap of the highlights from today's discussions. And uh, so uh, I think that that pretty much gives you what is important when it comes to ballot language, what is important to the campaign, and um, make sure that um, that is, um, uh, be sure and ask for that absentee ballot list um, that first week in, in June, and that you uh, will have the names and addresses of all those currently registered up until that date. And so that is why we don't want you to uh, miss out on uh, getting that out to the voter. And as you all know, by now, the absentee ballots have become extreme heavy. 
uh, more, I think. And, well, I know in some uh, cases there were more absentee ballots to a precinct than there was voters that walked in. So it is important that um, that information get out to them and that um, you uh, get that uh, push uh, out, the information out to them. Our millage votes last on the ballot by library law. It is, I think by state law, but don't quote me, it's been that way since I've been involved. Um, I just know that they are the last item. I have run into um, a library or two that told me theirs was in the middle of the ballot, but I do know that it is, um, I don't know if it's the, I think it's the county clerks or the state clerks that uh, have organized that as far as I know, but I just know that that's the way it is. And um, celebrate, remember people who voted yes, want to see benefits quickly, make them happy. The people who voted no want to see you break your promises. Don't let it happen. So that is how we uh, move forward. Okay, we're going to um, see if there's any more uh, chats available. And I think we're going to go live here so that you know I'm living and breathing. Yep, there I are. Um, I want to give thanks to this portrait that you saw at the beginning. There was an artist at Kent District Library that created that for the Bursma boardroom. And um, it, I have one at home also, but uh, I just uh, want to thank them for doing that. And so um, here we are live. Are there any more Q&A that we can help you with? Or did we answer them good along the way? I thank you very, very much for everyone that joined in and for the Library of Michigan doing this. I think it is a uh, <coughs> plus to uh, the community, to the libraries. And as you know, we're all, um, we eat, live and sleep uh, libraries and books and, and uh, you name it. But um, anyway, if there's any other, and at the end um, is my email, L-I-B-S-A-B-S-A-R-G. The S-A-R-G is my nickname, in case you wondered how that got in there at AOL.com and my phone number, and feel free to contact me at any time. Um, and um, I truly thank you for your time today, but I will answer any and all questions at any time that um, something comes up a week from now and you want me to um, answer it, I would be happy to um, hear from you in a phone call. And uh, please feel free to, to contact me. Thank you, Shirley. Um, we very much appreciate you being here. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining us for the mill this millage uh, series. Uh, this was our last millage um, uh, presentation. So we saved the best for last with Shirley. And we keep your eyes tuned uh, for what's coming next. So thank you so much for being here.